Section 0 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack, a review of the security, planning, and response failure. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by U.S. Senate. Executive Summary. On January 6, 2021, the world witnessed a violent and unprecedented attack on the U.S. Capitol, the Vice President, members of Congress, and the democratic process. Rioters, attempting to disrupt the joint session of Congress, broke into the Capitol building, vandalized and stole property, and ransacked offices. They attacked members of law enforcement and threatened the safety and lives of our nation's elected leaders. Tragically, seven individuals, including three law enforcement officers, ultimately lost their lives. Rioters were intent on disrupting the joint session, during which members of Congress were scheduled to perform their constitutional obligation to count the electoral votes for President and Vice President of the United States and announce the official results of the 2020 election. Due to the heroism of United States Capitol Police, or USCP, officers, along with their federal, state, and local law enforcement partners, the rioters failed to prevent Congress from fulfilling its constitutional duty. In the early hours of January 7, the President of the Senate, Vice President Pence, announced Joseph Biden and Kamala Harris as the President-elect and Vice President-elect of the United States. This report addresses the security, planning, and response failures of the entities directly responsible for capital security, USCP and the Capitol Police Board, which is comprised of the House and Senate Sergeants at Arms and the Architect of the Capitol as voting members, and the United States Capitol Police Chief as a non-voting member, along with critical breakdowns involving several federal agencies particularly the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, and Department of Defense, or DOD. The committees also made a series of recommendations for the Capitol Police Board, U.S. Capitol Police, Federal Intelligence Agencies, Department of Defense, and other Capitol Region law enforcement agencies to address the intelligence and security failures. The committee's investigation uncovered a number of intelligence and security failures leading up to and on January 6 that allowed for the breach of the Capitol. These breakdowns ranged from federal intelligence agencies failing to warn of a potential for violence to a lack of planning and preparation by the U.S. Capitol Police and law enforcement leadership. The federal intelligence community, led by FBI and DHS, did not issue a threat assessment warning of potential violence targeting the Capitol on January 6. Law enforcement entities, including the U.S. Capitol Police, largely rely on the FBI and DHS to assess and communicate homeland security threats. Throughout 2020, the FBI and DHS disseminated written documents detailing the potential for increased violent extremist activity at lawful protests and targeting of law enforcement and government facilities and personnel. Despite online calls for violence at the Capitol, neither the FBI nor DHS issued a threat assessment or intelligence bulletin warning law enforcement entities in the National Capital Region of the potential for violence. FBI and DHS officials stressed the difficulty in discerning constitutionally protected free speech versus actionable, credible threats of violence. In testimony before the committees, officials from both the FBI and DHS acknowledged that the intelligence community needs to improve its handling and dissemination of threat information from social media and online message boards. USCP's intelligence components failed to convey the full scope of threat information they possessed. 
although the U.S. Capitol Police mainly relies on the FBI and DHS for intelligence and threat information. USCP has three components responsible for intelligence-related activities. These components and the materials they produce are supposed to inform USCP's security and operational planning. This, however, was not the case for January 6. USCP's lead intelligence component, the Intelligence and Interagency Coordination Division, or IICD, was aware of the potential for violence in the days and weeks ahead of January 6. It received information from a variety of sources about threats of violence focused on the joint session and the Capitol complex, and the large crowds expected to gather in Washington, D.C. on January 6. Yet IICD failed to fully incorporate this information into all of its internal assessments about January 6 and the joint session. As a result, critical information regarding threats of violence was not shared with USCP's own officers and other law enforcement partners. USCP's preparations for the joint session also suffered because of the decentralized nature of its intelligence components. On January 5th, an employee in a separate USCP intelligence-related component received information from the FBI's Norfolk field office regarding online discussions of violence directed at Congress, including that protesters were coming to Congress, quote, prepared for war, unquote. This report, similar to other information received by IICD, was never distributed to IICD or USCP leadership before January 6. USCP was not adequately prepared to prevent or respond to the January 6 security threats, which contributed to the breach of the Capitol. Stephen Sund, the USCP chief on January 6, and Yogananda Pittman, who was designated as acting chief after Stephen Sund announced his resignation on January 7, both attributed the breach of the Capitol to intelligence failures across the federal government. USCP leadership, however, also failed to prepare a department-wide operational plan for the joint session. Similarly, USCP leadership did not develop a comprehensive staffing plan for the joint session, detailing, among other things, where officers would be located. USCP could not provide the committees any documents showing where officers were located at the start of the attack and how that changed throughout the attack. USCP leadership also failed to provide frontline officers with effective protective equipment or training. Although USCP activated seven Specialty Civil Disturbance Unit, or CDU, platoons in advance of the joint session, only four of those platoons were outfitted with special protective equipment, including helmets, hardened plastic armor, and shields. The many other USCP officers who fought to defend the Capitol were left to do so in their daily uniforms. Many of those frontline officers had not received training in basic civil disturbance tactics since their initial recruit officer class training. While some CDU officers were issued special protective equipment, the platoons were not authorized to wear the equipment at the beginning of their shifts. Instead, USCP staged equipment on buses near the Capitol. In at least one instance, when the platoon attempted to retrieve the equipment, the bus was locked, leaving the platoon without access to this critical equipment. USCP also failed to provide equipment training to support the CDU platoons and did not authorize CDU platoons to use all available less than lethal munitions, which could have enhanced officers' ability to push back the rioters. These operational failures were exacerbated by leadership's failure to clearly communicate during the attack. USCP leadership gathered in a command center 
blocks away from the Capitol building. Two incident commanders, identified as responsible for relaying information to frontline officers, were forced to engage with rioters during the attack, making it difficult for them to relay information. As a result, communications were chaotic, sporadic, and, according to many frontline officers, non-existent. Opaque processes and a lack of emergency authority delayed requests for National Guard assistance. The USCP chief has no unilateral authority to request assistance from the National Guard. The USCP chief must submit a request for assistance to the Capitol Police Board for approval. Stevensund never submitted a formal request to the Capitol Police Board for National Guard support in advance of January 6. Instead, Stephen Sund had informal conversations with the House Sergeant at Arms, Paul Irving, and the Senate Sergeant at Arms, Michael Stenger, regarding the potential need for National Guard support. No one ever discussed the possibility of National Guard support with the architect of the Capitol the third voting member of the Capitol Police Board. The members of the Capitol Police Board who were in charge on January 6th did not appear to be fully familiar with the statutory and regulatory requirements for requesting National Guard support, which contributed to the delay in deploying the National Guard to the Capitol. In their testimony before the committees, Paul Irving and Stephen Sund offered different accounts of when Stephen Sund first requested National Guard assistance during the attack. Phone records reveal a number of conversations between Stephen Sund and Paul Irving on January 6. However, because there is no transcription of the conversations, there is no way for the committees to determine when the request was made. National Guard assistance was delayed while Stephen Sund attempted to contact the Capitol Police Board members and obtain the required approvals. Regardless of what time the request was made, the need to await Capitol Police Board approval during an emergency hindered the ability to request District of Columbia National Guard, or DCNG, assistance quickly. The intelligence failures coupled with the Capitol Police Board's failure to request National Guard assistance prior to January 6, meant that the D.C. National Guard was not activated, staged, and prepared to quickly respond to an attack on the Capitol. As the attack unfolded, DOD required time to approve the request and gather, equip, and instruct its personnel on the mission, which resulted in additional delays. Prior to January 6, U.S. Capitol Police informed DOD officials on two separate occasions that it was not seeking D.C. National Guard assistance for the joint session of Congress. The D.C. government, by contrast, did request unarmed troops for traffic support, and on January 6, 154 unarmed D.C. National Guard personnel were staged at traffic control points throughout the city. As the attack unfolded, USCP and the Metropolitan Police Department of the District of Columbia, or MPD, both pleaded with DOD officials for immediate assistance. DOD officials claimed they received a workable request for assistance from the U.S. Capitol Police at approximately 2.30 p.m., The request was presented to the Acting Secretary of Defense and approved at approximately 3 p.m. For the next 90 minutes, DOD officials ordered D.C. National Guard personnel to return to the armory, obtain necessary gear, and prepare for deployment as leaders quickly prepared a mission plan. Miscommunication and confusion during response preparations demonstrated by conflicting records about who authorized deployment and at what time, contributed to the delayed deployment. 
D.C. National Guard began arriving at the Capitol complex at 5.20 p.m., nearly three hours after DOD received U.S. Capitol Police's request for assistance and more than four hours after the barriers at the Capitol were first breached. The committee's recommendations. Based on the findings of the investigation, the committees identified a number of recommendations to address the intelligence and security failures leading up to and on January 6. Recommendations specific to the Capitol complex include empowering the U.S. Capitol Police Chief to request assistance from the D.C. National Guard in emergency situations and passing legislation to clarify the statutes governing requests for assistance from executive agencies and departments in non-emergency situations. To address the preparedness of the U.S. Capitol Police, the committees recommend improvements to training, equipment, intelligence collection, and operational planning. The committees further recommend intelligence agencies review and evaluate criteria for issuing and communicating intelligence assessments and the establishment of standing, concept of operation scenarios, and contingency plans to improve Department of Defense and D.C. National Guard response to civil disturbance and terrorism incidents. These scenarios and plans should detail what level of DOD or D.C. National Guard assistance may be required, what equipment would be needed for responding personnel, and the plan for command and control during the response. The committee's investigation. Two days after the January 6th attack, the Senate Committee on Rules and Administration and Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee announced a joint bipartisan oversight investigation to examine the intelligence and security failures that led to the attack. On February 23, 2021, the committees held the first public oversight hearing on the attack. The hearing, entitled Examining the January 6 Attack on the U.S. Capitol, featured testimony from the U.S. Capitol Police Chief, House Sergeant-at-Arms, and Senate Sergeant-at-Arms in charge on January 6. The committees also heard testimony from the acting chief of the Metropolitan Police Department. One week later, on March 3, 2021, the committees held a second oversight hearing, which included witnesses from DOD, D.C. National Guard, FBI, and DHS. As part of their investigation, the committees reviewed thousands of documents. The committees also received written statements from more than 50 U.S. Capitol Police officers about their experiences. In addition, the committees interviewed numerous current and former officials from U.S. Capitol Police, Senate Sergeant-at-Arms, House Sergeant-at-Arms, Architect of the Capitol, FBI, DHS, Metropolitan Police Department, DOD, and D.C. National Guard. Most entities cooperated with the committee's requests. There were notable exceptions, however. The Department of Justice and DHS have yet to fully comply with the committee's requests for information. The Office of the House of Representatives Sergeant-at-Arms did not comply with the committee's information requests, and a U.S. Capitol Police Deputy Chief of Police declined to be interviewed by the committees. The committees will continue to pursue responses from those who have failed to fully comply. The oversight of events related to January 6, including intelligence and security failures, will continue. End of Section 0. End of the Executive Summary. Section 1 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 1, Findings of Fact and Recommendations Finding of Fact 1, Neither the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, 
nor the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, issued formal intelligence bulletins about the potential for violence at the Capitol on January 6, which hindered law enforcement's preparations for the joint session of Congress. The DHS Office of Intelligence and Analysis, or I&A, issued no intelligence products specific to January 6. Rather, it issued 15 intelligence products in 2020 related to domestic violent extremism, the last of which was issued on December 30th without any mention of the joint session of Congress or the Capitol. The FBI similarly did not issue any formal intelligence assessment specific to January 6th. However, late on January 5th, the FBI's Norfolk Field Office circulated a situational information report, which is used by field offices to share locally derived information that is typically operational in nature and does not meet the same criteria as intelligence assessments. That report warned of individuals traveling to Washington, D.C. for, quote, war, unquote, at the Capitol on January 6. In the five months since the attack, neither agency has fully complied with the committee's request for information on the events of January 6. Finding 2. Neither the FBI nor DHS deemed online posts calling for violence at the Capitol as credible. In testimony before the committees, Representatives from both agencies noted that much of the rhetoric online prior to January 6 was, quote, First Amendment protected speech, unquote, of limited credibility and acknowledged areas for improvement in the handling and dissemination of threat information from social media and online message boards to enhance law enforcement and intelligence agencies' abilities to counter that threat. Finding 3. The United States Capitol Police's, or USCP, Intelligence and Interagency Coordination Division, or IICD, possessed information about the potential for violence at the Capitol on January 6, but did not convey the full scope of information, which affected its preparations. Internal records and USCP officials' testimony confirm that USCP began gathering information about events planned for January 6 in mid-December 2020. Through open-source collection, tips from the public, and other sources, USCP IICD knew about social media posts calling for violence at the Capitol on January 6, including a plot to breach the Capitol, the online sharing of maps of the Capitol complex's tunnel systems, and other specific threats of violence. Yet IICD did not convey the full scope of known information to USCP leadership, rank-and-file officers, or law enforcement partners. Finding 4. Important intelligence information received by internal USCP components was not appropriately shared among USCP's distinct intelligence-related components. USCP has three units responsible for intelligence-related activities, IICD, the Threat Assessment Section, or TAS, and the Intelligence Operations Section, or IOS, all of which are organized within USCP's Protective Services Bureau, or PSB. Although the three components support one another, they have different responsibilities. The decentralized nature of intelligence resources led to vital intelligence information not being shared with senior USCP intelligence officials or USCP leadership. Finding 5. IICD issued multiple intelligence reports prior to January 6 that reflected inconsistent assessments of the risk of violence at the Capitol. IICD issued intelligence products related to expected activities on January 6, 
but the products were contradictory as to the threat level. For example, although a January 3rd special event assessment warned of the Capitol being a target of armed violence on January 6th, IICD's daily intelligence reports rated the likelihood of civil disturbance on January 6 as remote to improbable. Finding 6. USCP did not prepare a department-wide operational plan or staffing plan for the joint session. In advance of January 6, Stephen Sund, USCP Chief of Police on January 6, believed USCP would need support to secure the Capitol perimeter in light of the large number of expected protesters at the Capitol, but he did not order the creation of a department-wide operational plan. Although the Uniformed Services Bureau and the Civil Disturbance Unit prepared component-specific plans, neither was sufficiently detailed to inform officers of their responsibilities or authorities, nor did they reference warnings contained in IICD's January 3rd special event assessment. Finding 7. USCP's Civil Disturbance Unit operates on an ad hoc basis without sufficient training or equipment. Of USCP's 1,840 sworn officers, only approximately 160 are trained in advanced civil disturbance tactics and use of hard protective equipment. Fewer than 10 are trained to use USCP's full suite of less-than-lethal munitions. On January 6, some of the hard protective equipment was defective or not staged in close proximity to the officers. Finding 8. USCP's rank-and-file officers were not provided periodic training in basic civil disturbance tactics or basic protective equipment. All officers receive basic civil disturbance training during initial recruit officer class training, but there is no further training requirement after graduation. As a result, some who responded to the Capitol attack had not received training in civil disturbance tactics in years. Officers were also not uniformly provided helmets, shields, gas masks, or other crowd control equipment prior to January 6, which would have aided their response. Finding 9. USCP's incident command system broke down during the attack leaving frontline officers without key information or instructions as events unfolded. USCP did not formally designate incident commanders in advance of January 6 through a department-wide operational plan. Senior officers were directly engaged with rioters during the attack, and USCP leadership never took control of the radio system to communicate orders to frontline officers. Finding 10. Capitol Police Board members in charge on January 6 did not fully understand the statutory or regulatory requirements for requesting assistance from executive agencies and departments or declaring emergencies. Capitol Police Board members also disagreed as to whether unanimity was required to re approve a request from USCP for assistance from the District of Columbia National Guard, or DCNG. Finding 11. Stephen Sund never submitted a formal request to the Capitol Police Board for an emergency declaration and DC National Guard assistance before January 6. Stephen Sund had informal conversations with the House and Senate Sergeants at Arms, but no request was ever provided to the full board. In fact, no one ever informed the architect of the Capitol, the third voting member of the board, of a potential request for D.C. National Guard assistance. Finding 12. As the attack unfolded, Stephen Sund lacked the authority to request National Guard assistance unilaterally. Under the existing statute, the USCP chief may obtain support from law enforcement and uniformed services 
only after the Capitol Police Board declares an emergency. This process constrained Stephen Sun's ability to act quickly during the attack and contributed to the delay in the provision of assistance. Finding 13. The Department of Defense, or DOD, confirmed with USCP on two separate occasions before January 6 that USCP was not requesting assistance from the D.C. National Guard. According to DOD records, USCP confirmed on January 3rd and January 4th that it did not need D.C. National Guard assistance. Meanwhile, DOD continued to communicate with the D.C. Mayor's Office regarding its request for unarmed D.C. National Guard personnel support. Finding 14. DOD's response to January 6 was informed by criticism it received about its response to the civil unrest after the murder of George Floyd during the summer of 2020. DOD was criticized for its heavy-handed response, particularly flying military helicopters over the protests in summer 2020. DOD officials cited lessons learned from the summer 2020 as guiding its decision-making for January 6. DOD officials believed it needed control measures and rigor before deploying D.C. National Guard personnel, including a clear deployment plan to avoid the appearance of over-militarization. Finding 15. DOD imposed control measures on D.C. National Guard deployment, including requiring the Army Secretary's approval before deploying a Quick Reaction Force, or QRF, and doing so only as a last resort. DOD set forth requirements in a pair of memoranda issued on January 4 and January 5 that allowed William Walker, D.C. National Guard Commanding General, to deploy a QRF only as a last resort and upon the express approval of a concept of operations for any use of the QRF by the Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy. General William Walker testified that, absent these requirements, he would have been able to immediately deploy the QRF to support the U.S. Capitol Police. DOD officials disputed that characterization and asserted that the memoranda simply memorialized longstanding policy. Christopher Miller, the acting Secretary of Defense on January 6, was not aware that General William Walker wanted to deploy the QRF on January 6. Finding 16. As the attack unfolded, DOD officials claimed they did not have a clear request for D.C. National Guard assistance until approximately 2.30 p.m., Ryan McCarthy indicated that Muriel Bowser, the mayor of Washington, D.C., called him around 1.34 p.m., but did not request assistance at that time. Rather, she asked whether DOD had received requests from U.S. Capitol Police because the crowd was, quote, getting out of control, unquote. Stevenson called D.C. National Guard Commanding General William Walker at 1.49 p.m., to request assistance. According to Army officials, however, the requests were not specific and clarity on the scope of the request was needed. Finding 17. Inaccurate media reports stating that DOD had denied a request for D.C. National Guard support slowed DOD's mission analysis efforts. At 2.55 p.m., a reporter tweeted that DOD, quote, had just denied a request by D.C. officials to deploy the National Guard to the U.S. Capitol, unquote, despite the fact that no denial had been ordered and senior DOD officials were still analyzing the request. Christopher Miller approved D.C. National Guard mobilization at 3.04 p.m., understanding that DOD officials would then conduct mission analysis. 
Brian McCarthy, however, spent at least half an hour fielding calls and reassuring congressional and local leaders that DOD, quote, was indeed coming, unquote. Finding 18, DOD spent hours mission planning. Christopher Miller indicated that he gave all necessary approvals for deployment at 3.04 p.m., with the understanding that Ryan McCarthy would conduct mission analysis with General William Walker. Ryan McCarthy, by contrast, felt he needed to brief and receive Christopher Miller's approval before D.C. National Guard personnel could leave the armory. Ryan McCarthy co-located with D.C. officials and developed a concept of operations for D.C. National Guard personnel. The plan was approved and D.C. National Guard authorized to deploy by 4.35 p.m. All DOD officials who spoke with the committees described the time spent on mission analysis as vital to D.C. National Guard's effectiveness. By contrast, General William Walker believed the D.C. National Guard was fully equipped and ready to respond to the Capitol much earlier. Finding 19. DOD officials denied mentioning or discussing the optics of sending D.C. National Guard personnel to the Capitol and disagreed with purported statements by an Army official that deploying D.C. National Guard to the Capitol would not be, quote, best military advice, unquote. As Christopher Miller told the committees, quote, their best military advice is theirs. The best military advice that I take is from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, statutorily. So the best military advice that I received was, quote, let's go, agree, unquote. Finding 20. DOD and D.C. National Guard have conflicting records of when orders and authorizations were given, and no one could explain why D.C. National Guard did not deploy until after 5 o'clock p.m. One current DOD official acknowledged that DOD and D.C. National Guard could have tightened up their response time between 4.35 p.m., when D.C. National Guard was authorized to deploy, and 5.02 p.m., when Army documents reflect D.C. National Guard's deployment. Officials attributed the delay to confusion and noted that it takes time to get personnel staged for deployment once the order is given. Concerning the conflicting records and accounts as to who needed to approve deployment orders, DOD officials cited confusion, the lack of a lead federal agency with an integrated security plan, and breakdowns in communication as to when those orders were given and when those orders were executed. Finding 21. According to DOD, the Department of Justice, or DOJ, was designated as the lead federal agency in charge of security preparations and response on January 6. But DOJ did not conduct interagency rehearsals or establish an integrated security plan. DOD officials understood DOJ was designated prior to January 6. According to Ryan McCarthy, DOJ never established a point of contact and did not effectively coordinate a response during the attack. As noted above, DOJ has not fully complied with the committee's requests for information. Recommendations for the Capitol Police Board. Recommendation 1. Empower the Chief of the U.S. Capitol Police to request assistance from the D.C. National Guard in emergency situations. Congress should pass legislation to clarify the statutes governing requests for assistance from executive agencies and departments in non-emergency situations. Under existing statute, the Chief of U.S. Capitol Police may request support from law enforcement and uniformed services only after the Capitol Police Board declares an emergency. 
This process can constrain U.S. Capitol Police's ability to act quickly in an emergency and delay the provision of assistance. Recommendation 2. Document and streamline board policies and procedures for submitting, reviewing, and approving requests from U.S. Capitol Police to ensure coordination among all members of the board. Board policies and procedures should include a requirement that board members regularly review the policies and procedures to acknowledge their understanding and ensure adherence to the processes outlined therein. Recommendation 3. Ensure the board is appropriately balancing the need to share information with officials with the need to protect sensitive and classified information. Recommendation 4. Appoint a new chief of the U.S. Capitol Police with appropriate input from USCP officers, congressional leadership, and the committees of jurisdiction. In addition, the new chief should evaluate the leadership team and ensure that promotions for leadership positions in USCP are handled in a transparent manner and based on merit. Recommendations for the U.S. Capitol Police Recommendation 1. Ensure USCP has sufficient civilian and sworn personnel with appropriate training and equipment in the roles necessary to fulfill its mission. This includes providing all officers annual training on basic civil disturbance tactics and equipping them with ballistic helmets, gloves, and gas masks, the same equipment that the District of Columbia Metropolitan Police Department, or MPD, provides to its officers. USCP should maintain an inventory of all issued equipment and ensure that the equipment is periodically replaced. Congress should authorize sufficient funding to support the additional training and equipment requirements, as well as adequate staffing levels. Recommendation 2. Require a department-wide operational plan for special events. These procedures should include a bureau-specific security plan which informs the USCP-wide operational plan. The plan should detail, at a minimum, the threat assessment for the event, staffing, deployment strategy, mission objectives, incident command system, authorized use of force, and relevant contingencies in the event of an emergency. USCP should ensure that the operational plans are informed by available intelligence and threat assessments. Recommendation 3. Establish the Civil Disturbance Unit, or CDU, as a formal, permanent component of USCP and ensure that its dedicated officers are properly trained and equipped at all times. USCP should ensure that all members of the CDU are equipped with hard gear and receive annual training in advanced civil disturbance tactics and less than lethal munitions. USCP should also ensure that all hard protective equipment is properly maintained and regularly replaced. Recommendation 4. Consolidate and elevate all USCP intelligence units into an intelligence bureau, led by a civilian director of intelligence reporting to the Assistant Chief of Police for Protective and Intelligence Operations. Ensure the bureau is adequately staffed and all agents and analysts are properly trained to receive and analyze intelligence information and develop policies to disseminate intelligence information to leadership and rank-and-file officers effectively. Currently, USCP has three separate intelligence-related entities within the Protective Services Bureau. Elevating these entities into a bureau will increase focus on USCP's intelligence capabilities improve the timely sharing of relevant intelligence up the chain of command, and decrease lack of coordination within the agency and with law enforcement partners. USCP should ensure that all training given to agents and analysts 
is consistent with best practices of the intelligence community and law enforcement partners, including the determination of credibility and overall threat assessment. USCP should enhance its relationships with intelligence community partners and increase the number of liaisons USCP has integrated in national capital region task forces, including those with the FBI and D.C. Fusion Center. Recommendation 5. Update its Incident Command System Directive to address how incident commanders are to communicate priorities, strategies, tactics, and threat assessment to frontline officers prior to and during an incident, and ensure that the directive is followed. USCP should also formalize the process for designating incident commanders for large events and account for contingencies should incident commanders be unable to communicate to officers, including requiring senior leaders to take over communication responsibilities. Recommendation for the House and Senate Sergeants at Arms. Develop protocols for communicating with members of Congress, staff, and other employees during emergencies. Recommendations for intelligence agencies. 1. Review and evaluate handling of open source information, such as social media, containing threats of violence. Recommendation 2. Review and evaluate criteria for issuing and communicating intelligence assessments, bulletins, and other products to consumer agencies, such as USCP. Recommendation 3. Fully comply with statutory reporting requirements to Congress on domestic terrorism data, including on the threat level and the resources dedicated to countering the threat. Recommendations for the Department of Defense and D.C. National Guard. 1. Develop standing concept of operation scenarios and contingency plans for responding quickly to civil disturbance and terrorism incidents. These scenarios and plans should detail what level of DOD or D.C. National Guard assistance may be required, what equipment would be needed for responding personnel, and the plan for command and control during the response. These scenarios and plans can help reduce confusion or the necessary planning time to allow DOD to respond more quickly to unfolding emergencies. DOD and the D.C. National Guard should perform tabletop and joint training exercises concerning responding to an attack on the Capitol, which includes coordinating with local law enforcement and neighboring states. Recommendation 2. Enhance communications prior to and during an event between DOD and D.C. National Guard strategic, operational, and tactical decision-makers and commanding generals. These communications should include regular updates prior to an event concerning operations and strategy, as well as regular updates on the day of an event through direct communications between the decision-makers and commanding generals, including by co-locating leaders where practicable. Recommendation 3. Practice the mobilization of National Guard members from neighboring jurisdictions to provide immediate assistance and report to command and control in the event of an emergency. Those Guard members should be trained and equipped to respond to emergencies. Recommendation 4. For special events in which a quick reaction force, or QRF, is approved, Consider proximity and response time, among other factors, when deciding where to stage the QRF to ensure the ability to quickly respond to incidents at the Capitol. Recommendation 5. Clarify the approval processes and chain of command within DOD to prevent delays in the deployment of the D.C. National Guard when authorized. Recommendations for Law Enforcement and Uniformed Services in the National Capital Region Recommendation 1. 
ensure that mutual aid agreements among federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies include all partners in the National Capital Region, and that those agreements are regularly reviewed and updated. Recommendation 2. Conduct joint training exercises to ensure coordination across federal, state, and local governments concerning security threats in the Washington, D.C. area for requesting, receiving, and utilizing emergency assistance. Training exercises should cover command and control processes during an emergency to ensure prompt response and timely integration of personnel. Additional USCP Inspector General Recommendations After January 6, a number of inspectors general announced investigations into their agency's preparation and response to the attack on the Capitol. The committees support these oversight efforts. To date, the USCP Office of Inspector General has released a number of recommendations for USCP, which are summarized at Appendix A. End of Section 1. Section 2 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 2, Background. A. Agencies Responsible for Protecting the U.S. Capitol Complex. The U.S. Capitol Complex consists of approximately 20 buildings spread across roughly two square miles in Washington, D.C. It includes the office buildings of the House of Representatives and Senate, the Library of Congress, and the U.S. Supreme Court. It also includes various parks, the U.S. Botanic Garden, and the Capitol Reflecting Pool. The Capitol Building, the Citadel of Democracy, is the centerpiece of the Capitol Complex. Maintaining, protecting, and securing the Capitol Complex, including those who work in and visit the Capitol Complex, is divided among four entities. One, the United States Capitol Police, two, the Senate Sergeant-at-Arms and Doorkeeper, three, the House of Representatives Sergeant-at-Arms, and four, the Architect of the Capitol. This section details the role and mission of each of these entities. One, the United States Capitol Police, A, Mission and Organization. The United States Capitol Police, or USCP, is the sole federal law enforcement agency with jurisdiction over the Capitol complex. Although its origins trace back to 1800, Congress formally established USCP in 1828. It is responsible for protecting not only the Capitol complex's buildings, but also members of Congress, staff, and the millions of individuals who visit the Capitol complex annually. The emphasis on protection is outlined in USCP's mission to, quote, protect the Congress, its members, employees, visitors, and facilities, so it can fulfill its constitutional and legislative responsibilities in a safe, secure, and open environment, unquote. Stephen Sund, USCP chief on January 6th, further emphasized this when testifying before Congress in 2019. Quote, the type of policing USCP does is unlike any other police department. It is highly specialized to focus on the unique requirements of protecting the legislative process and the First Amendment rights of our citizens, maintaining an open and accessible campus, and preventing crime and terrorism. Our daily reality is that the U.S. Capitol remains a desired target for assailants, both domestic and foreign. Therefore, USCP continually assesses the risk and adjusts its strategies for addressing any threats. Footnote. USCP's duties extend beyond the Capitol complex. It also provides protection for members of Congress, officers of Congress, and their immediate family members where necessary. Returning to the text, to fulfill its mission, USCP employs approximately 1,840 sworn officers 
and 400 civilian employees. Footnote. As noted above, USCP's responsibilities extend outside of the Capitol complex. The current staffing levels are approximately the same as on January 6th. Returning to the text. Its budget has grown in recent years and currently exceeds $500 million, more than many large metropolitan cities, including Detroit, Michigan, Minneapolis, Minnesota, St. Louis, Missouri, and Columbus, Ohio. What follows is a chart of appropriations to USCP from fiscal year 2014 to fiscal year 2021. In fiscal year 14, the appropriation was $338,459,000, increasing in fiscal year 2021 to $515,541,000. The complete chart can be viewed in the printed version of this report. USCP's budget is similar to that of the Metropolitan Police Department of the District of Columbia, or MPD, which has primary law enforcement jurisdiction over the 61 square miles of land in the District of Columbia. MPD's fiscal year 2020 budget was approximately $559 million, roughly 17% more than USCP's fiscal year 2020 budget. Yet MPD employed nearly 3,800 sworn officers, more than double the number of USCP officers. A chief of police leads USCP. The chief is appointed by and serves at the pleasure of the Capitol Police Board. The chief is supported by an executive team comprised of an assistant chief of police for uniformed operations, an assistant chief of police for protective and intelligence operations, and a chief administrative officer. The executive team manages 11 bureaus, offices, and divisions that cover a range of police services, including patrol officers, detectives and analysts, dignitary protection, canine units, and other special response teams. What follows is an organizational chart for the USCP, including the Office of Chief of Police, the Office of Inspector General, Office of the General Counsel, Office of Professional Responsibility, Public Information Office, Office of Accountability and Improvement, and other offices and divisions and bureaus reporting to those offices. The complete organizational chart can be viewed in the printed version of the report. Returning to the text, the majority of USCP's uniformed officers fall under the Office of the Assistant Chief of Police for Uniformed Operations. These are the primary officers seen around the Capitol complex and other officers assigned to entities commonly found in traditional police departments, including hazardous devices response teams, SWAT teams, and canine teams. The Office of the Assistant Chief of Police for Protective and Intelligence Operations is responsible for USCP's intelligence analysis and physical security infrastructure. Footnote. USCP also works closely with other law enforcement and intelligence entities within the National Capital Region. Returning to the text. As of June 2019 and on January 6th, Stephen Sund served as USCP chief. Yogananda Pittman served as the assistant chief of police for protective and intelligence operations and Chad Thomas served as the Assistant Chief of Police for Uniformed Operations. Mr. Sund submitted a letter of resignation on January 7th. Ms. Pittman was named Acting Chief, and Sean Gallagher, who was Deputy Chief for the Protective Services Bureau on January 6th, was promoted to Acting Assistant Chief for Protective and Intelligence Operations. B. Oversight by the Capitol Police Board. The Capitol Police Board, or the Board, is charged with overseeing USCP. It is comprised of the House and Senate Sergeants at Arms and the Architect of the Capitol. A chairman presides over the Board, a position that alternates annually between the House and Senate Sergeants at Arms. 
The USCP chief serves as an ex officio, non-voting member. The board's stated aim is to, quote, direct, oversee, and support the Capitol Police in its mission, as well as to advance coordination between Congress, the Capitol Police, the sergeants at arms of the House and the Senate, and the architect of the Capitol, unquote, by establishing, quote, general goals and objectives covering its major functions and operations to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of its operations, unquote. The scope of the board's authority, however, is broader, covering certain personnel and operational security matters. For example, the board appoints the USCP chief and inspector general, establishes and maintains unified schedules of rates of pay, selects and regulates USCP uniforms, and must approve the termination of USCP employees. The board can also regulate USCP's law enforcement authority. In terms of security matters, the board is responsible for the design, installation, and maintenance of security systems for the Capitol complex, as well as the regulation and movement of all traffic and parking within the Capitol complex. The following diagram details the roles and responsibilities of the board and USCP. What follows is Figure 2, Roles and Responsibilities of the Capitol Police Board and Chief of the U.S. Capitol Police, in three columns, labeled Human Capital, Security, and Other. The full table can be viewed in the printed volume of this work. Part 2, The Senate and House Sergeants at Arms. The Senate and House Sergeants at Arms, or SAAs, are officers of the Senate and House, respectively. They are nominated by the Senate Majority Leader and Speaker of the House, respectively, and elected by their respective chambers. The SAAs serve as the chief law enforcement, protocol, and executive officers for their respective chambers. The Senate SAA is responsible for maintaining security in the Capitol and all Senate buildings, protecting members, coordinating official events and visits, and enforcing all rules of the Senate. The House SAA has similar responsibilities. On January 6th, Michael Stenger was the Senate Sergeant-at-Arms. Paul Irving was the House Sergeant-at-Arms. Following Mr. Stenger's resignation on January 7th, Deputy Senate Sergeant-at-Arms Jennifer Hemingway became Acting Senate Sergeant-at-Arms. Retired Army Lieutenant General Karen H. Gibson became Senate Sergeant-at-Arms on March 22nd. Following Mr. Irving's resignation, Deputy House Sergeant-at-Arms Timothy Blodgett became Acting House Sergeant-at-Arms on January 11th. Major General William J. Walker, who served as Commanding General of the District of Columbia National Guard, or DCNG, on January 6th, became House Sergeant-at-Arms on April 26. 3. The Architect of the Capitol The Architect of the Capitol is the, quote, builder and steward of the landmark buildings and grounds of Capitol Hill, unquote. Appointed by the President with the advice and consent of the Senate, the architect manages, quote, the operations and care of more than 18.4 million square feet of facilities, 570 acres of grounds, and thousands of works of art, unquote. This includes operating the Capitol Visitor Center and the U.S. Botanic Garden, maintaining facilities and grounds for the Congress and the U.S. Supreme Court, and managing construction and renovation across the Capitol complex. The current architect of the Capitol, J. Brett Blanton, has served in the role since January 2020. Among the offices under the architect is the Office of the Chief Security Officer, which, quote, coordinates interagency emergency preparedness and supports USCP in protecting, policing, and providing security for the congressional community and its visitors. The Office of 24 Employees is led by Valerie Hasbury, the Chief Security Officer. B. 
role of federal intelligence agencies. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, is the primary investigative arm of the Department of Justice, or DOJ, and a member of the U.S. intelligence community, with both intelligence and law enforcement responsibilities, and the broadest investigative authority of all federal law enforcement agencies. Countering terrorism is the FBI's top investigative priority and its intelligence responsibilities focus on specific terrorist plots, both international and domestic. The FBI works with other law enforcement agencies through partnerships and information sharing. The FBI is the U.S. government's lead domestic counterterrorism entity. The Department of Homeland Securities, or DHS, Office of Intelligence and Analysis, or I and A, is also a member of the intelligence community. Its mission is, quote, to equip the department with the intelligence and information it needs to keep the homeland safe, secure, and resilient, unquote. I and A does this by accessing, receiving, and analyzing law enforcement information and intelligence and facilitating multi-directional transfers of intelligence between DHS, the intelligence community, state, local, tribal, and territorial governments, and the private sector. According to I and A, the intelligence activities its personnel perform support DHS's mission by identifying threats and other acts that could potentially affect homeland security including relating to domestic terrorism. The FBI and DHS INA participate in information sharing and partnerships with federal and local law enforcement, including USCP and MPD. Intelligence is usually conveyed via written analytical products, including one, threat assessments, two, bulletins, and three, information reports. As the DOJ Inspector General has previously described, quote, assessments may be either strategic or tactical. Strategic assessments support department-wide programs, plans, and strategies, or provide information to policymakers. Tactical assessments support cases or operations, or cover specific threats. Information reports contain single-source intelligence, that has not deeply evaluated. Bulletins are unclassified descriptions of significant developments or trends that are shared broadly within the law enforcement community. FBI and DHS frequently provide threat assessments in advance of high-profile events designated as National Special Security Events or Special Event Assessment Ratings such as inaugurations and Super Bowls. They also issue bulletins to highlight an actual or emerging threat or significant threat-related development. End of Section 2. Section 3 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section C the attack. January 6, 2021, marked the most significant breach of the Capitol in over 200 years. Seven hours elapsed between when the security perimeter was first breached and when USCP declared the building secure. On that day, officers faced violent physical and verbal assaults. Three officers and four other individuals ultimately lost their lives. The following section provides a high-level overview of the attack on the Capitol and some of the efforts of the brave men and women who worked to repel the attack. 1. Events of January 6. On November 7, with some states still counting votes, the major news networks projected that Joe Biden had secured enough electoral votes to win the 2020 presidential election. In response, President Trump issued a statement that he planned to pursue legal challenges to election results in certain states. Nearly all cases were ultimately dismissed or withdrawn. By December 14th, 
all 50 states and the District of Columbia had certified their respective election results, which totaled 306 electoral votes for Biden and 232 for Trump. Following the state certification, President Trump continued to assert that the election was stolen from him. His statements focused on the January 6th counting of the Electoral College votes during a joint session of Congress. The process in Congress on January 6th is based on a federal law that allows Congress to consider objections to a state certification of its electors. If both a member of the House and a member of the Senate object to a state certification of electors, it requires a congressional vote on whether to reject that state's electors. Congress has only voted on objections twice in the 133 years since enacting this statute prior to 2020. Pro-Trump groups planned rallies for January 6th that President Trump promoted, and on January 5th, President Trump announced that he would speak during the Save America rally at the White House ellipse. On the morning of January 6th, thousands of people began gathering across Washington, D.C. Law enforcement agencies, including USCP and MPD, were monitoring the demonstrators as early as 6 o'clock a.m. and releasing demonstration updates throughout the day. Most demonstrators headed to the Ellipse, near the White House, for the Save America rally, where then-President Trump would speak. By 10.30 a.m., a USCP demonstration update indicated that somewhere between 25,000 and 30,000 people were at the Ellipse. The 10.30 a.m. USCP update also noted that organizers of the rally planned to march to the Capitol after the president's speech. In addition to those demonstrators at the Ellipse, other demonstrators headed directly to the Capitol complex. By 11 a.m., USCP was aware of large crowds around the Capitol building, including a group of approximately 200 Proud Boys. Throughout the city, law enforcement agencies were aware of and responding to reports of suspicious packages and individuals with firearms. President Trump began his address just before noon. During the next 75 minutes, the president continued his claims of election fraud and encouraged his supporters to go to the Capitol. President Trump's speech is included in its entirety in Appendix B. Before the president finished his address, crowds began leaving the ellipse for the Capitol. USCP received reports of, quote, a very large group heading to the U.S. Capitol from eastbound on Pennsylvania Avenue, unquote. By 12.45 p.m., quote, what looked like a wall of people suddenly arrived about a block west of the Capitol, unquote. At the same time, USCP received a report of a pipe bomb at the Republican National Committee headquarters. Law enforcement officials would discover a similar pipe bomb at the Democratic National Committee headquarters shortly after 1 p.m. Footnote. As a precaution, USCP cleared residences and businesses near the Republican and Democratic National Committee headquarters. USCP also ordered the evacuation of two office buildings nearest to the location of the explosive devices, the Cannon House Office Building and the James Madison Memorial Building of the Library of Congress. Returning to the text, while responding to these explosive devices, USCP officers discovered a vehicle containing a firearm and 11 Molotov cocktails. At the Capitol, a large group amassed near the Capitol reflecting pool. At approximately 12.53 p.m., individuals within that group picked up one of the metal bike racks that demarcated USCP's security perimeter and shoved it into the USCP officers standing guard. This marked the initial breach of USCP's outer security perimeter. Crowds began to flow onto the Capitol's west front grounds. 
all available USCP units were ordered to respond to the West Front. Five minutes after the initial breach, Mr. Sund called MPD Acting Chief Robert Conti to request immediate assistance. Footnote. In his own testimony before the committees, Mr. Sund did not indicate when he called Acting Chief Conti. He did, however, state that by 12.50 p.m., he understood the situation to be deteriorating rapidly, and at 12.53 p.m., called an MPD assistant chief to request assistance. Returning to the text, nearby MPD officers began to arrive at the west front of the Capitol within minutes, where MPD bicycle patrol officers temporarily reestablished a perimeter. At approximately 1 o'clock p.m., a USCP inspector ordered a lockdown of the Capitol building. At 1.01 p.m., Mr. Sund also requested assistance from the United States Secret Service. Mr. Sund has stated that he also sought approval from the House and Senate SAAs to request National Guard support. As the situation outside continued to deteriorate, inside the Capitol building, Congress was convening in a joint session to certify results of the Electoral College vote. Vice President Pence, who presided over the joint session, gaveled in at 1.03 p.m. President Trump concluded his speech at 1.10 p.m. At 1.12 p.m., the two chambers separated and began to debate objections to the certification of Arizona's Electoral College votes. After overrunning USCP's security perimeter on the west front of the building, rioters pressed towards the Capitol building, climbing the inaugural platform and scaling walls. The only remaining security perimeter consisted of the USCP officers positioned around the grounds, who were overwhelmed and outnumbered. USCP officers attempted to hold back the rioters with chemical munitions, such as oleoresin capsicum, or OC spray, more commonly known as pepper spray. Muriel Bowser, mayor of Washington, D.C., called the Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy, at approximately 1.34 p.m. to seek National Guard support. Footnote. According to the Department of Defense, Mayor Bowser's call came at 1.34 p.m. The office of the mayor indicated to the committees that Mayor Bowser did not speak to Secretary McCarthy until after 1.49 p.m. Returning to the text, by 1.49 p.m., rioters had breached the Upper West Terrace. At 1.49 p.m., Mr. Sund called William Walker, D.C. National Guard Commanding General, to request immediate assistance. At the same time, MPD declared a riot at the Capitol. Two minutes later, at 1.51 p.m., Mr. Sund activated USCP's mutual aid agreement with national Capitol Region law enforcement entities. At 2 p.m., then-Assistant Chief Pittman also ordered a lockdown of the Capitol building. Rioters continued to push toward the Capitol building, reaching the Rotunda Steps by 2.06 p.m. and the House Plaza by 2.08 p.m. Ms. Pittman then expanded the lockdown to cover the entire Capitol complex. At 2.10 p.m., rioters breached the final barricade on the west front and northwest side of the Capitol, quickly approaching an entrance near the Senate chamber. Also at 2.10 p.m., House SAA Irving and Senate SAA Stenger issued an emergency declaration on behalf of the Capitol Police Board and formally approved requesting National Guard assistance. A minute later, rioters smashed through first-floor windows on the Capitol's south side, making a hole big enough to climb through. A stream of protesters entered with two individuals kicking open a nearby door to let others into the Capitol. According to reports, officers attempted to disperse the group with pepper balls and smoke bombs. 
at 2.13 p.m., two minutes after rioters breached the building, the Senate went into recess. At 2.14 p.m., USCP officer Eugene Goodman redirected rioters away from the Senate chamber. Vice President Pence and congressional leaders were evacuated to secure locations. An order to lock down the House and Senate chambers was issued at 2.15 p.m. The House declared a brief recess at 2.18 p.m. All active USCP Civil Disturbance Unit, or CDU, platoons were deployed to either the House side of the Capitol or the Rotunda. After receiving the board's 2.10 p.m. authorization, Mr. Sund urgently requested National Guard support. During a teleconference around 2.30 p.m. with Pentagon officials and D.C. government officials, including Mayor Bowser, Director of the D.C. Homeland Security and Emergency Management Agency, Dr. Christopher Rodriguez, and Acting MPD Chief Conti, Mr. Sund pleaded for immediate backup. According to the testimony of Mr. Sund, Acting MPD Chief Conti and Commanding General Walker, officials from the Department of the Army at DOD headquarters, particularly Lieutenant Generals Walter Piat and Charles Flynn, responded that it was not their best military advice to support the request because they did not, quote, like the optics of the National Guard standing a line at the Capitol, unquote. At 2.43 p.m., rioters broke the glass of a door to the Speaker's lobby, a hallway that would have given the rioters direct access to the House chamber. When the rioters tried to lift Ashley Babbitt through the opening, a USCP officer fatally shot her. Footnote. On April 14th, DOJ announced that it had closed its investigation into Ms. Babbitt's death citing insufficient evidence to support a criminal prosecution of the USCP officer. Returning to the text, less than 10 minutes later, rioters breached the Senate chamber. In the House chamber, USCP officers barricaded the door with furniture and drew their weapons to hold off rioters. The last members were evacuated from the House chamber by 2.57 p.m. After 3 p.m., additional reinforcements from federal agencies began to arrive, and USCP turned to extracting and securing congressional staff. A number of agencies and entities provided assistance, including DHS, the FBI, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the Montgomery County Police Department, the Arlington County Police Department, the Fairfax Police Department, and Virginia State Troopers. With this help, USCP secured the Senate and House chambers, along with the basement, subways, first floor, and crypts by 4.28 p.m. D.C. National Guard personnel began arriving at the Capitol at approximately 5.20 p.m. By 6.14 p.m., USCP, D.C. National Guard, and MPD successfully established a security perimeter on the west side of the Capitol building. At 8 p.m., after completing a sweep of the Capitol grounds with partner law enforcement agencies, USCP declared the Capitol secure, and the Senate reconvened to resume consideration of the objection to Arizona's electoral votes. Shortly afterwards, at approximately 9 p.m., the House reconvened. After rejecting objections to the counting of electoral votes from Arizona and Pennsylvania, the joint session of Congress officially affirmed the results of the Electoral College at 3.42 a.m. on January 7, formally declaring Joseph Biden and Kamala Harris as winners of the 2020 presidential election. Two, communication with Capitol staff. Both USCP and the sergeants at arms alert employees working at the Capitol complex about ongoing security threats 
through the use of automated email alerts. But primary responsibility for security notification to senators and Senate staff resides with the Senate Sergeant at Arms. In the days leading up to and around 11.39 a.m. on January 6, the Senate SAA issued a reminder to staff of, quote, several First Amendment activities, unquote, scheduled to take place throughout the District of Columbia. The alert reassured employees that USCP and the SAA were, quote, aware of these First Amendment activities and monitoring impacts to congressional activities and to support the safety and security of senators and staff. USCP had additional personnel throughout Capitol grounds, unquote. Although USCP issued several email alerts on January 6, the Senate SAA did not issue any Senate-wide email alerts during the attack. Footnote. Senate SAA sent alerts to emergency coordinators for individual Senate offices. Returning to the text, USCP issued 19 email alerts between 11.15 a.m. and 7.24 p.m. on January 6, more than half of which were sent before the Capitol building was breached. Still, those alerts contained little information or context for employees. They simply noted that USCP was investigating suspicious packages, informed employees of road closures, and ordered staff to relocate from the Cannon House office building. Although Ms. Pittman ordered a lockdown of the Capitol building at 2 p.m., Capitol employees were not made aware of this until 2.10 p.m. The alert informed staff that no entry or exit was permitted, but that staff were still able to, quote, move throughout the buildings, unquote. At 2.18 p.m., USCP circulated an updated warning, quote, Capitol staff, due to a security threat inside the building, immediately move inside your office or the nearest office. Take emergency equipment and visitors. Close, lock, and stay away from external doors and windows. If you are in a public space, find a place to hide or seek cover. Remain quiet and silence electronics. Once you are in a safe location, immediately check in with your office emergency contact. No one will be permitted to enter or exit the building until directed by USCP, unquote. USCP resent the same message three additional times on January 6th at 3.41 p.m., 4.09 p.m., and 6.44 p.m. No further context, information, or direction was provided via these automated emergency alert systems. Staff were not informed until 7.24 p.m. that, quote, if anyone must leave, unquote, they could do so via certain doors. Footnote. According to press accounts, these vague and sparse communications left many congressional employees who were working on January 6th feeling helpless and fearful. One congressional staffer described how his colleagues were forced to evacuate and shelter in the halls of Longworth for hours, not fully aware of everything that was happening above ground. Returning to the text. 3. Experience of Law Enforcement Officers Throughout the seven hours of the riot on the Capitol grounds, law enforcement officers faced verbal and absolutely brutal, violent, physical abuse. One officer described an interaction with a group of protesters during the evacuation of the Senate. Quote, we stopped several men in full tactical gear, and they stated, quote, you better get out of our way, boy, or we'll go through you to get the senators, unquote. Recounting initial encounters with the crowd, 
along the metal bike racks, another officer recalled, We did what we could against impossible odds, and a volatile crowd which many times threatened us with phrases like, We're going to kill you, we're going to murder you, and then them. You guys are traitors and should be killed. I felt at this time a tangible fear that maybe I, or some of my colleagues, might not make it home alive. Unquote. Other officers have publicly described instances of racial abuse from the crowd. Many were called traitors and Nazis. An officer described being called a pawn of China and seeing someone give a Nazi salute to the Capitol behind me. Officer Harry Dunn told ABC News, quote, I got called an N-word a couple dozen times today protecting the Capitol building, unquote. He also described black officers feeling targeted because of their race, saying, quote, We fought against not just people that hated what we represented, but they hate our skin color also, unquote. Officers responding to the attack suffered a range of injuries in the line of duty. Many officers have recounted repeated attacks with chemical irritants from the crowd, including bear spray and insecticide. One officer stated that he was, quote, sprayed in the eyes with some kind of chemical irritant that was far stronger than any pepper spray I have ever had used against me in training, unquote. Other officers reported burns, breathing, and lung complications, and their eyes sealing shut from irritation due to repeated exposure to the chemical irritants. Captain Carnachet Mendoza testified to the committees that she received chemical burns to her face, which had not healed nearly two months after the attack. Officers were also physically assaulted with a range of objects thrown from the crowds, pinned against surfaces, and beaten with flagpoles and other weapons carried or found by rioters, including frozen water bottles. For example, rioters disassembled a fence in front of the inaugural platform and used the pieces to assault officers. One officer described the fear experienced that day, stating, quote, At one point, I was pushed so hard and crushed in between people that I could not breathe. This was a frightening situation, unquote. Another officer recounted the various types of weapons used by the crowd. Quote, the objects thrown at us varied in size, shape, and consistency. Some were frozen cans and bottles, rebar from the construction, bricks, liquids, pepper spray, bear spray, sticks of various widths, pipes, bats. Some were armed with guns and some had tasers or something similar. I specifically remembered being sprayed with bear spray at least six to eight times while tussling with rioters who were trying to use the bike racks against us as weapons, unquote. Approximately 140 law enforcement officers reported injuries suffered during the attack. Footnote. USCP reported 73 injured officers and MPD reported 65 injured officers. Quote, many more sustained injuries from the assault, scratches, bruises, eyes burning from bear mace that they did not even bother to report, unquote. Returning to the text, the Capitol Police Labor Committee released a statement recounting some of the more serious injuries, quote, I have officers who were not issued helmets prior to the attack who have sustained brain injuries. One officer has two cracked ribs and two smashed spinal discs. One officer is going to lose his eye, and another was stabbed with a metal fence stake, unquote. Patrick Burke, executive director of the Washington, D.C. Police Foundation, reported that one officer suffered a heart attack after being attacked several times with a stun gun. Three officers lost their lives following the attack. USCP officer Brian Sicknick a 13-year veteran and member of the first responder unit, 
was stationed on the west front of the Capitol, where rioters attacked him with bear spray. Officer Sicknick passed away at 9.30 p.m. on January 7th. Officer Howard Liebengood, a 16-year veteran of USCP, died on January 9th. Officer Jeffrey Smith, a 12-year veteran of MPD, died on January 15th. Despite the hardships they faced, officers engaged in countless acts of bravery and heroism. One officer noted that, quote, the officers inside all behaved admirably and heroically, and even outnumbered, went on the offensive and took the capital back, unquote. Another officer described a situation where an officer went above and beyond to help out however possible, quote, a light-duty officer in a suit from the Capitol Division came up to me at the triage site on the Capitol Visitor Center landing and asked how he could help. I told him that we needed bottles of water in a bad way for rinsing eyes out. I figured he would go back to the detail where there was a pile, but he instead went to the Senate carryout and returned with a few cases of water being carried by him and the Senate carryout cook, still wearing his white apron and paper hat. They brought us smart water, seriously expensive stuff, unquote. Another officer stated that he, quote, saw officers responding to save members and staff in offices, unquote. Quote, saw many officers get sprayed with irritants and saw officers standing in the way of the bloodthirsty mob to prevent them from achieving their goals, unquote. Describing the aftermath of that day, another officer recounted, quote, I wandered around the building for a little bit, looking at the wreckage and trying to take everything in before people cleaned up. Doors and windows were broken and had been barricaded with furniture and display cases. There was broken glass, trash, banners, and signs. I went down to the Lower West Terrace through the tunnel, and it was just trashed. Knives, baseball bats, flagpoles, banners, CDU shields, body armor, pants, socks, shoes, hats, uniform items, jackets, wallets, cash, phones, flags, and signs littered the ground. Everything was covered in white from the tear gas, and I could still smell the pepper spray. Unquote. End of section three. Section four of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part four. Federal intelligence agencies did not issue a threat assessment or bulletin for the joint session of Congress. Neither DHS nor FBI issued a threat assessment or joint intelligence bulletin specific to the January 6 joint session of Congress. Mr. Sund attributed the security failures of January 6 in part to not having better intelligence from federal partners. He has stated that in a January 5 meeting with USCP leadership, Members of the Capitol Police Board and officials from the FBI, U.S. Secret Service, and D.C. National Guard, no entity, quote, provided any intelligence indicating that there would be a coordinated violent attack on the United States Capitol by thousands of well-equipped armed insurrectionists, unquote. A. FBI released a situational information report on January 5, by email. According to reports, shortly following the attack, the director of the FBI's Washington field office, Stephen D. Antuono, told reporters that prior to January 6, there was no indication of anything other than First Amendment activity. Thus, the FBI did not issue a threat assessment or intelligence bulletin specific to the joint session or January 6. Although not a formal intelligence bulletin, the FBI did disseminate at least one report warning of violence at the Capitol. 
On January 5th, the FBI's Norfolk Field Office disseminated a situational information report, or SIR, that warned of online discussions of potential violence on January 6th. An SIR is a mechanism used by field offices, quote, to share locally derived information, unquote, that, quote, is typically operational in nature and actionable by or relevant to only a limited audience in specific domains, unquote, and does not meet the same criteria as an intelligence assessment. An SIR's specific purpose is, quote, to disseminate potential threat information to relevant partners, unquote. The Norfolk SIR highlighted a particular online thread stating, quote, Be ready to fight. Congress needs to hear glass breaking, doors being kicked in, and blood from their BLM and Pantifa slave soldiers being spilled. Get violent. Stop calling this a march or rally or a protest. Go there ready for war, unquote. Jill Sanborn, then assistant director of the FBI's counterterrorism division, characterized the Norfolk SIR as, quote, information off the Internet unattributable to a specific person, unquote. However, she acknowledged that it was, quote, concerning enough, unquote, that the Washington field office disseminated the report to law enforcement partners via email, briefed it verbally during an interagency command post meeting, and uploaded the report to the FBI's LEAP portal, which is available to all state and local partners. Footnote. FBI informed the committees that the interagency command post briefings occurred in person and included representatives from USCP, MPD, and the U.S. Park Police. Returning to the text, documents provided to the committees show that an FBI Norfolk field office analyst emailed the SIR, which was described as relating to potential criminal activities in the Washington, D.C. area planned for tomorrow, January 6, to the FBI Washington Field Office at 6.52 p.m. on January 5th. At 7.37 p.m., an intelligence analyst with FBI's Washington Field Office sent the SIR to law enforcement partners in the National Capital Region including USCP, MPD, U.S. Park Police, and others, writing only, quote, Please see the attached SIR released this evening by Norfolk for awareness, unquote. As noted above, FBI Washington field office officials also briefed the content of the SIR during an interagency command post meeting, which included USCP, MPD, and U.S. Park Police, at 8 p.m., acting MPD Chief Conti criticized the FBI's reliance on email, testifying that the FBI failed to ensure the intelligence was escalated appropriately and arguing that, quote, something of this magnitude, unquote, should prompt phone calls immediately. Acting MPD Chief Conti testified, quote, if there was information about a federal building being overrun, I assure you that I would be on the phone directly with the officials that are responsible for the law enforcement response, unquote. He added that officials should not rely on technology in the form of an email and hope the information makes it to where it needs to be. B. DHS did not produce any intelligence products specific to January 6. DHS, I, and A never produced an intelligence product, bulletin, or warning specific to the January 6 joint session of Congress. One I and A official informed the committees that he was, quote, not aware of any known direct threat to the Capitol before January 6, unquote despite many online posts mentioning violence. Footnote. According to DHS, INDA personnel report on social media posts or other open source activities when, 
One, it is specific enough to meet a validated intelligence reporting or warning threshold. Two, the analyst reasonably believes it constitutes a true threat or would incite violence against individuals or property. Or three, it would provide analytically significant insights concerning individuals already reasonably believed to pose such a threat to homeland security. DHS officials again stress the need for analysts to distinguish between credible threats and mere statements of violence, however hyperbolic, controversial, or coarse. Returning to the text, in briefings with the committees, INA officials highlighted the difficulty in discerning credible threats from online bravado and constitutionally protected speech, which limits its collection capabilities. They asserted, however, that INA produced approximately 15 broad strategic warnings and assessments relating to domestic violent extremism, including the potential for violence and threats against government officials, buildings, and events related to the 2020 presidential and general elections and transition period. The majority of INA's products were specific to domestic violent extremists' particular methods or targets, such as the targeting of open-air, publicly accessible locations or national icons, and the use of vehicle ramming. Other reports were broad assessments of key threats to the homeland or the different types of domestic violent extremism. For example, in October 2020, DHS issued the Homeland Threat Assessment. INDA released a related summary of key threats. Domestic terrorism, along with cyber threats, malign influence, threats to U.S. economic security, and exploitation of U.S. academic and research institutions, was among the threats discussed in that document. A week before the January 6 attack, INDA released an intelligence in-depth report on the diverse domestic violent extremist landscape. That report referenced potential violence associated with political grievances and highlighted a number of other domestic violent extremist threats from across the ideological spectrum. Certain reports did warn of the potential for violent extremists to quickly mobilize to commit violence, but those reports did not reveal any intelligence indicators or warnings specific enough to have prompted a stronger security posture by USCP or MPD. The only report containing actionable recommendations was the October 2020 report on vehicle ramming, which recommended law enforcement consider restricting vehicle access to protest sites. As discussed below, this was among the steps taken by USCP prior to January 6. While INDA issued reports prior to January 6 that identified government facilities, personnel, and events related to the 2020 general election and political transition period as likely targets of domestic violent extremists, no report specifically identified the joint session of Congress or the Capitol. Nevertheless, Melissa Smyslova, acting undersecretary of INDA, testified that INDA's reports were sufficiently specific to warn law enforcement partners of the type of violence that occurred on January 6. Quote, I, actually in preparation for this hearing, did review all of those reports and was impressed with how well the team did. They were very well written and very specific. The point, Senator, is that we thought we had provided that warning. We did not have anything specific about an attack on the Capitol to occur on January 6, so we did not issue a separate report. In hindsight, we probably should have, but we had just issued a report on December 30th with our colleagues at FBI and the National Counterterrorism Center where we thought that that was sufficient. Unquote. She added that it was unclear to her why consumers of INDA's intelligence products were not better prepared for the attack. Still, 
Ms. Mlasova pledged to provide better information and intelligence to INA's partners going forward to allow for strong security preparations. C. FBI and DHS did not deem credible online posts calling for violence at the Capitol. Of the intelligence products DHS and DOJ provided to the committees, almost all referenced violent extremists' use of online message boards, social media, memes, or hashtags. The majority of these referenced particular threats of violence posted on social media or posts encouraging others to commit violent acts. For example, DHS's October 2020 Homeland Threat Assessment noted that violent extremist media almost certainly will spread violent extremist ideologies, especially via social media, that encourage violence and influence action within the United States. Further, INA's December 30, 2020 report on the diverse domestic violence extremism landscape stated that, quote, the use of social media to make threats of violence upon which domestic violent extremists often do not act is a limitation on DHS's ability to detect and disrupt domestic violent extremist plots. When asked how INA did not identify any of the social media posts calling for attacking the Capitol prior to January 6, one DHS INA official cautioned that social media is, quote, nuanced and that it can be difficult to distinguish between mere rhetoric and overt threats. Ms. Smyslova also acknowledged shortcomings with the intelligence community's current approach to domestic violent extremism, particularly online. She testified to the committee's, quote, A lesson learned from the events of January 6th is that distinguishing between those engaged in constitutionally protected activities from those involved in destructive, violent, and threat-related behavior is a complex challenge. For example, domestic violent extremists may filter or disguise online communications with vague innuendo to protect operational security, avoid violating social media platforms' terms of service, and appeal to a broader pool of potential recruits. Under the guise of the First Amendment, Domestic violent extremists recruit supporters and incite and engage in violence. Further complicating the challenge, these groups migrate to private or closed social media platforms and encrypted channels to obfuscate their activity. We must develop the tools to overcome this challenge if we are to effectively address the rising levels of violence perpetrated by those who are inspired by domestic extremist ideological beliefs, unquote. Ms. Smyslova acknowledged that DHS needs to better understand the domestic violent extremism threat and improve its abilities to counter it. Quote, we are also working much more focused on applying more resources to better understanding this particular threat. We also are looking at how we can better understand social media to get those tips and maybe get better insight into what this adversary is doing. This is a very difficult threat for us and the intelligence community to understand. It will require more partnerships with non-traditional partners and with our standard state and local partners. And you will see that we will reinforce our already good partnership with the FBI. We will do better." Unquote. When asked if the FBI was aware of specific conversations on social media calling for violence in the lead-up to January 6th, Ms. Sanborn testified, quote, to my knowledge, no, and I would just sort of articulate why that is. So under our authorities, because being mindful of the First Amendment and our dual-headed mission to uphold the Constitution, we cannot collect First Amendment protected activities without sort of the next step, which is the intent. And so we would have to have an already predicated investigation 
that allowed us access to those comms and or a lead or a tip or a report from a community citizen or a fellow law enforcement partner for us to gather that information, unquote. Ms. Sanborn also acknowledged that there may be areas for improvement in dissemination of threat information. When asked whether a lack of resources impact FBI's ability to respond, Ms. Sanborn responded that the issues are twofold. First, she highlighted the challenge of trying to figure out the intent of an individual through the volume of rhetoric. Second, she pointed out that the FBI might not have the ability to mitigate a threat without a chargeable offense. She noted, however, that FBI did take overt action by talking to individuals the FBI was tracking who intended to come to Washington, D.C., and trying to convince them not to come. End of Section 4. Section 5 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 5. U.S. Capitol Police did not communicate intelligence warning of violence at the Capitol on January 6th. USCP's Intelligence and Interagency Coordination Division, or IICD, possessed information about the potential for violence at the Capitol on January 6th, including a plot to breach the Capitol, the online sharing of maps of the Capitol complex's tunnel systems, and other specific threats of violence. IICD, however, did not convey the full scope of information or assess the threat as likely to occur, which affected USCP's preparations. IICD also issued numerous intelligence products, but none conveyed the full scope of known information about the threat to Congress, to USCP leadership, rank-and-file officers, or law enforcement partners. A. USCP's Decentralized Intelligence Resources Officials have noted that USCP is not a collector of intelligence, as defined in Title 50 of the United States Code, but rather a consumer of intelligence that relies on the intelligence community and law enforcement partners to collect, analyze, and provide it with intelligence information. Nonetheless, USCP has three components responsible for intelligence-related activities. These components use open sources to gather and analyze intelligence, which is incorporated into written products distributed across USCP and, at times, to law enforcement partners and members of the Capitol Police Board. USCP's intelligence-related components are the Intelligence and Interagency Coordination Division, or IICD, the Threat Assessment Section, TAS, and the Intelligence Operations Section, IOS. All three are organized within USCP's Protective Services Bureau, PSB. TAS and IOS are components of PSB's Investigations Division. As mentioned above, Ms. Pittman was the Assistant Chief of Police for Protective and Intelligence Operations on January 6th and in that role oversaw all three of USCP's intelligence-related entities. What follows is an organizational chart of the Office of the Assistant Chief of Police for Protective and Intelligence Operations. The full organizational chart can be viewed in the printed version of the report. Returning to the text, the three intelligence entities interact, collaborate, and provide mission support to one another. However, each has a distinct mission. TAS is responsible for investigating any threat to a member of Congress. IOS agents are the boots on the ground during demonstrations and relay information concerning field activity to IICD, which then reports this information, along with open source information, to USCP commanders. 
IICD is the principal point of contact within USCP for the intelligence community and coordinates with the law enforcement community at the federal, state, local, and tribal levels to increase the collection and sharing of intelligence information. Among other items, IICD is responsible for 1. Maximizing the collection and analysis of all source information and intelligence. 2. Identifying potential threats. 3. Disseminating products and reports on events and incidents of interest to, or that may impact, the U.S. Capitol, the legislative process, members, staff, or visitors. And 4. Briefing USCP leadership on threats. IICD is small in terms of resources. Mr. Sun testified that IICD is comprised of approximately 30 to 35 analysts who had been operating in a 24-7 posture since November 2020. A review of USCP's employee roster as of January 6, however, found 14 individuals listed within IICD, including the director. By comparison, IOS had 24 employees and TAS had 33 employees. As of January 6, IICD produced three key written products. One, special event assessments. Two, daily intelligence reports. And three, information reports. Before any major event, IICD prepares a special event assessment, which contains A, a bottom line up front detailing the key takeaways of the assessment, B, an event summary, C, detail on expected protests, D, a threat assessment, and E, IICD's overall analysis. Daily intelligence reports, or DIRs, by contrast, provide an overview of scheduled events, such as committee hearings, congressional events, and demonstration activities and monitor relevant issues, including suspicious activity reports and domestic and international affairs. Each scheduled event is assigned a level of probability of acts of civil disobedience or arrests occurring based on current intelligence information. The level of probability ranges from remote to nearly certain. What follows is a table of those levels of probability. On the left, remote, a probability from 1 to 5 percent, to nearly certain on the right, from 95 to 99 percent. Returning to the text, the DIR also tracks DHS's National Terrorism Advisory System level. The last category of products, information papers and reports, are intended to draw attention to a particular event or security issue. Although IICDs, TASs, and IOSs responsibilities intersect, the distribution of resources across these entities creates challenges, including the timely sharing of relevant intelligence and a lack of coordination within the agency and with law enforcement partners. B. USCP was warned of the likelihood of violence on January 6. IICD was aware of the potential for violence at the Capitol on January 6 through social media posts, monitoring of relevant websites, and warnings from private citizens. Internal records and USCP officials' testimony confirm that USCP began gathering information about events planned for January 6, 2021, as soon as demonstrations to protest the Electoral College vote certification were announced in mid-December 2020. IICD analysts completed a first special event assessment on December 16, 2020, and updated the assessment on three occasions to include new information, such as recently collected intelligence and approved demonstration activity. Although these special event assessments captured some of the intelligence available about the potential for violence, none conveyed the breadth of information 
that IICD possessed at the time. 1. IICD anticipated protests related to the joint session in mid-December 2020. On December 11th, IICD Director John Donahue anticipated a challenge to the electoral vote from a few members of Congress and requested a preliminary assessment for the January 6th joint session of Congress. Director Donahue also requested a private company that monitors social media to set an alert for the phrase joint session of Congress. On December 14th, Sean Gallagher, Deputy Chief for the PSB, alerted Mr. Sund and Ms. Pittman that the joint session on January 6th, quote, will bring some demonstrations with the potential for some issues on the House floor, unquote. Mr. Sund responded, considering a significant deployment. IICD issued the first iteration of the special event assessment or special assessment, for the joint session of Congress on December 16, 2020. The December 16 special assessment indicated that USCP was aware of only two planned protests, one by a pro-Trump group and the other by a pro-Biden group. The special assessment noted that there were no specific known threats to the joint session and that there were, quote, no social media indications for specific threats or concerning comments directed at the joint session of Congress, unquote. It did acknowledge, however, quote, the threat of disruptive actions or violence cannot be ruled out, unquote. The overall analysis concluded, at this time, there are no specific known threats related to the joint session of Congress Electoral College vote certification. In the subsequent days, members of IICD continued to prepare for the joint session by collecting and receiving intelligence about the growing possibility of armed protesters and likelihood of violence. Internal records reflect that on December 19th, IICD learned about President Trump's tweet, quote, Big protest in D.C. on January 6th. Be there. Will be wild. Unquote. IICD also received information about a million MAGA March tweet. Quote, January 6th. This will be the biggest protest in American history. Unquote. And a parlor post stating in substance, Occupy D.C., Congress, SCOTUS, WH. On December 21st, MPD circulated an email to law enforcement partners, including USCP, flagging a million MAGA March tweet, quote, this is the big one. Donald Trump is calling for this March himself, unquote. MPD warned, it looks like we are going to have another big First Amendment demo on January 6th, similar to the November 14th and December 12th events, and noted that permit applications had already been submitted. 2. IICD issued an investigative research and analysis report on threats to the tunnels. On December 21st, IICD also issued a seven-page investigative research and analysis report, the December 21st IICD report, highlighting the blog thedonald.win, which referenced tunnels on Capitol grounds used by members of Congress. The report highlighted the following blog post, quote, There are tunnels connected to the Capitol building! Exclamation mark. Legislators use them to avoid press, among other things! Exclamation mark. Take note! Unquote. The December 21st IICD report also listed Patriot organizations expected to participate in events on January 6th, including Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, and Stop the Steal, and listed secure communications likely to be used, including Signal and Wicker. 
The December 21st IICD report attached a map of the Capitol campus that was posted to the blog and noted, several comments promote confronting members of Congress and carrying firearms during the protest. It flagged approximately 30 screenshots of comments on the website, including, exactly, forget the tunnels, get into Capitol building, stand outside Congress, be in the room next to them. They won't have time to run if they play dumb. Deploy Capitol Police to restrict movement. Anyone going armed needs to be mentally prepared to draw down on LEOs. Let them shoot first, but make sure they know what happens if they do. If they don't show up, we enter the Capitol as the Third Continental Congress and certify the Trump electors. Bring guns. It's now or never. If a million patriots, who up-bristling with ARs, just how brave do you think they'll be when it comes to enforcing their unconstitutional laws? Don't cuck out. This is do or die. Bring your guns. Surround every building with a tunnel entrance slash exit. They better dig a tunnel all the way to China if they want to escape. According to Ms. Pittman, this report was distributed only to command staff, including the deputy chiefs and assistant chiefs. IICD members continued to work on updating the special assessment, given that, quote, social media had exploded with information about January 6th events, unquote. On December 22nd, IICD received significant information about the rising likelihood of violence, including an email with the subject line, Threats to Bring Guns into D.C., which included the same pages from the blog, The Donald Win, and another email with the subject line, Video Promotes Armed Protests in D.C. The latter email, written to the assistant director of IICD, summarized a video of Sam Andrews, a former leader of the Missouri branch of Oath Keepers, and a report on the website The Hegman Report that described Mr. Andrews as encouraging armed conflict during the protest on January 6, 2021. On December 23rd, IICD also followed up on a call from a private citizen monitoring Twitter who warned, quote, multiple messages show that people intend to bring weapons to the Capitol on January 6th, unquote. In addition, IICD received an email from an intelligence analyst at the D.C. Homeland Security and Emergency Management Agency following up on a threat report titled, User in Far-Right Chat Group Threatens to Shoot and Kill Counter-Protesters. The email linked to threads containing threats towards the U.S. Congress and elected officials. 3. IICD revised the special assessment, but did not incorporate all available threat information. Despite IICD's knowledge about the growing threat of violence on January 6, the December 23rd special assessment's overall analysis read identical to the December 16 version. It concluded that there was, quote, no information regarding specific disruptions or acts of civil disobedience targeting this function, unquote. Although the bottom line up front noted that protesters indicated they planned to be armed, there was no reference to the December 21 IICD report mentioning the Donald Wynn blog or access to tunnels on the Capitol campus. In fact, IICD concluded that, quote, the protests slash rallies were expected to be similar to the previous Million MAGA March rallies in November and December 2020, unquote. The December 23rd special assessment also found that Quote, due to the tense political environment following the 2020 election, the threat of disruptive actions or violence cannot be ruled out, 
Actions of individuals or small groups are generally not broadcast publicly, making them impossible to detect, unquote. When asked about the inconsistency between the December 23rd special assessment and the information in IICD's possession at the time, Ms. Pittman acknowledged that there was a discrepancy, but could not explain why the discrepancy existed. Quote, I cannot go into detail without having further discussions with those individuals who wrote the reports. I think that at U.S. Capitol Police, my focus was always on the January 3rd and final assessment. However, we know that there are several lessons to be learned for making sure that there is not conflicting information, regardless of which version of the assessment is distributed." Unquote. On December 23rd, MPD's intelligence branch alerted Mr. Sund that a website named wildprotest.com had just popped up for the January 6th event. Mr. Sund was assured by Deputy Chief Gallagher that the team was tracking already. On December 28th, an individual emailed the general mailbox of USCP's Public Information Office and warned about, quote, countless tweets from Trump supporters saying they will be armed on January 6th, and tweets from people organizing to storm the Capitol on January 6th, unquote. Four, IICD's December 30th special assessment made few substantive changes. As with the earlier iterations, the December 30th special assessment did not capture the rising likelihood of violence that was known to IICD. In fact, the December 30th special assessment contained the same bottom line upfront and overall analysis as the two prior assessments. Notably, in discussing the expected protests, the December 30th special assessment stated, no group is expected to march, and all are planning to stay in their designated areas. In addition, IICD identified more than 40 social media postings promoting protests on January 6, 2021. The number of people who indicate they are going to the event listed on these social media postings is relatively low. The assessment, however, also cited data from MPD that showed a 60 to 100 percent increase in hotel bookings compared to bookings for the weekend of December 12, 2020. Yet the December 30th assessment continued to assert that the protests were expected to be similar to the previous Million MAGA March rallies in November and December 2020. 5. Aware of their intent to protest, IICD prepared an information paper on the Proud Boys. IICD continued to receive warnings from private citizens, companies, and partners about the increasing likelihood of violence. On January 1, IICD received a warning via its tip line that there were detailed plans to storm federal buildings. In addition, IICD received reports that members of the Proud Boys expected to be in D.C. on January 6. Mr. Donahue asked his staff to update an information paper on the Proud Boys. The report highlighted that the Proud Boys frequently engage in violence against left-wing protesters, and that the presence of Proud Boys at a protest increases the likelihood of violence. Officers should remain vigilant at all times, as even peaceful demonstrations can quickly devolve into violent confrontations. Notably, although this six-page report profiled the Proud Boys, they were not mentioned in any detail in the January 3rd special assessment, other than that the Proud Boys, who intend to wear plain clothes and not their traditional yellow and black clothing, white supremacist groups, Antifa, and other extremist groups will rally on January 6, 2021. 
This information paper was distributed to all USCP employees and members of the Capitol Police Board, according to Ms. Pittman. One USCP inspector, however, told the committees that he did not recall seeing the information paper prior to January 6. 6. IICD issued its final special assessment on January 3. On January 3, IICD issued its final 15-page special assessment for the joint session. As was the case with the prior assessments, the bottom line up front was not changed to capture the seriousness of the threat known at the time. It noted that several protests were expected on January 6, both on the Capitol grounds and across Washington, D.C., that, quote, some protesters have indicated they plan to be armed and that white supremacist groups may be attending, unquote. An overview of the expected protests highlighted that they would be similar to previous rallies and that protesters would remain in their designated areas. After numerous pages detailing the location of expected protests and traffic closures, and at the end of the document, IICD's overall analysis contained a starker warning. Quote, Due to the tense political environment following the 2020 election, the threat of disruptive actions or violence cannot be ruled out. Supporters of the current president see January 6, 2021, as the last opportunity to overturn the results of the presidential election. This sense of desperation and disappointment may lead to more of an incentive to become violent. Unlike previous post-election protests, the targets of the pro-Trump supporters are not necessarily the counter-protesters, as they were previously, but rather Congress itself is the target on the 6th. As outlined above, there has been a worrisome call for protesters to come to these events armed, and there is the possibility that protesters may be inclined to become violent. Further, unlike the events on November 14, 2020, and December 12, 2020, there are several more protests scheduled on January 6, 2021, and the majority of them will be on Capitol grounds. The two protests expected to be the largest of the day, the Women for America First protest at the Ellipse and the Stop the Steal protest in areas 8 and 9, may draw thousands of participants and both have been promoted by President Trump himself. The Stop the Steal protest in particular does not have a permit, but several high-profile speakers, including members of Congress, are expected to speak at the event. This, combined with the Stop the Steal's propensity to attract white supremacists, militia members, and others who actively promote violence, may lead to a significantly dangerous situation for law enforcement and the general public alike. 7. IICD continued to release daily intelligence reports that did not align with the final special assessment. In the days following the issuance of the January 3rd special assessment, IICD issued three DIRs, none of which reflected the likelihood of violence described in the January 3rd special assessment, or more broadly known within IICD. In fact, the January 4, January 5, and January 6 DIRs assessed the probability of acts of civil disobedience from the planned protests across all of Washington, D.C. as remote to improbable. Regarding a million MAGA March U.S. Capitol, the report assigned a probability of improbable, adding as context, it is possible the million MAGA March folks could organize a demonstration on USCP grounds. Women for America First has been permitted on USCP grounds and Freedom Plaza Parade Permit through MPD, 
and has been the permitted portion of previous million MAGA marches. Footnote. To demonstrate on capital grounds, individuals or groups must submit a permit to and receive approval from USCP's Special event Section, a component of USCP's Command and Coordination Bureau within the Uniformed Operations Function. The Special event Section approved six permits for January 6th, each with a limit of 50 participants due to the COVID-19 pandemic. IICD's Assistant Director expressed her concerns about certain permits to an executive officer in the Protective Services Bureau, noting that, quote, the permit requests are being used as proxies for Stop the Steal and may also be involved with organizations that may be planning trouble on January 6th, unquote. Ms. Pittman acknowledged she was aware of the concern, but she believed IICD vetted the permit requests and confirmed that the groups who had been granted permits were not affiliated with Stop the Steal. Returning to the text, the Stop the Steal event was assigned a probability of highly improbable, given that no further information has been found to the exact actions planned by this group. The Women for America First event planned for the Ellipse also received a highly improbable rating, but the report contained no explanation or context as to why this rating was assigned. It is clear that IICD intelligence products, particularly the January 3rd special assessment analysis, that Congress itself is the target on the 6th, and its warning about the significantly dangerous situation for law enforcement and the general public alike, were not incorporated in subsequent intelligence documents. One explanation given to the committees for why the January 3rd special assessment was not incorporated into the DIRs is because a single analyst prepared and disseminated the DIRs without supervisory review. C. USCP issued conflicting intelligence products in the days leading up to and on January 6. Inconsistencies between intelligence products and within the January 3rd special assessment led to a lack of consensus about the gravity of the threat posed on January 6, 2021. As the USCP Inspector General noted, if one does not read the January 3rd special assessment in its entirety, they could draw an inaccurate conclusion, since the bottom line up front section is not consistent with the rest of the document. One USCP inspector expressed concern that the warnings of violence were only included at the end of the assessment and that they appeared inconsistent with the bottom line up front section. Ms. Pittman did not acknowledge the internal inconsistencies, telling the committees that she believes anyone assessing the report would have to read the report in its entirety. When pressed on whether the bottom line up front section captured the known likelihood of violence, as detailed in later sections of the January 3rd special assessment, Ms. Pittman responded, quote, I think the report itself captures what IICD was trying to share with USCP in terms of what we may have been facing regarding the violence, unquote. To this point, the warning in the January 3 special assessment that the January 6th event would not be similar to prior marches appears to have been lost on USCP leadership. The January 3rd special assessment specifically noted, one, unlike previous post-election protests, the targets of the pro-Trump supporters are not necessarily the counter-protesters as they were previously, but rather Congress itself is the target on the 6th. And two, unlike the events on November 14, 2020 and December 12, 2020, there are several more protests scheduled on January 6, 2021, and the majority of them will be on Capitol grounds, unquote. Ms. Pittman's written statement to the House Appropriations Committee 
further clarifies this point. Quote, based on the assessment, USCP understood that this demonstration would be unlike the previous demonstrations held by protesters with similar ideologies in November and December 2020. The first and second MAGA marches were intended to put public pressure on states where vote counting was ongoing and on the Supreme Court to intervene in the election. This event was different because all judicial remedies for opposing election results had been exhausted, and the only way for their candidate to win was for Congress to reject the Electoral College results. Thus, the scheduled demonstrations were intended to pressure Congress, unquote. Despite the clear distinctions between the threat assessments for January 6th and the earlier Million MAGA marches, Mr. Sun's testimony to the committees and his February 1 letter to Speaker Pelosi focused on the January 3rd special assessment and the DIR's threat assessment language that anticipated similarities between January 6 and the prior events. Quote, As previously mentioned, the IICD intelligence assessment indicated that the January 6 protests rallies were, quote, expected to be similar to the previous million MAGA March rallies in November and December 2020, which drew tens of thousands of participants. Unquote. The assessment indicated that members of the Proud Boys, white supremacist groups, Antifa, and other extremist groups were expected to participate in the January 6th event and that they may be inclined to become violent. This was very similar to the intelligence assessment of the December 12, 2020 MAGA 2 event. In addition, on Monday, January 4, 2021, the USCP IICD published the Daily Intelligence Report, which provided an assessment of all of the groups expected to demonstrate on January 6, 2021. The IICD Daily Intelligence Report assessed the level of probability of acts of civil disobedience slash arrests occurring based on current intelligence information as remote to improbable for all of the groups expected to demonstrate on Wednesday, January 6, 2021. In addition, the Daily Intelligence Report indicated that the Secretary of Homeland Security had not issued an elevated or imminent alert at this time. Unquote. Similarly, during the February 23 hearing, Mr. Sun described the information possessed by IICD as, quote, very similar to the previous assessments. It was just a little bit more detailed, unquote. During the hearing, Senator Leahy, in reference to the January 3rd special assessment, asked Mr. Sund, quote, how much more intelligence did we need than that, unquote. Mr. Sund responded, quote, yes, sir, that is correct. That is what the intelligence assessment said. It was very similar to the intelligence assessments that we had for the November and December MAGA marches. The intelligence assessments that we had developed for the January 6th event, all the way up until January 6th, were all saying very much the same thing, and that is what we had planned for. We had planned for the possibility of violence, the possibility of some people being armed, not the possibility of a coordinated, military-style attack involving thousands against the Capitol, unquote. Significantly, the January 3rd special assessment does not appear to have informed other key decision-makers' perspectives. For example, Mr. Irving told the committees, every Capitol Police daily intelligence report between January 4th and January 6th, including on January 6th, forecast the chance of civil disobedience or arrests during the protests as remote to improbable. I relied on that intelligence when overseeing the security plan put forth by Chief Sund, unquote. Former Secretary of the Army Ryan McCarthy echoed this sentiment, quote, The intelligence that DOD received was that there was no real major difference expected between January 6th and the earlier MAGA marches. 
DOD planning documents reference that Proud Boys and Antifa members planned to attend and confront each other, and that there was no indication that Oath Keepers or other militia were planning to attend the event. Months following the attack on the U.S. Capitol, there is still no consensus among USCP officials about the intelligence report's threat analysis ahead of January 6, 2021. On January 26, Ms. Pittman testified that USCP was aware there was a strong potential for violence, despite IICD's DIR assessment of a low probability for civil disobedience or violence at the January 6 planned demonstrations. Quote, let me be clear, USCP should have been more prepared for this attack. By January 4th, USCP knew that the January 6th event would not be like any of the previous protests held in 2020. We knew that militia groups and white supremacist organizations would be attending. We also knew that some of these participants were intending to bring firearms and other weapons to the event. We knew that there was a strong potential for violence and that Congress was the target, unquote. However, Ms. Pittman testified on February 25th that neither USCP's January 3rd special assessment nor any intelligence received from intelligence or law enforcement partners contained a specific credible threat that thousands of protesters would descend on the Capitol with the intent to disrupt the Electoral College vote certification. The variations in Ms. Pittman's testimony reflect the lack of consensus about whether the available intelligence information contained specific threats. As the USCP Inspector General testified, quote, certain officials believed USCP intelligence products indicated there may be threats, but did not identify anything specific, while other officials believed it would be inaccurate to state that there were no known specific threats to the joint session based on those same USCP intelligence products, unquote. D. Other USCP intelligence entities and employees received information about potential threats to the Capitol from the FBI, but did not share this information with IICD or USCP leadership. As discussed above, on January 5th, the FBI's Norfolk Field Office disseminated an SIR that warned of online discussions of potential violence on January 6th. Specifically, the SIR highlighted a particular thread stating, quote, be ready to fight. Congress needs to hear glass breaking, doors being kicked in, and blood from their BLM and Pantifa slave soldiers being spilled. Get violent. Stop calling this a march or a rally or a protest. Go there ready for war, unquote. FBI's Norfolk Field Office transmitted that report to the FBI Washington Field Office at 6.52 p.m. on January 5th. The Norfolk intelligence analysts described the SIR as relating to, quote, potential criminal activities in the Washington, D.C. area planned for tomorrow. January 6, unquote. At 7.37 p.m., an intelligence analyst with FBI's Washington field office sent the SIR to a listserv of partners in the National Capital Region, writing only, quote, Please see the attached SIR released this evening by Norfolk for awareness, unquote. The USCP Inspector General concluded that a USCP analyst embedded with the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force retrieved a copy of the SIR from an FBI intranet system. Records provided to the committees show that the analyst, an employee within IOS, not IICD, received the SIR via the FBI Washington Field Office's email. In a February briefing with the committees, Ms. Pittman indicated that the USCP analyst forwarded the report to his supervisor, but it was not further circulated. 
Mr. Sun testified to the same account. The USCP Inspector General, however, concluded that the USCP analyst emailed the SIR to an IOS distribution list. USCP did not provide any documents to the committees confirming either account. No one from IICD or USCP leadership received the SIR before January 6th. The USCP Inspector General's report noted that the, quote, memorandum did not surface again until it was attached to an information package sent out late on January 6, 2021, after the security breach occurred, unquote. Also on the evening of January 5th, Deputy Chief Gallagher flagged additional information concerning the Capitol campus tunnel system, including an online tip received by the FBI National Threat Operations Center of a significant uptick in new visitors to the website WashingtonTunnels.com. The email attached posts from the Donald.win referencing access to tunnels and noted that the website had been very active in promoting photos of the tunnel system and stating their goal of finding Democratic members early to block them from entering the Capitol. The email also noted a huge uptick with reporting via open source of the group's intentions of forming a perimeter around the campus with an image attached. Similar to the intelligence already in IICD's possession prior to January 5th, the FBI SIR and the warning regarding the tunnel system were not elevated to USCP leadership. When asked why the FBI SIR was not escalated further, despite the warnings it contained, Mr. Sund explained that the SIR contained information similar to the existing intelligence, a limited potential for violence between protesters. Mr. Sund told the committees that IICD had processes in place to evaluate and escalate intelligence to the director and leadership as needed. The USCP Inspector General contradicted Mr. Sun's testimony, concluding, quote, there is no clear channel for the distribution of intelligence information up to the chief and down to the line officers and across departmental entities, unquote. Existing guidance on information sharing is ambiguous, such as requiring that the head of IICD ensure all intelligence information is collected processed, and disseminated in the most efficient manner possible. E. USCP did not warn its officers or law enforcement partners of the gravity of the threat. The inconsistencies in IICD's products and the lack of consensus on the nature of the threat appears to have affected leadership's perspective about the import of the January 3rd special assessment. Although Ms. Pittman placed a great significance on the January 3rd special assessment, noting that its issuance led to a significant number of security enhancements, it is unclear who received the January 3rd special assessment and whether it had a meaningful impact on its law enforcement partners. USCP stated that the conclusions of the January 3rd special assessment were discussed with law enforcement partners externally on January 4, 2021. A January 4 email memorializing notes from the call with law enforcement partners, however, does not include any discussion of the January 3 special assessment. No member of IICD is listed as participating in the call. Ms. Pittman acknowledged to the committees that the January 3 special assessment was not disseminated to law enforcement partners prior to January 6th, but she maintained it was discussed orally. Ms. Pittman also told the committees that the January 3rd special assessment was shared with members of the Capitol Police Board. The architect of the Capitol, by contrast, told the committees that he does not remember receiving the January 3rd special assessment or being briefed on it. USCP confirmed that it does not have any documentation that the January 3rd special assessment was shared 
outside the department in written form. Not only was the January 3rd special assessment not shared widely outside of USCP, it was also not briefed to rank and file officers. USCP claimed that the January 3rd special assessment was widely distributed to officers at the rank of sergeant and above internally. USCP leadership expected sergeants and lieutenants to brief the officers within their chain of command. Mr. Sun told the committees, on January 5, 2021, he issued a directive to the two assistant chiefs and bureau commanders where our officers in the field were assigned to ensure officers were briefed at roll calls on January 6, 2021 of the expected demonstration activity. He noted that he received confirmation emails that all officers and officials were briefed. Mr. Sun did not provide the details of the brief the officers were provided. In contrast, several USCP officers have stated that they received no warning about the possibility of violent protests on January 6th from USCP officials. Line officers raised concerns about USCP's leadership's lack of communication about the potential threats on January 6th, with some saying they did not receive the January 3rd special assessment, and others were made to feel that it was business as usual. One USCP inspector told the committees that they expected January 6th to be just like the previous two million MAGA marches in terms of crowd size and the potential for violence. Multiple officers also reported that no meetings were held prior to January 6th to brief officers and provide emergency plans, which typically occurs for major events. The Capitol Police Labor Committee stated USCP leadership failed to share key intelligence with officers in advance. They failed to prepare adequately. They failed to equip our officers with a plan, and on that very day, they failed to lead. Ms. Pittman, however, told the committees that the rank-and-file officers were briefed on the January 3rd special assessment. Quote, so the leadership at Capitol Police did provide those intelligence briefings to the commanders at the rank of captain or above, and it was the expectation that those commanders that are responsible for their various divisions throughout the department, that they would share that information down the chain of command to the rank-and-file officers, unquote. She acknowledged that the information would have been conveyed on a non-recorded conference call and therefore USCP does not have a record of what, if anything, was conveyed. When asked to respond to the Capitol Police Labor Committee's statement, Ms. Pittman maintained that the officers she oversaw were aware of the intelligence. Quote, having talked to commanders and specifically being aware for my area of responsibility, which was the protective and intelligence operations, I know that those officers, as well as supervisors, were aware, unquote. Ms. Pittman also stated, IICD held briefings for officers above the rank of captain on the special assessment, which provided those officers an opportunity to ask questions about the intelligence. These conflicting accounts highlight an internal communication problem in USCP, that affected the safety and security of officers and the individuals they are sworn to protect. End of Section 5. Section 6 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 6. USCP was not prepared for the attack on the Capitol, hampering its response. Despite the information IICD possessed, officials have stressed that none of it suggested a large, coordinated attack on the Capitol. Mr. Sun testified that the siege of the Capitol was not the result of poor planning by USCP, but rather a, quote, lack of accurate and complete intelligence 
across several federal agencies, unquote. Ms. Pittman agreed. Quote, the intelligence wasn't there to suggest that thousands of people, insurrectionists, were going to breach the United States Capitol attacking law enforcement officers. I believe the intelligence did advise that we should anticipate violence, that some of the violence would be directed toward the Capitol, toward Congress. But to say that any law enforcement agency in the National Capital Region had intelligence that said that tens of thousands of people were going to attack law enforcement on January 6th, I think that it's accurate to say that no law enforcement agency had that. She stressed that USCP was prepared for a significant likelihood of violence. Despite Mr. Sun's and Ms. Pittman's claims, in addition to the deficiencies in USCP's handling of available intelligence, there were also deficiencies in USCP's operational planning and response efforts. Both Ms. Pittman and Mr. Sun told the committees that USCP made a number of adjustments to its operational posture for January 6th in light of available intelligence. Yet USCP leadership did not prepare a USCP-wide security or staffing plan. USCP officers were also not trained, equipped, or staffed to respond to the attack. Many rank-and-file officers have expressed concerns about USCP's lack of preparations for the joint session. As one summarized, quote, we were ill-prepared. We were not informed with intelligence. We were betrayed. We were abandoned by all the deputy chiefs and above that day. We still have not been told where exactly the chiefs were that day and what their role was on the 6th. USCP needs to address the 6th open and honestly. The chiefs need to be held accountable. They need to be under investigation for failure to supervise and failure to take police action, unquote. Another officer stated, quote, 1 slash 6 was not only a result of a few months of intelligence not being analyzed and acted upon, but more so decades of failing to take infrastructure, force protection, emergency planning, and training seriously, unquote. A. USCP lacked detailed operational plans for January 6. 1. USCP did not prepare a department-wide operational plan. USCP did not prepare a department-wide operational plan for January 6. Prior to January 6, Mr. Sund believed USCP would need support to secure the Capitol perimeter in light of the large number of expected protesters at the Capitol, and he had informal discussions with the House and Senate sergeants-at-arms concerning National Guard assistance. One USCP inspector noted the significance of these discussions, as he was not aware of National Guard assistance at the Capitol having been discussed since the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. Despite these concerns, Mr. Sund did not direct the creation of a department-wide operational plan for January 6. Ms. Pittman told the committees that USCP creates department-wide plans for large events, but no such plan was prepared for the January 6 joint session. When asked to explain why no such plan was created, Ms. Pittman stated that it would have been the chief of police's responsibility to request that operational commanders prepare such a plan, and that she could not explain why the then chief of police chose not to do so before January 6. The USCP inspector general noted, quote, USCP did not have policies and procedures in place that communicated which personnel were responsible for operational planning, what type of operational planning documents USCP personnel should prepare, or when USCP personnel should prepare operational planning documents, unquote. 
The most comprehensive description of USCP's operational plans for the joint session was a four-page document prepared for USCP leadership to brief members about security enhancements, or leadership briefing document. The leadership briefing document described at a high level the intelligence information informing USCP's security preparations. One, the March for Trump rally on the ellipse and a Stop the Steal event planned on Capitol grounds were, quote, expected to draw thousands, unquote. Two, members of the Proud Boys and Antifa were expected to attend. Three, hotels were reporting a 60 to 100 percent increase in bookings. And four, USCP was tracking social media posts encouraging attendees to be armed. Based on this information, USCP's security preparations for January 6th included restricting the Capitol buildings and plaza to members, staff, and visitors on official business, deploying bike racks, increasing exterior patrols, posting additional officers at barricades, tunnels, and other select locations within the Capitol complex, activating seven civil disturbance platoons, enhancing protection for congressional leadership teams, and placing the Investigations Division into an all-hands-on-deck posture and having USCP analysts working 24-7 all week. Two, division-specific operational plans were not detailed. Although USCP did not prepare a department-wide plan, at least two entities created division-specific plans the Uniformed Services Bureau, or USB, and the CDU. Neither document laid out in detail staffing or officer assignments for the joint session. For example, the two-page USB operational posture document described certain, quote, beyond routine in-session COVID posts and staffing, unquote. It stated that there would be increased exterior patrols and officers stationed at particular traffic barricades and other office building locations. The operational plan, however, did not describe the overall numbers of officers on duty on January 6, where these officers would be stationed, the officers' responsibilities, the command and control system for January 6, or any contingencies in the event of emergencies. The CDU began preparing a joint session operation plan as early as December 28, 2020, and finalized the plan on January 5, 2021. Among other items, the 17-page plan contained sections on command and control, mission objectives, staffing plan, deployment strategies, and directives on use of force and crowd management tactics. The CDU operational plan also included a section on tactical response, counter-sniper overwatch, which highlighted the deployment of the Containment Emergency Response Team, or CERT, described as an eight-person counter-assault ground team staged around the Capitol complex. The CDU operational plan, however, was not informed by the January 3rd special assessment. The CDU's operation plan's description of expected protests stated that the, quote, protests slash rallies are expected to be similar to the previous Million MAGA March rallies, unquote, in contrast to the differentiating details included in the January 3rd special assessment. The CDU operational plan also stated that, quote, at this time, there are no specific known threats related to the joint session of Congress, unquote, but did not specifically acknowledge or reference the January 3rd special assessment's warning that, quote, Congress itself is the target, unquote. The CDU plan contained no detail concerning the significance of the threat 
apart from noting that the protests were expected to be similar to previous million MAGA marches, which ended in clashes between protesters and resulted in individuals being charged with assault with a dangerous weapon, assault on police, simple assault, weapons violations, riotous acts, and destruction of property, disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, and crossing a police line. When asked to reconcile the CDU operational plan statement regarding, quote, no specific known threats, unquote, and the January 3rd special assessment's overall conclusions, Ms. Pittman emphasized the word specific, arguing that, quote, for an intelligence analyst, it is in terms of the who, where, when, and how, unquote, and that much of the information in IICD's possession was raw information that needed to be vetted. However, Ms. Pittman insisted that USCP made security enhancements based on the information contained in the January 3rd special assessment, including increasing the number of CDU platoons available for January 6th. Notably, USCP did not coordinate between its protective and intelligence operations and its uniformed operations. When asked if she thought it was odd that no department-wide plan was prepared for the joint session, Ms. Pittman explained that in her role as assistant chief for the protective and intelligence operations, she was commonly not involved in planning and operations. For example, the postings of officers within the USB was between the chief and the assistant chief for uniformed services. Ms. Pittman was not consulted. Ms. Pittman also acknowledged that CDU did not consult IICD when drafting its operational plan. 3. USCP did not document a comprehensive staffing plan for January 6th. A department-wide operational plan should have detailed the number of sworn officers on duty for the joint session, where those officers would be positioned, and the command and control plan. USCP, however, did not prepare a staffing plan prior to January 6th. As noted above, USCP employed 1,840 officers on January 6th. Ms. Pittman told the committees that USCP was in an, quote, all hands on deck, unquote, posture that day. One inspector, however, clarified that leave was not canceled for officers and described that staffing was at standard levels. Documents provided to the committees reflect that USCP had 1,214 sworn officers on site at 2 p.m. on January 6, and 1,457 sworn officers on site across the entire 24-hour period. Although USCP conveyed the overall number of officers on site, it could not explain where these officers were located or the breakdown of officers by division. Ms. Pittman acknowledged that she did not know where officers were posted throughout the day, aside from that they were deployed throughout the campus. USCP has no official record listing the exact number of sworn officers that were posted in or around the Capitol building when those positions were attacked. The most detailed response USCP could provide to the committees was that, quote, of those officers in the Uniformed Services Bureau, approximately 195 were assigned to interior or exterior posts at the U.S. Capitol and 276 were assigned to the department's seven CDU platoons, unquote. USCP was only able to account for the location of 417 officers. It could not account for the remaining 797 officers. USCP was also unable to show how many officers were remissioned 
or called in to reinforce other positions throughout the day. As noted above, the division-specific operational planning and briefing documents did not mention the total number of officers and their assigned locations, with one exception. They both referenced the number of CDU personnel activated for January 6. Notably, each contained a different figure. The USB operational posture document listed 242 officers, as well as 29 lieutenants, sergeants, and acting sergeants for a total of 271 CDU personnel. The CDU operational plan, by contrast, listed 233 CDU personnel activated for January 6. The leadership briefing document, circulated on January 5th, referenced 236 CDU officers. In explaining the discrepancies, one USCP official explained to the committees, quote, it's common practice on CDU to not know how many people you have until the day of. So while there may not be a document from before that reflects the number, unquote, USCP documents the number after the fact. B. USCP officers were not trained or equipped to defend against the January 6th attack. Even with the security enhancements USCP implemented for January 6th, the officers on duty were unprepared to defend themselves and the Capitol on January 6th. One security enhancement was to activate, quote, the largest number of CDU platoons possible, unquote, seven platoons, four of which were hard platoons. Four was the maximum number of hard platoons USCP could staff because it included all the officers trained in the tactics and equipment of hard platoons. Only officers in hard platoons received training on how to, quote, handle more aggressive riot type of situations, unquote. According to the USCP Inspector General, quote, the majority of hard platoon CDU officers, however, have not completed the annual refresher training during the past few years, unquote. And recent USCP recruits did not complete the usual required 40 hours of civil disturbance training. Hard platoon officers were provided additional protective gear, including helmets, hardened plastic gear, and shields, among other equipment. According to Mr. Sund, USCP took a number of steps to outfit CDU personnel with additional hard gear and enhanced access to the property management division in the event officers needed replacement uniforms or equipment and vehicle services. Mr. Sund further testified to efforts he made to improve officer access to protective equipment in the year prior, stating, quote, During my time as the chief, I had directed enhancements to the protective equipment being issued to our sworn employees. In 2020, I directed the procurement of riot helmets for all of the sworn members of USCP. Prior to this time, riot helmets were only issued to members assigned to USCP's civil disturbance units. The delivery of the helmets from the manufacturer had been delayed over the past several months due to the effects of COVID-19, but we had been pushing for delivery by the inauguration. As helmets became available, we pushed for their expedited delivery due to the upcoming demonstration, and approximately 104 of the helmets were delivered on Monday, January 4th, unquote. Despite the arrival of approximately 100 new helmets on January 5th, the USCP Inspector General found that CDU was, quote, operating at a decreased level of readiness as a result of a lack of standards for equipment, unquote. USCP officers, for example, were given defective riot shields that had been improperly stored and, as a result, shattered upon impact. 
Not only was certain equipment defective, but USCP did not authorize CDU officers to wear the gear at the beginning of their shift. The CDU operational plan required that protective gear be pre-staged in proximity to the platoon's staging locations, and the CDU field commander would instruct officers to retrieve that gear, quote, depending on the presence of countergroups and the reported interactions between the opposing groups, unquote. In at least one instance, USCP protective shields were locked in a bus during the riot so that a CDU platoon was unable to access them, and as a result, the platoon was required to respond to the crowd without the protection of their riot shields. USCP also did not authorize its CDU forces to use all available less-than-lethal munitions. This included grenade launchers and stingball grenades that USCP officials acknowledge may have enhanced CDU's ability to push back the rioters. The CDU plan only authorized the use of the FN-303 system and pepper balls. When asked why additional, less-than-lethal munitions in USCP's possession were not authorized, Ms. Pittman explained that USCP did not have sufficient personnel trained to deploy those various types of weapons systems. The training and equipment requirements applied to fewer than 300 of the 1,200 officers on duty during the height of the attack. The remaining 900 officers had even less training and equipment to defend themselves and the buildings and individuals they are sworn to protect. Officers in soft platoons, or those not in the CDU, received some basic CDU training when they first joined the force. Consequently, the officers may have gone years since receiving any formal CDU training. In terms of equipment, the officers were outfitted in their regular uniforms. Officers stationed at security posts in Capitol office buildings and around the security perimeter also had, quote, OC spray as well as batons available to them. Whether or not those officers actually had it on, someone would have to physically look at them and see, unquote. C. USCP leaders failed to communicate with frontline officers during the attack. USCP uses an Incident Command System, or ICS, to respond to any occurrence or event that requires a response to protect life or property. The USCP's Incident Command System Directive, which was last updated in October 2018, defines the command system as that for, quote, command, control, and coordination of a response that provides a means to coordinate the efforts of individuals and agencies as they work toward the common goal of stabilizing an incident while protecting life, property, and environment, unquote. One of the primary rationales for using the ICS is to, quote, increase the efficiency of incident management and allow for rapid and seamless integration with stakeholders, military command, and other government partners, unquote. The ICS provides that USCP will implement an incident action plan that includes the overall incident objectives and the strategies to, quote, ensure incident objectives are met, unquote. Incident objectives are based on realistic expectations of what can be accomplished when all allocated resources have been effectively deployed. As noted above, USCP did not prepare a department-wide operational plan prior to January 6th. USCP also did not document incident objectives for the joint session. Mr. Sun testified that he and others established the following priorities for other agencies. One, secure the perimeter and foundation of the Capitol, 
and two, assist USCP in removing unauthorized persons from the Capitol and conduct a top-to-bottom sweep of the building to ensure no unauthorized persons or hazardous devices remained in the building, unquote. While the Incident Command System Directive generally describes the role of the different divisions in the ICS, it does not detail how an ICS is established or how it operates during an incident. It does not detail how incident commanders should communicate priorities, strategies, or tactics to frontline officers. According to Mr. Sund, in advance of January 6th, there were two designated incident commanders. One was to monitor the Capitol grounds, and the other was to monitor the Capitol building, including the joint session. Mr. Sund further explained that these incident commanders were responsible for communicating with frontline officers via one of two radio channels, one for each commander designating incident commanders as those who are to be issuing directions is intended to reduce confusion and provide the most direct information. One of the officers identified to the committees as a designated incident commander was listed in the CDU operational plan. The other officer, however, is not specified in any document provided to the committees as having been formally designated as an incident commander prior to January 6th. According to that officer, the designation would have been made in a department-wide operational plan. According to information provided to the committees, officers received little to no communication from senior officers during the attack, and at no point did USCP leadership take over the radios to communicate with frontline officers? As one officer noted, quote, there was very little direction, if any, provided by ranking members of the USCP throughout the whole day. Mid-level and senior leadership was providing very little, if any, direction. I felt like I was alone, and I felt like I had to make my own decisions. Unquote. Another officer explained, quote, I was horrified that no deputy chief or above was on the radio or helping us. For hours, the screams on the radio were horrific. The sights were unimaginable, and there was a complete loss of control. For hours, no chief or above took command and control. Officers were begging and pleading for help for medical triage, unquote. One officer publicly stated, we heard nothing that day. And another officer reported, we were on our own, totally on our own. Ms. Pittman attributed the lack of communication to the incident commanders being overwhelmed and engaging with rioters rather than issuing orders over the radio. Despite incident commanders being overwhelmed, USCP leadership never took control of the radio to communicate with responding officers. Officers did not recall hearing Mr. Sund on the radio at any point during the attack and only recalled hearing Ms. Pittman once when she ordered a lockdown of the Capitol building at 2 p.m. The Capitol Police Labor Committee explained that Inspector Tom Lloyd issued the lockdown order an hour prior to Ms. Pittman doing so. And, based on information provided to the committees, Ms. Pittman's later statement came without any further direction. Chad Thomas, Assistant Chief of Police for Uniformed Operations, reportedly told officers he tried but was unable to get on the radio to communicate to officers. Neither Mr. Sund nor Ms. Pittman provided an explanation for why USCP leadership did not directly communicate with officers. One officer attributed this failure to a lack of operational experience among USCP leadership and suggested that the promotion process at USCP 
should be re-evaluated. In the absence of communication, officers lacked clarity about whether to respond to calls for all available units. An officer reported hearing a lieutenant repeatedly ask over the radio, quote, does anybody have a plan? Unquote. End of section six. Section seven of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 7, Opaque Capitol Police Board Processes Slowed Requests for National Guard Support. As described above, the U.S. Capitol Police is overseen by the Capitol Police Board, comprised of the House and Senate Sergeants-at-Arms and the Architect of the Capitol. Footnote. The USCP chief serves on the board as an ex officio non-voting member. Returning to the text, the purpose of the board is to, quote, direct, oversee, and support the Capitol Police in its mission, as well as to advance coordination between Congress, the Capitol Police, the sergeants at arms of the House and the Senate, and the architect of the Capitol, unquote. Mr. Stenger told the committees that the Capitol Police Board is intended to be a, quote, clearinghouse of information, unquote, and ensure coordination between the House and Senate rather than an operational entity. The Capitol Police Board, however, has broad authority and control over key operational decisions. Footnote. For example, Mr. Sun testified that he, quote, could not deliver water to USCP officers on a hot day, unquote, without Capitol Police Board approval. Returning to the text, one of those responsibilities is declaring emergencies for the purpose of accepting support services and approving the appointment of special officers. Yet none of the members of the Capitol Police Board appeared fully familiar with the process or requirements relating to emergency declarations or requesting external support. This lack of familiarity with the process delayed requests for National Guard assistance on and before January 6. A. Capitol Police Board members did not understand the statutory and regulatory authorities of the Capitol Police Board. Pursuant to 2 U.S.C. Section 1970, quote, Executive departments and executive agencies may assist the United States Capitol Police in the performance of its duties when requested by the Capitol Police Board, unquote. Footnote. The statute also provides that the Capitol Police Board must consult with congressional leaders in non-emergency situations. Returning to the text, the Capitol Police Board must submit a written request for external assistance. However, during emergencies, the House and Senate Sergeants-at-Arms may authorize the request for their respective chambers. A separate statutory provision, 2 U.S.C. Section 1974, authorizes the U.S. Capitol Police Chief to appoint special officers, quote, in the event of an emergency, as determined by the Capitol Police Board, unquote. Although there is a statutory requirement that any Capitol Police Board request for external assistance be in writing, Capitol Police Board members inform the committees that a board vote on or request for support from external agencies may be done orally and subsequently documented. Thus, the U.S. Capitol Police Chief may not directly request support from executive agencies, including the National Guard. Instead, the U.S. Capitol Police Chief of Police submits a written request to the Capitol Police Board seeking, one, an emergency declaration, and two, approval to request external assistance. Capitol Police Board members disagreed as to whether a vote needs to be unanimous. Mr. Stinger informed the committees that unanimity is required, 
whereas Mr. Blanton indicated that only a majority vote was needed. If two board members agreed, the request would be approved. Footnote. The Capitol Police Board Manual states, quote, unless specifically stated otherwise in this manual, the board will strive for a consensus in all decisions, unquote. It further provides an exception, allowing a majority of the board to take action on matters involving the, quote, safety, welfare, and preservation of the Capitol complex, unquote. Returning to the text, by statute, the Capitol Police Board would need to consult with congressional leadership, except in an emergency. In emergency situations, the USCP chief need only secure the approval of the House or Senate SAAs to be able to request external assistance on their behalf in matters relating their respective chambers. However, the request for assistance must still be obtained from the SAAs in writing. There is no corresponding statutory provision providing the USCP chief with direct and independent authority to request external assistance in emergency situations. None of the Capitol Police Board members on January 6th could fully explain in detail the statutory requirements for requesting National Guard assistance. For example, when asked by Senator Blunt why he felt that he needed the approval of Mr. Stenger and Mr. Irving to request National Guard assistance, Mr. Sund testified, quote, that has always been the case, unquote. Mr. Stenger told the committees that he did not know if Capitol Police Board approval was required before requesting external assistance. Quote, but that's what we thought, and we were more than happy to go along with that, unquote. Members of the Capitol Police Board also indicated that there was no formal process for such requests. Mr. Stenger indicated that typically the USCP chief would send a written request to the Capitol Police Board, but, quote, in some cases, the chief may approach, unquote, a board member individually, quote, to get a feel for what support may or may not, unquote, exist. Mr. Sund acknowledged that he typically went directly to the House and Senate SAAs, rather than submitting a formal request to the entire board. When discussing the approval process, the Capitol Police Board members did not distinguish between emergency or non-emergency situations. The architect of the Capitol also expressed concern about transparency and accountability of the Capitol Police Board. Specifically, he informed the committees that the board, quote, overclassifies things that do not need to be classified. Even looking at old security assessments, they were classified at such a high level, unquote. According to Mr. Blanton, the board does not circulate an unclassified summary of the relevant information, as occurs in executive branch agencies. This overclassification can hinder conversations about proposed requests and oversight of the Capitol Police Board's decision-making. Quote, the transparency aspect is even more troubling because when everything is classified, you can't enter into a logical discussion with leadership and oversight about the proposals. It reduces the ability of people in my office and in oversight of the Capitol Police Board to review relevant information. Not everybody is read into particular programs. Not everybody has top-secret clearance, unquote. All members of the Capitol Police Board, as constituted on January 6th, later agreed that reforms were necessary to clarify, streamline, and make the approval process more nimble. As Mr. Stenger testified, quote, there are a lot of statutes out there on the Capitol Police Board that go back many, many years. Things have changed, unquote. B. USCP did not submit a formal request for National Guard assistance to the Capitol Police Board prior to January 6th. Prior to January 6th, Mr. Sun failed to submit a formal request for National Guard support 
to all members of the Capitol Police Board and thus never sought nor received authority from the board to make any such request. His interactions were limited to informal conversations with Mr. Irving and Mr. Stenger. In fact, no one ever discussed the possibility of National Guard support with the board's third voting member, the architect of the Capitol, Brent Blanton. Mr. Sun testified that he asked the two SAAs to declare an emergency and authorize National Guard assistance on Monday, January 4th, but that this request was denied. Mr. Sun testified to the committees that on January 4th, around 11 a.m., he met in person with Mr. Irving to request that the Capitol Police Board make an emergency declaration and authorize the assistance of the National Guard. Mr. Sun testified that Mr. Irving, quote, was concerned with the optics of having National Guard present, unquote, did not believe the intelligence warranted assistance from the National Guard, and therefore did not support the request. Mr. Sund further testified that Mr. Irving referred him to Mr. Stenger to discuss the request. According to Mr. Sund, Mr. Stenger did not approve the request and instead suggested that Mr. Sund, quote, lean forward, unquote, and contact the National Guard to determine how quickly and what kind of assistance could be provided if needed. Acting on Mr. Stenger's advice, Mr. Sun testified that he called General Walker, the commander of the D.C. National Guard, around 6.45 p.m. on January 4th, explaining that he did not have the authority to request assistance and asked how quickly D.C. National Guard could respond to a request. According to Mr. Sund, General Walker informed Mr. Sund that he had 125 National Guard troops supporting COVID response in Washington, D.C. that could be repurposed if necessary. Mr. Sund testified that he met in person with Mr. Stenger on January 5th around noon and reported the conversation with General Walker. Mr. Sund also testified that later in the day he told Mr. Irving about the conversation with General Walker. Mr. Sund did not contact Mr. Blanton, the third voting member of the Capitol Police Board, regarding the request. General Walker corroborated the majority of Mr. Sund's account. However, General Walker testified that he spoke with Mr. Sund on January 3rd and asked Mr. Sund whether he would be requesting assistance from D.C. National Guard. According to General Walker, Mr. Sund told him he was not allowed to request support, but asked, quote, if I do call you, will you be able to support me, unquote? General Walker testified that he responded, quote, yes, but I have to get approval from the Secretary of the Army and ultimately the Secretary of Defense because it is a federal request, unquote. Mr. Irving and Mr. Stenger disputed Mr. Sun's testimony about his request for emergency authorization for D.C. National Guard assistance. Neither Mr. Irving nor Mr. Stenger perceived the conversations with Mr. Sund as a formal request to the board. Mr. Irving testified that on January 4th, he spoke by phone with Mr. Sund on a call that later included Mr. Stenger, about an offer from the National Guard to provide 125 unarmed troops for traffic duty near the Capitol. Mr. Irving testified that he, Mr. Sund, and Mr. Stenger collectively agreed the available intelligence did not warrant having troops at the Capitol. Mr. Irving further testified that the decision was not based on the optics of National Guard troops at the Capitol, contrary to Mr. Sun's testimony. Mr. Blanton confirmed to the committees that Mr. Sun never sought Capitol Police Board approval to request National Guard presence in the days before January 6. Notably, according to the Department of Defense timeline, 
DOD officials confirmed with U.S. Capitol Police on January 3rd and January 4th that USCP was not requesting National Guard support. C. The USCP chief of police lacked authority to unilaterally request National Guard support, even in the midst of the attack. As described above, before National Guard assistance can be requested, the Capitol Police Board must issue an emergency declaration and approve a request for National Guard assistance. Footnote. By contrast, the committees were informed that USCP has mutual aid agreements with law enforcement agencies. The USCP chief does not need the Capitol Police Board's approval to activate those agreements. Returning to the text, the statute governing assistance from executive departments and agencies provides that the House and Senate SAAs may request assistance from executive departments and executive agencies for their respective chambers in an emergency. Therefore, as the attack unfolded, Mr. Sund needed Mr. Stenger's and Mr. Irving's approval before he could formally request DCNG assistance. After discussing the need for National Guard support on January 4th and relaying the subsequent conversation with General Walker on January 5th, the topic was not revisited by the Capitol Police Board until the afternoon of January 6th. By 12.50 p.m., Mr. Sund understood that, quote, the situation was deteriorating rapidly, unquote, and that outside law enforcement and National Guard assistance was necessary. Mr. Sund testified that he first contacted MPD, followed closely by the U.S. Secret Service Uniformed Division. Mr. Sun testified to the committees that he notified the two sergeants at arms by 1.09 p.m. that he urgently needed support and asked them to declare a state of emergency and authorize the National Guard. Mr. Sun later corrected his testimony, informing the committees that his initial call to Mr. Irving requesting an emergency declaration and National Guard assistance occurred at 12.58 p.m. Mr. Sun testified that Mr. Irving stated he needed to, quote, run it up the chain of command, unquote, that Mr. Sun followed up about the status of the request on multiple occasions, and that Mr. Irving stated he was waiting to hear back from congressional leadership. Mr. Irving disputed Mr. Sun's description of events particularly that Mr. Sund first requested DCNG assistance at 1.09 p.m. Mr. Irving testified that he had, quote, no memory of a call at 1.09 p.m. And, based on a review of his phone records, there was no call from Mr. Sund or any other person at that time, unquote. According to Mr. Irving, the first call he received after 1 p.m. from Mr. Sund was at 1.28 p.m., during which Mr. Sun described the conditions outside the Capitol as deteriorating and indicated that he might make a request for the National Guard in the future. Mr. Irving testified that Mr. Sun did not formally request an emergency declaration or National Guard authorization until after 2 p.m., a request that was immediately approved. Mr. Stenger informed the committees that he met with Mr. Irving sometime between 1.30 p.m. and 2 p.m., and that Mr. Irving was waiting for approval from House leadership to move forward with the request. Mr. Sund informed the committees that Mr. Irving approved the request at 2.07 p.m. Mr. Sund conveyed the approval to Mr. Stenger and, and upon his agreement, USCP memorialized that the Capitol Police Board's official approval was given at 2.10 p.m. Phone records provided to the committees show a number of calls between Mr. Sund and Mr. Irving or Mr. Stenger between 12 p.m. and 2.10 p.m. on January 6th. 
What follows is a timeline of calls. At 12.45 p.m., Sund calls Irving. At 12.46 p.m., Sund calls Stinger. At 12.58 p.m., Sund calls Irving. At 1.05 p.m., Stinger calls Sund. At 1.21 p.m., Stinger calls Sund. At 1.28 p.m., Sund calls Irving. At 1.34 p.m., Sund calls Irving. At 1.39 p.m., Stenger calls Sund. At 1.45 p.m., Sund calls Irving. At 2.01 p.m., Sund calls Irving. At 2.07 p.m., Sund calls Irving. At 2.08 p.m., Sund calls Stenger. At 2.13 p.m., Stenger calls Sund. The phone records reveal only the timing, originator, and recipient of the call. They cannot corroborate the various accounts of Mr. Stenger, Mr. Irving, or Mr. Sund. Text messages provide more insight. A review of Mr. Sund's text messages on January 6th reveal no messages to or mentions of Mr. Irving. There is a single message to Mr. Stenger. At 12.48 p.m., two minutes after Mr. Sund called Mr. Stenger, Mr. Sund texted Mr. Stenger, quote, FYI, we're running a concerning suspicious package over by the Republican Club by the South Capitol Street Metro, unquote. The only other mention of Mr. Stenger occurred at 1.07 p.m., nine minutes after Mr. Sund claims he requested an emergency declaration. At that time, Mr. Sund texted Jennifer Hemingway, then the deputy Senate sergeant-at-arms, quote, just briefed Stenger, we had a breach of the fence line on the West Front by several thousand protesters, unquote. There is no mention of the National Guard. Regardless of when the request was made, Mr. Sund acknowledged that he made the request orally to Mr. Irving and Mr. Stenger. He did not submit a formal request to the Capitol Police Board. This need to await Capitol Police Board approval during an emergency hindered Mr. Sund's ability to quickly request the assistance of the D.C. National Guard. Even when under attack, the USCP chief still needed an emergency declaration from the Capitol Police Board before requesting National Guard assistance. Footnote. As discussed more below, once a request for National Guard assistance is made, that request must go through the Department of Defense's vetting and approval processes. Those processes and how they relate to the January 6th attack are discussed infra in Part 8. End of section 7. Section 8 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 8, Department of Defense and District of Columbia National Guard Assistance on January 6th. On January 6th, D.C. National Guard had 154 personnel on duty at 37 locations in the National Capital Region, including 40 personnel comprising the Quick Reaction Force, or QRF, stationed at Joint Base Andrews to assist MPD with crowd control. EOD's decision to provide D.C. National Guard support to the D.C. government was influenced by lessons learned following D.C. National Guard deployment during the summer of 2020 to civil disturbances related to the murder of George Floyd. As a result, the Acting Secretary of Defense imposed a series of control measures on D.C.N.G. deployment, including that the Secretary of Defense approve the issuance of weapons, batons, and protective equipment, and that the QRF be used as a last resort. The Secretary of the Army imposed an additional control measure that he approve a concept of operations before the use of the QRF. Although U.S. Capitol Police did not seek D.C. National Guard assistance in advance of January 6th, as the attack unfolded, 
both U.S. Capitol Police and MPD pleaded for D.C. National Guard assistance. DOD officials claimed they did not receive a workable request until approximately 2.30 p.m. D.C. National Guard personnel did not arrive at the Capitol until approximately 5.20 p.m., nearly three hours later. DOD officials stressed that during this period, DOD officials and D.C. National Guard were preparing their personnel, assessing the situation, determining how best to provide assistance, instructing personnel, and ensuring personnel were properly equipped. The two key DOD decision-makers on January 6, Christopher Miller, Acting Secretary of Defense, and Ryan McCarthy, Secretary of the Army, told the committees that this planning was vital to DCNG's success in carrying out its mission. Chief of Staff of the Army, General James McConville, echoed this sentiment. The commanding general of D.C. National Guard, however, stated that DCNG was ready to assist USCP and criticized DOD's delay in authorizing D.C. National Guard deployment. The below section describes actions taken by DOD and D.C. National Guard in advance of and on January 6. It provides background on D.C. National Guard, discusses DOD's assessment of the D.C. Mayor's request for assistance, analyzes the control measures imposed on DCNG deployment in the days leading up to January 6, and discusses the actions DOD and DC National Guard officials took during the attack. A. Background. DCNG is composed of more than 2,700 soldiers and airmen and provides mission-capable personnel in times of war or national emergency. Whereas state and other territorial National Guards report to the state or territorial executive official, D.C.'s unique position as a federal district makes D.C.N.G. the only National Guard unit that reports solely to the president. The president, however, has delegated the authority to activate D.C. National Guard to the Secretary of Defense, who has further delegated some authority to the Secretary of the Army. These delegations of authority were in place on January 6 and were relied upon by DOD officials. Upon a request by the D.C. Mayor, D.C. National Guard can support the D.C. government after obtaining approval from the Secretary of the Army, who must seek approval from the Secretary of Defense. When requested by the D.C. Mayor, D.C.N.G. can provide assistance on any land belonging to the City of Washington, D.C., which excludes federal territory such as the Capitol Complex and the National Mall. D.C.N.G. may also support federal agencies. However, it must first receive a request for assistance, or RFA, from a proper civilian authority. For the Capitol Complex, such a requesting party could include the Capitol Police Board or the USCP Chief. After a civilian authority submits an RFA to DCNG, the request is sent to the Secretary of the Army. The RFA is evaluated according to six criteria. One, legality, compliance with the laws. Two, lethality the potential use of deadly force by or against DOD forces. Three, risk, the safety of DOD forces. Four, cost, including the source of funding and the effect on the DOD budget. Five, appropriateness, whether the requested support is in the interest of the DOD. And six, readiness, impact on DOD's ability to perform its other primary missions. After initial analysis, the Secretary of the Army consults with the Office of the Secretary of Defense, including the Office of the General Counsel. The Secretary of the Army also consults with the Deputy Attorney General, or DAG, and thereafter approves the request if appropriate. Upon approval, DCNG Commanding General 
informs the requesting civilian authority. The process is similar if the RFA requires Secretary of Defense approval. The Secretary of the Army will brief the Secretary of Defense on the plan of action. The Secretary of Defense, in turn, typically confers with the DOD General Counsel, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Chief of the National Guard Bureau. The Secretary of Defense then decides whether to authorize the use of D.C. National Guard. The DCNG Commanding General informs the requesting civilian authority of the approval. According to officials, as was the case on January 6, DOD only serves to support the requesting authority. B. DOD's posture following the events of summer 2020. In the summer of 2020, DCNG was activated to support local and federal law enforcement officers in responding to civil disturbances related to the murder of George Floyd. On May 31, 2020, President Trump, then Secretary of Defense Mark Esper, and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General Mark Milley conducted a conference call with all 50 governors to try to get additional Guard support to come to the Capitol, resulting in the National Guard's full mobilization of over 5,000 National Guard personnel. As part of its response, D.C. National Guard employed certain tactics that drew considerable scrutiny, including flying medical evacuation helicopters near crowds of protesters. Mr. McCarthy noted that the concern about the perception of troops on American streets was discussed during the summer of 2020 by all key decision makers, including the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the Army Chief of Staff, the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and the General Counsels. General McConville also told the committees that these concerns were discussed within DOD leadership and reiterated that the military should only be used as a last resort in domestic law enforcement operations. When General Walker was asked whether the issue of optics of a uniformed presence was, quote, ever brought up by Army leadership when the D.C. National Guard was deployed during the summer of 2020, unquote, he responded, quote, it was never discussed in June. It was never discussed July 4th when we were supporting the city. It was never discussed August 28th when we supported the city, unquote. The U.S. Army, or Army, acknowledged that, quote, the preparations for the events of January 6th were informed by the considerable scrutiny received after the federal response to protests in summer 2020, unquote. Accordingly, after the June 2020 events, Mr. Esper and Mr. McCarthy, quote, determined that any future requests from civil authorities for DCNG support during planned protests required thorough scrutiny by both of them to ensure that the use of the National Guard was necessary and that, if so, the mission was narrowly tailored and appropriate for military forces, unquote. Mr. Miller, who was appointed as Acting Secretary of Defense in November 2020, told the committees that there was an undercurrent of conversation about the lessons learned from the summer, such as don't fly helicopters over crowds for crowd control. Mr. Miller elaborated, quote, The events of the summer reiterated things that we already know, which is the United States Armed Forces should only be used as a last resort in domestic law enforcement after all other capabilities have been expended. And the use of force and the use of the military in domestic law enforcement needs to be extremely thoughtful and carefully planned and done with deliberation. Because at the end of the day, the armed forces of the United States, as you all know, is it's very important when we use armed forces in a domestic situation, unquote. Similarly, Mr. McCarthy, who was the Secretary of the Army during the summer protests and on January 6th, 
told the committees that DOD's leadership was aware of the, quote, history of military involvement on American streets, and that if we were going to put troops on American streets, we wanted to be very clear about what we were doing. We're very conscious of that any time we put troops on American streets because of the history and ultimately the perception that forms, unquote. Other events also informed DOD's posture in the days leading up to January 6th. For example, during the summer 2020 protests, guardsmen were not required to clearly identify themselves during the summer protests, which was addressed in the fiscal year 2021 National Defense Authorization Act that included a provision requiring guardsmen to clearly identify themselves when deployed domestically. Further, on January 3rd, 10 former secretaries of defense released a public letter warning DOD about using the military to resolve election disputes. Mr. McCarthy explained that, quote, the hyperbole about martial law, and the 10 Secretaries of Defense letter were discussed in the entire Pentagon, unquote. When asked whether the public criticism about DOD's role during the summer 2020 civil disturbances or the other events led to any reluctance by leadership to participate in or assist on January 6th, Mr. McCarthy responded, no, just a lot of questions, a lot of rigor. We never said no. It was just we wanted to put the conditions in place to be successful. And we learned a lot from last summer about things that would go well and things that didn't. Adding that it was very important that we got deployment of D.C. National Guard right, unquote. Further, in explaining the differences between DOD's response during the summer compared to January 6th, Mr. McCarthy stressed that the two events had different timelines. The civil disturbances during the summer occurred over a series of days, whereas the events of January 6th cooked off in minutes. Mr. McCarthy viewed this difference in time as one that impacted DOD's ability to prepare and marshal the capability to support law enforcement on January 6th. C. Events leading up to January 6th. 1. D.C. government's request for assistance. On December 31, 2020, Mayor Bowser and the D.C. Homeland Security and Emergency Management Agency, or HSEMA, submitted a formal request for D.C.N.G. assistance on January 5 and January 6, 2021 to support the Metropolitan Police Department and other D.C. entities. The HSEMA letter, directed to General William Walker, stated that the mission for D.C.N.G. would, quote, primarily be crowd management and assistance with blocking vehicles at traffic posts, and requested, one, six crowd management teams to manage crowds at specified metro stations and prevent overcrowding on metro platforms, and two, a team to assist at 30 designated traffic posts, unquote. Both letters requested that DCNG be unarmed during the mission. On January 1, General Walker sent a letter to Secretary McCarthy recommending approval of the D.C. government's request. In the letter, General Walker stated that he had analyzed the request for support and determined the support constituted valid training and operational practices. Mr. McCarthy told the committees that, upon receiving General Walker's letter, Army leadership spent the next few days deliberating about how to support the request and conducting a mission analysis in consultation with DCNG and MPD to identify the task organization and logistics. Mr. McCarthy believed certain conditions needed to be satisfied before he could approve the request, including the designation of a lead federal agency to support the operation and a concept of operations. Mr. McCarthy memorialized his concerns in an undated and unsigned letter. 
Mr. McCarthy explained a lead federal agency was necessary to deal with the tension that arises between the mayor and the federal side, particularly noting the challenges of coordinating the Park Police, Capitol Police, MPD, and FBI, which necessitated an, quote, architecture for the command and control, unquote. On Saturday, January 2, 2021, Mr. McCarthy, Mr. Miller, and General Milley conferred about the D.C. government's request for assistance. Mr. Miller told the committees that the conversation focused on understanding the roles of the local and federal law enforcement and discussing the concern about using the armed forces for domestic law enforcement. During the January 2nd meeting, all agreed that the mission analysis needed to be finalized and would be presented for final decision on January 4th. Two, USCP confirmed it was not requesting DCNG assistance. Mr. Sund and General Walker discussed the potential need for D.C. National Guard assistance as early as January 3rd. General Walker told the committees that he asked Mr. Sund if USCP planned to request D.C. National Guard assistance and explained that such a request had to be in writing because the Secretary of Defense had to approve it. Mr. Sund informed General Walker that he was not authorized to request DCNG support, but asked informally, If I do call you, will you be able to support me? General Walker responded in the affirmative, but reminded Mr. Sund that he would still have to seek approval from the Secretary of the Army and the Secretary of Defense because it was a federal request. On January 3rd, an employee within DOD's Office of Homeland Defense and Global Security confirmed with USCP that it was not requesting support from DOD. DOD again sought and received confirmation on January 4th that USCP was not seeking DOD assistance. According to Mr. McCarthy, because DOD received a request from Mayor Bowser's office, it wanted to confirm whether other law enforcement entities would also need assistance. As he explained, quote, that's why people called and asked. They were trying to, when I get back to the concept of operations and the command and control, all of the really meaty military tactical stuff, if you don't understand the concept of how the day is going to go, what your mission is going to be, who are you supporting, we are a supporting function. That's why they made all the calls and made sure everybody has the support they need. So that was critically important to codify, unquote. General McConville summarized the events leading up to January 6th, quote, The Capitol Police had no plan for military to be involved around the Capitol. The only agency that had a request for military was the Metro Police. No one else did, unquote. Acting Chief Pittman testified that she was unaware of both calls from DOD, but that she would have stated that U.S. Capitol Police needed the assistance of the National Guard, as she had previously told Mr. Sund. 3. Coordination with Cabinet and White House Officials Around 1 p.m. on January 3rd, Mr. Miller hosted a Cabinet-level synchronization and coordination call. Mr. Miller told the committees that he initiated the call for two reasons. One was to share information so we could coordinate and synchronize. And number two, I wanted to make sure that they knew that any request for Department of Defense support, that it was legit, I was happy to provide. Generally, Mr. Miller wanted to make sure everybody was talking and that we weren't going to get surprised. Mr. Miller stated that during this meeting, DOJ was reminded that it typically serves as the lead federal agency for domestic law enforcement activities. Later that afternoon, Mr. Miller and General Milley met with President Trump, who concurred in the activation of D.C. National Guard to support law enforcement. According to Mr. Miller, the meeting with the president was scheduled to discuss a separate issue, unrelated to the January 6th Joint Session of Congress. 
At the end of the meeting, President Trump brought up the joint session, asking Mr. Miller whether they were prepared. Mr. Miller told the committees that the conversation with President Trump about January 6th was a 15-second, 30-second conversation. It was an in-passing, kind of what else is going on type of thing. When asked whether President Trump had a role in the approval process for the mayor's request, Mr. Miller told the committees no, because President Trump had delegated that authority and authorization to me. So there was no requirement for Mr. Miller to get the president's approval. Mr. McCarthy, who did not attend the meeting with the president, suggested to the committees that the president delegated authorization authority to Mr. Miller during the meeting, adding that, quote, it's the president's ultimate authority to put guardsmen in D.C. So yes, normally you inform the president, at least some communication, a courtesy, to either the president directly or to the chief of staff to let him know. And if the president wants to discuss, obviously it is in his discretion, unquote. On January 4, Mr. Miller convened a second conference call with cabinet members. Mr. Miller told the committees that in the time leading up to January 6, he recognized that, quote, the tone and rhetoric of the more aggressive demonstrators, Boogaloo Boys, Proud Boys, had changed in the last couple months, and that while he didn't have any indicators of an assault on the Capitol, unquote, he recognized, quote, that 6 January was the critical day in many of these conspiratorial-minded folks' narrative, and that it could be a pretty dramatic day, unquote. According to Mr. Miller, these concerns were raised internally in DOD and in interagency calls. On the January 4th call, according to Mr. Miller, he and General Milley voiced concern about the permits that had been issued, questioning whether there was a mechanism to revoke permits for the 1,000 to 2,000 people who had been granted permission to gather on Capitol grounds. The Department of the Interior and D.C. officials assured DOD leadership that the protests were constitutionally protected activities. During the call, according to Mr. Miller, he and General Milley also suggested locking down D.C. to avoid potential violence. However, the idea was not pursued. Mr. Miller described that the consensus from law enforcement was that, given the current threat picture, they believed they had all resources and capability they needed to control the demonstration. Mr. Miller testified that he felt comfortable about the mission planning and believed they were all operating off a common operating picture. Four, designation of a lead federal agency. All DOD officials interviewed stressed the importance of the designation of a lead federal agency to support operations on January 6. The lead federal agency is, quote, the nexus and locus for all information flow, unquote, and ensures that everything is coordinated and synchronized across federal agencies and departments. Mr. Miller noted that DOD, quote, should never, ever be the lead federal agency for domestic law enforcement, unquote, except for the establishment of martial law. Indeed, Mr. McCarthy required an agency to be designated before supporting the mayor's request for National Guard assistance. According to Mr. McCarthy, on January 4th, the White House designated DOJ as the lead federal agency for January 6th. Quote, Sunday evening, after Acting Secretary Miller and General Milley met with the president, they got the lead federal agency established. All of the pieces started coming together, unquote. Mr. Miller also recalled that DOJ was designated as the lead federal agency at some point prior to January 6, but he did not know what role the White House played in the decision. Although DOD understood that DOJ was designated as the lead federal agency, there appears to have been no clearly established point of contact within the department, according to Mr. McCarthy, which he found 
concerning. Prior to January 6th, Mr. McCarthy sent a letter to Acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen outlining the Army's operational plan in support of the mayor's request and reached out informally to David Bowditch, FBI Deputy Director, because the two had worked together previously. But Mr. McCarthy claimed, even during the attack, he was never provided an official point of contact at DOJ and had no contact with DOJ or FBI officials until approximately 4 p.m. General McConville also stated that DOJ was designated as the lead federal agency. However, he noted that DOJ did not conduct any interagency rehearsals or have an integrated security plan, as DOJ did during the summer 2020 protests when it had also been designated as the lead federal agency. General McConville stressed the importance of integrated security plans and acknowledged that had there been one on January 6, DOD's response time would have been quicker. In contrast, Mr. Miller stated Richard Donahue, Acting Deputy Assistant Attorney General, served as DOJ's operational lead on January 6. Notably, however, Mr. Miller acknowledged that during the attack, he convened calls with cabinet members to share information and ensure everyone was on the same page. When asked why he convened the calls as opposed to the lead federal agency, Mr. Miller responded, somebody needed to do it. Mr. Miller was not familiar with any actions DOJ took to coordinate the federal response on January 6. On May 12, 2021, Jeffrey Rosen, the acting attorney general on January 6, testified at a House oversight hearing that it was not accurate that DOJ was the lead federal agency for security preparations on January 6. He stated that DOJ's responsibilities were specific to intelligence coordinating and information sharing. DOJ has not acknowledged that it was designated the lead federal agency for January 6 and has yet to fully comply with the committee's requests for information. 5. Approval of DC's request and control measures for DCNG deployment. On January 4th, Mr. McCarthy recommended that Mr. Miller approve the DC government's request for DCNG assistance. To formalize the recommendation, Mr. McCarthy sent a letter to Mr. Miller recommending the following assignments. Traffic control points, 90 personnel, 180 total, two shifts. Metro Station Support, 24 personnel, 48 total, two shifts. Weapons of Mass Destruction Civil Support Team, 20 personnel, and Internal Command and Control, 52 personnel. The recommendation also included the support of the Quick Reaction Force of 40 personnel staged at Joint Base Andrews. Mr. Miller, in consultation with Mr. McCarthy, the DOD General Counsel, and General Milley, approved the plan to deploy D.C. National Guard to assist the D.C. government. Control measures, however, were imposed over the deployment of D.C.N.G. In a memo dated January 4th, the January 4th memo, Mr. Miller outlined the following, quote, Without my subsequent personal authorization, the D.C. National Guard is not authorized the following. To be issued weapons, ammunition, bayonets, batons, or ballistic protection equipment, such as helmets and body armor. To interact physically with protesters, except when necessary in self-defense or defense of others, consistent with the D.C. National Guard rules for the use of force. To employ any riot control agents to share equipment with law enforcement agencies, to use intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or ISR, assets, or to conduct ISR, or incident awareness and assessment activities, 
to employ helicopters or any other air assets, to conduct searches, seizures, arrests, or other similar direct law enforcement activity, to seek support from any non-D.C. National Guard, National Guard units. Mr. Miller explained to the committees the reasoning behind each control measure. For example, the purpose of the measure regarding the issuance of protection equipment was twofold. One was to make sure we presented an image of support as opposed to aggressiveness. And number two was that at that particular point, we did not want to provide an opportunity for some of these people to take advantage of the situation. Mr. McCarthy explained the purpose of the restriction as being, quote, able to control the escalation of capability and the employment of that capability with civilians, unquote. Mr. McCarthy further explained that DOD, quote, wants to do everything it can to calm the crowd. When you come out there with body armor and shields and weapons, it sends a message very quickly. If you're going to take those measures, it obviously has to be done in the most extreme cases. So they just wanted to be very conscious of the decision-making in the lead-up to those types of events, unquote. Mr. Miller described the second listed control measure on physical interaction with protesters as a, quote, classic statement of intent, unquote, that the mission is to support domestic law enforcement in a non-aggressive, non-kinetic way. Mr. Miller explained that the third measure about riot control agents was to make sure that the commanders on the ground knew it was not going to be an aggressive mission. Mr. McCarthy told the committees that Mr. Esper and General Milley had issued guidance following the summer 2020 events, incorporating lessons learned from those events. Mr. McCarthy noted that the riot gear control measure was a carbon copy of this previously issued guidance. Mr. McCarthy acknowledged that none of the control measures in the January 4 memo was in effect during the summer protests. Notably, Mr. Miller stated that there was no discussion of any prior guidance issued by Mr. Esper. When asked for a copy of this guidance, the Department of Defense indicated no such document existed. The January 4 memo also provided guidance on the use of the QRF. Quote, you may employ the DCNG Quick Reaction Force, or QRF, only as a last resort and in response to a request from an appropriate civil authority. If the QRF is so employed, DCNG personnel will be clearly marked and or distinguished from civilian law enforcement personnel and you will notify me immediately upon your authorization, unquote. When asked why the language regarding a last resort was included, Mr. Miller responded that it was, quote, standard military doctrine and procedures for utilizing quick reaction forces and capabilities in military operations, unquote. On January 5th, upon receiving Mr. Miller's approval, Mr. McCarthy conveyed the approval to General Walker, outlining General Walker's authorities and control measures for DCNG in a letter. In addition to the control measures outlined in the January 4th memo, Mr. McCarthy added an additional requirement, that a concept of operations be submitted prior to the deployment of the QRF. Mr. McCarthy testified that the restriction was needed to know, quote, how we're going to employ the capability and ultimately support them and command and control them, unquote. Mr. McCarthy also testified that the restriction on the movement of troops was critical if General Walker was re-missioning the troops. Mr. McCarthy explained that this control measure was also in place during the summer of 2020. Further, Mr. McCarthy emphasized that if troops were creeping towards the Capitol, Mr. McCarthy wanted to communicate that to Congress because of the impressions that would be made. Mr. Miller never reviewed Mr. McCarthy's January 5th letter and was unaware that Mr. McCarthy added these additional measures. 
but noted that he deferred to operational leaders to impose any control measures deemed necessary. When asked about the January 6th control measures in comparison to the summer protests, Mr. McCarthy stated he did not remember if General Walker had deployed the QRF prior to January 6, and explained that during the summer, he and General Walker were co-located together, implying that there was no need for a concept of operations. When asked about the measure regarding the movement of guardsmen from one corner to another, Mr. McCarthy gave a similar response, stating, well, the summer, I was sitting side by side with him. It was very different, unquote. In his testimony to the committees on March 3rd, General Walker described the control measures differently from Mr. McCarthy and Mr. Miller, stating, quote, The Secretary of the Army's January 5th letter withheld authority for me to employ the quick reaction force. In addition, the Secretary of the Army's memorandum to me required that a concept of operation, or CONOP, be submitted to him before any employment of the QRF. I found that requirement to be unusual, as was the requirement to seek approval to move guardsmen supporting MPD to move from one traffic control point to another, unquote. As General Walker further described, quote, by definition, a QRF is an in extremis force, a break glass in case of need element, postured to respond to an immediate and urgent need by friendly forces. Such requirement that a CONOP be staffed to higher headquarters during an emergency situation would inevitably delay implementation of the QRF, unquote. Mr. McCarthy, by contrast, told the committees he did not find the requirement to be unusual stressing that we gave Walker everything he requested. End of Section 8. Section 9 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 8, Part 2. Department of Defense and District of Columbia National Guard Assistance on January 6th. Part D. As the attack unfolded, DOD's mission planning efforts resulted in the D.C. National Guard not arriving until after both chambers had already been secured. On the morning of January 6th, DCNG had 154 personnel on duty at 37 locations in the National Capital Region, including 40 personnel comprising the QRF, stationed at Joint Base Andrews. DOD officials have stressed that on the morning of January 6th, DCNG was prepared to provide the limited support requested by HSEMA and nothing more. As Mr. Miller described, as of the morning of January 6th, quote, everyone had what they needed and had no additional requests and it was very clear that domestic law enforcement felt they had all the resources and capability they needed to control the demonstration. Yet as the Capitol attack unfolded, USCP and MPD pleaded for D.C. National Guard assistance. DOD officials spent the afternoon assessing the situation, determining how best to provide assistance, instructing personnel on the mission and ensuring personnel were properly equipped. D.C. National Guard personnel ultimately did not arrive at the Capitol until approximately 5.20 p.m., nearly three hours after DOD officials acknowledged receipt of a workable request for DCNG assistance. By that time, both the House and Senate chambers had already been declared secure. 1. Initial requests for assistance were muddled. DOD officials were monitoring the events and receiving updates on the crowds at the Capitol throughout the morning of January 6. That afternoon, Mayor Bowser first called Mr. McCarthy at approximately 1.34 p.m. The call, however, was not a direct request for DCNG assistance. 
Rather, according to Mr. McCarthy, Mayor Bowser said, quote, Are you getting requests or anything from the Capitol? It appears the crowd's getting out of hand, and there were no specifics. We didn't know if anything was breached or any of that, but it was just more of a, are you getting requests? Unquote. Mr. Sund called General Walker at 1.49 p.m. Mr. McCarthy and the Department of the Army recognized this as the first request on January 6th for DCNG assistance. According to General Walker, he immediately conveyed the request to Army officials. Quote, it was right after we got off the phone with General Walker that it was literally, we found out on TV that the Capitol had been breached, unquote. Mr. McCarthy described the time around the initial request as one of tremendous confusion. Mr. McCarthy and Army officials were trying to acquire additional information from D.C. officials and D.C.N.G., regarding what assistance was needed and what the situation was at the Capitol. Two, Army staff reportedly advised against approving D.C.'s request. According to Army records, Mr. McCarthy made several attempts to elicit additional information from D.C.N.G. Around 2.20 p.m., Mr. McCarthy asked D.C.N.G. to, quote, establish a conference call between USCP MPD and DCNG to help DOD better understand the situation on the Capitol grounds, unquote. Shortly into that call, Mr. McCarthy claims he came to appreciate the gravity of the situation and knew mentally whatever we could bring in the next minutes or hours, we had to go get the authority to go. He added DOD knew there was an extraordinary event happening at the Capitol, and DOD needed to respond. Although the call with D.C. and USCP officials continued, Mr. McCarthy left to seek the Acting Secretary of Defense's approval to activate the D.C. National Guard. Before leaving to speak with the Acting Secretary of Defense, Mr. McCarthy told members of his staff, led by Lieutenant General Walter Piott, Director of the Army Staff, and Lieutenant General Charles Flynn, Director of Army Operations and Plans, to take the call and figure this out. Mr. McCarthy explained to the committees that he expected the parties to address simple things. How big is the crowd? Are they in the buildings? Where are they? What did they need from DCNG? How does DCNG configure themselves? What kind of equipment does DC National Guard need? Mr. Sund and Acting MPD Chief Conti testified to the committees that during the conversation, Army officials expressed reluctance and hesitation to send D.C. National Guard to the Capitol. According to Acting MPD Chief Conti, Army officials cited the importance of planning and public perception. The response was more asking about the plan. You know, what was the plan for the National Guard? The response was more focused on, in addition to the plan, the optics. You know, how does this look with boots on the ground at the Capitol? Acting MPD Chief Conti testified that Army officials stated that they, quote, did not like the optics of boots on the ground at the Capitol, unquote. Mr. Sund characterized General Piat as saying, I don't like the visual of the National Guard standing a line with the Capitol in the background. I would much rather relieve USCP officers from other posts so they can handle the protesters, and that his recommendation would be not to support the request. General Walker also testified that General Flynn and General Piat expressed concern about the optics during the call, adding that General Flynn and General Piat Quote, both said it would not be in their best military advice to advise the Secretary of the Army to have uniformed Guards members at the Capitol during the election confirmation. The Army has denied its officials mentioned optics. According to Army records, after Mr. Sund requested immediate assistance, General Piat, quote, 
calmly stated that the Army needed help understanding the situation and needed to clarify what specific tasks the U.S. Capitol Police wanted D.C. National Guard to perform, unquote. The Army acknowledged that General Piat, quote, expressed concern about Army soldiers clearing the Capitol building, recommending that the National Guard assist with crowd control while law enforcement cleared the Capitol building, unquote. According to Army records, and as described more below, the mayor and acting MPD Chief Conti interpreted this as a denial of support. General Piat explained multiple times that DOD was not denying the request, but that a basic plan needed to be developed before rushing into an unclear and dynamic situation. Army records do not reference General Piat's purported statement that it would not be his best military advice to send D.C. National Guard personnel to the Capitol. Neither Mr. McCarthy nor Mr. Miller participated in the phone call with General Piat, Army staff, D.C. officials, and Mr. Sund. Both Mr. McCarthy and Mr. Miller, however, strongly denied mentioning or discussing the role of optics in assessing whether to provide D.C. National Guard assistance to U.S. Capitol Police or MPD. When asked whether he disagreed with General Piat's purported statements that sending D.C. National Guard personnel would not be his best military advice, Mr. McCarthy responded, at that moment, absolutely noting that he ran down the hallway and interrupted a meeting with the Secretary of Defense to get the authority to go. Mr. Miller also downplayed General Piat's purported belief that sending D.C. National Guard personnel was not the best military advice. Quote, their best military advice is theirs. The best military advice that I take is from the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, statutorily. So the best military advice that I received was, let's go, agree. When asked to explain the Army officials' purported statements, Mr. McCarthy explained his view that the parties, quote, were clearly talking past each other and created a lot of confusion and, as described more below, required a lot of cleanup. Three, DOD senior officials consider D.C.'s request for assistance. Beginning around 2.30 p.m., as General Piat continued to speak with MPD, U.S. Capitol Police, and other officials, Mr. McCarthy briefed Mr. Miller on the unfolding situation at the Capitol. Mr. Miller recalled not receiving a workable request until that time. In Mr. Miller's view, the breach of the Capitol building and the shooting of a woman inside the Capitol building marked a fundamental change in that it was clear that law enforcement could no longer handle the situation and DOD would be required to play a much bigger role. At 3.04 p.m., Mr. Miller approved the activation of the full D.C. National Guard. Although DOD did not know exactly what was going to be required of DOD to support operations at the Capitol, General McConville described Mr. Miller's decision as immediate and stated that no one advised against sending support. Mr. McCarthy conveyed Mr. Miller's authorization to General Walker, directing him to recall all personnel and to initiate movement to posture forces to support MPD. Mr. Miller's 3.04 p.m. authorization was to activate the National Guard in preparation to support domestic law enforcement at the Capitol. It was not an instruction for D.C. National Guard personnel to deploy to the Capitol, but rather an instruction to personnel to convene at the armory, get outfitted with the appropriate equipment, and be briefed on the new mission. Mr. Miller understood that Mr. McCarthy and General Walker would continue mission planning. Conducting mission analysis, however, was initially delayed as a result of confusion following the call with General Piat, U.S. Capitol Police, 
Metropolitan Police Department, and other officials. According to the Army, D.C. officials interpreted General Piat's comments as a denial of support and threatened to go to the media. General Walker confirmed that a D.C. official threatened to have the mayor hold a press conference to announce that DOD refused to support its request for assistance. At 2.55 p.m., a reporter tweeted that DOD, quote, had just denied a request by D.C. officials to deploy the National Guard to the U.S. Capitol, unquote. Mr. McCarthy explained to the committees that by the time he finished meeting with Mr. Miller, they were tweeting, it was on the news that we weren't coming, we had declined support, which we hadn't, we never had. So there was tremendous confusion between 3 p.m. and 3.30 p.m. In that time, Mr. McCarthy had to talk to the mayor, as well as congressional leaders, other members of the media, to tell them, no, we are indeed coming, because there was a perception that we declined the request for support, and that was never the case. Although Mr. McCarthy told those with whom he spoke that D.C. National Guard was coming, he did not explain that the Army needed to complete a mission analysis before D.C. National Guard were authorized to leave the Armory. 4. Mission Analysis After Mr. Miller's 3.04 p.m. authorization for D.C. National Guard to activate and fully mobilize, D.C. National Guard personnel, those assisting MPD at traffic control points and the Quick Reaction Force, began to reassemble at the Armory. There, D.C. National Guard personnel were briefed on their new mission and equipped with the necessary protection. According to Mr. Miller, in the time needed for the personnel to assemble, he continued to perform mission analysis, assessing where D.C. National Guard personnel would be staged, what they would be doing, and what equipment they would need. Mr. McCarthy chose to relocate to MPD headquarters, where he could discuss the mission plan with Mayor Bowser and acting MPD Chief Conti face-to-face. Mr. McCarthy arrived at MPD headquarters around 4.10 p.m. According to an Army report, quote, a critical planning factor was to specify unit-level tasks to employ the D.C. National Guard because the Army does not respond to crises as individuals but instead by small units, such as squads and platoons, unquote. General McConville informed the committees that D.C. National Guard personnel were originally assigned to assist with traffic control points, and if that purpose were to change, quote, ideally you'd want to have a task and purpose for what they would do, and that you would want to make sure that they had the appropriate qualifications for the task and purpose given, unquote. Another important aspect was determining the appropriate equipment for the mission. In addition, D.C. National Guard personnel had to regroup. Those on duty were stationed at 37 separate locations around the National Capital Region. Mr. McCarthy summarized, quote, They didn't have their equipment. They weren't together. They didn't have their equipment, and they didn't know. I mean, these guys were on street corners. You had to bring them back to the armory. The Capitol was under attack. We needed to put their body armor on, put their equipment on. Tell them you're going to link up at the corner first in D. You're going to be inserted by the Capitol Police. You're going to lay in a perimeter out in front of the building. They had to be informed of what they are about to go do. These guys were 20 blocks away, controlling traffic, unquote. By contrast, General Walker believed that D.C. National Guard personnel at traffic control points had the equipment necessary to respond to the Capitol, testifying that, quote, they had gear in the vehicle. They were equipped with force protection, helmets, shin guards, and body protection. Unquote. Mr. McCarthy told the committees that he understood that D.C. National Guard personnel had helmets and vests in their vehicles. 
but he noted that they did not have shields and batons, which were necessary to respond to control the growing crowd at the Capitol. Mr. Miller testified that he was not aware that guardsmen had equipment in their vehicles, but that he was gratified to know that subordinate commanders had the latitude to do what they needed. By 4.32 p.m., Mr. McCarthy and his D.C. counterparts had agreed upon a task and purpose for D.C. National Guard, identified link-up locations, and confirmed key leaders at each site. Accounts differ as to who within DOD needed to approve the final plan in order to deploy D.C. National Guard troops to the Capitol. Mr. McCarthy briefed Mr. Miller on the plan, who raised no objections. But Mr. Miller informed the committees that he did not need to approve the plan. In his view, his 3.04 p.m. authorization was all-encompassing and that as soon as Mr. McCarthy and General Walker finished their mission analysis, D.C. National Guard had all necessary authorizations to deploy. General McConville informed the committees that, although he did not know for sure, he believed Mr. Miller did need to approve the deployment plan. Mr. McCarthy told the committees that he authorized General Walker to depart the armory for the Capitol at 4.35 p.m. In contrast, General Walker testified that he did not receive authorization to depart the armory until 5.08 p.m. D.C. National Guard records indicate that General McConville conveyed the deployment instruction. General McConville explained that he joined an in-progress video conference and, quote, said you have all the authorities you need to move. You moving? And General Walker said, yeah, unquote. General McConville believed that General Walker had received the direction to deploy prior to their 5.08 p.m. conversation, noting that he does not have the authority to order deployment in his advisory position. These discrepancies reflect the breakdown in communication between DOD and D.C. National Guard officials, who were all located in different parts of the district. When asked about the discrepancy between D.C. National Guard's timeline and the Army's timeline, Mr. Miller pointed to the, quote, fog and friction of chaotic situations, unquote. General McConville also referenced fog, and friction, adding that the Pentagon is an administrative headquarters rather than a tactical command and control headquarters that's actually fighting a battle. And it's not unusual in crisis situations to have times that are not exact. While there are conflicting reports as to when D.C. National Guard left the armory, all agree that it occurred shortly after 5 p.m. Neither Mr. Miller, Mr. McCarthy, nor General McConville could explain why it took D.C. National Guard more than 30 minutes after the deployment directive to leave the armory. Mr. Miller speculated that this time may have been used to provide personnel final instructions. General McConville noted that it takes time to move people, and also believed that it may have been used to finalize logistics. D.C. National Guard arrived at the Capitol around 5.20 p.m. Even if Mr. Miller and Mr. McCarthy did not become aware of the request or urgency for D.C. National Guard assistance until approximately 2.30 p.m., nearly three hours elapsed between that awareness and arrival of D.C. National Guard. General Walker testified that it should not take three hours to either say yes or no to an urgent request. In an event like that where everybody saw it, it should not take three hours. General Walker testified that his concept of operation would have been simple, to immediately deploy as many civil disturbance-equipped D.C. National Guard personnel to the Capitol as possible in direct support of MPD. 
he would have immediately pulled all the guardsmen that were supporting the Metropolitan Police Department, whom General Walker believed had the necessary equipment in their vehicles, and 150 guardsmen could have arrived in 20 minutes. He noted that shortly after 3 p.m., he directed the QRF to move from Andrews Air Force Base to the armory, noting that the quick reaction force returned to the armory in about 20 minutes. So we had them sit there waiting until we got the approval. General Walker noted that D.C. National Guard was ready to go before 5 p.m. General Walker stressed that D.C. National Guard was prepared to come to the Capitol. Quote, it is a mandate that all National Guard practices civil disturbance. We are equipped for it, we train for it, and we are prepared to do it when called upon. So if we had been approved to do it, we would have got there and helped the United States Capitol Police, unquote. When asked about the apparent three-hour delay, however, Mr. McCarthy noted DOD took more than two days to conduct mission analysis for the D.C. government's December 31, 2020 request and took less than two hours to prepare a plan on January 6. Mr. Miller also stressed that it typically takes active duty forces, people specifically sitting in their areas before they deploy, three hours minimum to mission plan, get outfitted, and briefed on the mission. He attributed criticism to either hyper-politicization of the situation or an ignorance of how military operations work. General McConville, Mr. McCarthy, and Mr. Miller also stressed the differences between the National Guard and law enforcement, including that National Guard personnel are not first responders who can show up in minutes, and the importance of mission planning before dispatching D.C. National Guard personnel. General McConville explained, quote, but there's a difference, maybe getting a couple hours or a couple things of doing civil disturbance training than actually clearing a building with all these important people here in contact or in a contested environment. You want to make sure you're using the right people with the right skill set to do that. And that's why you plan. That's why you prepare. That's why you rehearse. And that's my best military advice on all these things, unquote. According to Mr. McCarthy, in all situations, emergency or otherwise, DOD needs to understand how D.C. National Guard would be inserted in the operation to ensure the best conditions for them to be successful. Mr. McCarthy added, quote, you know, much of how well you're going to do in our profession, 90 percent of how well you do, is decided before you ever go wheels up your preparation, and the lead-up to operations. When the intel says there's no threat, when you're not requested to support, we're not like law enforcement, where we are there in a matter of minutes, that they're postured throughout the city. It takes time to spin up our personnel to support operations. They were remissioned from doing traffic control. You know, these are the sorts of things that, had it been different, in the way you were postured for that day, the performance would have been different. But the Guard is normally the last resort in support for any of these domestic type of operations in support of law enforcement, unquote. Mr. McCarthy also explained that the mission analysis must be performed in all situations, including during a crisis or emergency. Mr. Miller echoed Mr. McCarthy's statements, noting that time and resources would be wasted without planning, coordinating, and synchronizing, and sending people into a situation without understanding what's happening on the ground doesn't work and is not effective. He explained that he had an obligation to DOD personnel and their families to ensure personnel are employed in a manner that protects them to the greatest extent possible. He added, quote, So when I see this timeline, this isn't a video game. 
This is in Halo, where, you know, Master Chief gets to just teleport himself across town. We've got forces in contact. We have to pull them out of contact. We have to prepare them. And yes, I've been in my share of shows where it doesn't work out that way. And the one thing I've learned is I have a moral and a professional obligation to the citizens of this country that when we employ military force, that we do it in a very mature, deliberate, and well-planned way. So that is why I am always kind of like less than 90 minutes. I previously mentioned our premier counterterrorism force in the United States military that has been doing this for 40 years has a three-hour period. The fact that the National Guard was able to move this fast is unprecedented in the history of the National Guard. So I see it fundamentally different than this criticism that there was some sort of conspiracy to slow down the deployment, unquote. When asked the risk of deploying D.C. National Guard earlier, Mr. Miller warned that it would have been uncoordinated, unsynchronized, and not effective. He continued, explaining what might have happened if D.C. National Guard had deployed without planning. Quote, I've been in a few riots, and just having people show up without a plan and without mission intent, and having understanding of what is happening on the ground, you can just run to the sound of the gunfire, but usually it just doesn't work. It's not effective. So taking that time to make sure you have as much information as you can and making sure that your people, most importantly, that your soldiers have the information they need is pretty much the fundamental nature of these things. Unless you're an extremely well-trained organization that has practiced and trained and educated and experienced at just coming in, and we have some of those, it's not the D.C. National Guard, I just want to tell you that, and it's not a criticism of them. That's not their mission, unquote. E, deployment of the QRF. As noted above, D.C. National Guard has a 40-person quick response force staged at Joint Base Andrews on January 6th. A quick response force is a standard element of guardsmen held in reserve equipped with civil disturbance response equipment, helmets, shields, batons, etc., and postured to quickly respond to an urgent and immediate need for assistance by civilian authorities. On January 4th, Mr. Miller directed that the QRF could be employed, quote, only as a last resort and in response to a request from an appropriate civil authority, unquote. On January 5th, Mr. McCarthy reiterated this control measure, withheld General Walker's ability to deploy the QRF, and directed that any consideration of QRF deployment must be preceded by a concept of operations. General Walker described these directives as unusual. General Walker also testified that the quick response force was outfitted with all the equipment needed to go to the Capitol and was ready to go before 5 p.m. General McConville stated that there was never an intent to have a quick reaction force going in to clear the Capitol. Neither Mr. McCarthy nor Mr. Miller recalled whether the QRF had its civil disturbance gear available at Joint Base Andrews. Mr. McCarthy also noted that he was never informed that the QRF was at the armory, equipped and prepared to depart for the Capitol. When asked whether the QRF was properly equipped to respond to the Capitol, even if that was not the original intent, General McConville reiterated the importance of the assigned mission. It depends on what the mission was. Mr. McCarthy also acknowledged that, even if properly equipped, the QRF still needed to be briefed on the new mission. Quote, I wanted to be clear of the concept for operations and how we were going to bring these available D.C. National Guard personnel 
including the quick reaction force, together. Make sure they had the right equipment, a clear understanding of their mission, and then link up with an organization and contact. So, you know, it was ultimately my call, and I wanted to make sure we got it right, unquote. General McConville reiterated the same point. Quote, but the bottom line is, is when you commit some type of quick reaction force, at least from a military standpoint, what we always do is, ideally, we rehearse it. We have a plan. We have an idea of what we want to do so you can tell the soldiers and the leaders, this is where you need to go. This is what you can expect to do. This is the equipment you need to have. And then you can make sure that that quick reaction force has the capabilities to actually do that, unquote. When asked if he believed the concept of operations requirement slowed QRF deployment, Mr. Miller clarified that the concept of operations provided did not need to be a detailed presentation. It need only describe the plan of action. He also could not assess whether deployment of the quick reaction force prior to 5 p.m. would have made a difference without knowing the situation on the ground and how they were to be used. General Walker and Robert Salasis, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense Integration and Defense Support of Civil Authorities, testified that they believed the attack on the Capitol constituted a last resort and that QRF deployment would have been appropriate. When asked for his view, Mr. Miller told the committees that General Walker never expressed his view that it was a last resort situation. And Mr. Miller stressed that he delegated all necessary approvals to General Walker. Quote, if he felt it was a last resort, he had all the authority he needed to deploy the QRF to the Capitol, unquote. End of Section 9. Section 10 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 9 of the report, Conclusion. January 6, 2021, marked not only an attack on the Capitol building, it marked an attack on democracy. The entities responsible for securing and protecting the Capitol complex and everyone on site that day were not prepared for a large-scale attack, despite being aware of the potential for violence targeting the Capitol. The committee's investigation to date makes clear that reforms to the U.S. Capitol Police and the Capitol Police Board are necessary to ensure events like January 6th are never repeated. The failures leading up to and on January 6th were not limited to legislative branch entities. As has been made clear in the committee's two public hearings on the subject, failures extended to a number of executive branch agencies. A key contributing factor to the tragic events of January 6th was the failure of the intelligence community to properly analyze, assess, and disseminate information to law enforcement regarding the potential for violence and the known threats to the Capitol and the members present that day. Further scrutiny of these failures and the preparations and response of federal agencies will continue. End of Section 10. Section 11 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Appendix A, USCP Inspector General Recommendations. Operational Planning and Intelligence Recommendations. Recommendation 1, Establish Policies and Procedures Requiring Documentation for Supervisory Review and Approval, Standardized Planning Document Formats, and Communication to Personnel of criteria for determining the level of operational planning documentation necessary for each anticipated event. Recommendation 2. Establish policies and procedures 
designating the specific entity or entities responsible for overseeing the operational planning and execution process for each anticipated event. Recommendation 3. Establish policies and procedures requiring that individual units develop operational plans and coordinate those plans with other units for a comprehensive, department-wide effort. Recommendation 4. Implement formal guidance requiring that employees communicate any intelligence reports and concerns from external sources to appropriate commanders. Recommendation 5. Implement detailed policies and procedures requiring any threat analysis, included in operational planning, is coordinated with department entities having intelligence analysis and dissemination responsibilities. Recommendation 6. Provide training to its personnel on how better to understand and interpret intelligence assessments. Recommendation 7. Revise relevant standard operating procedure to require supervisory review and approval for intelligence products to ensure its products are supported by relevant intelligence information and internally consistent. Recommendation 8. Require sworn and operational civilian employees to obtain a top-secret clearance and require that administrative civilian employees obtain a minimum of a secret clearance. Civil Disturbance Unit and Intelligence Recommendations Recommendation 1. Develop policies and procedures that identify and formalize the Civil Disturbance Units, or CDU, mission, objectives, roles, and responsibilities. Recommendation 2. Update relevant standard operating procedures relating to assignment of CDU personnel and use of less lethal munitions to reflect current practices. Recommendation 3. Develop policies and procedures that identify and formalize the CDU's training standards, requirements, and responsibilities. Recommendation 4. Develop a leadership CDU training program that focuses on command tactics and responsibilities. Recommendation 5. Develop policies and procedures for CDU equipment standards and life cycle management. Recommendation 6. Store riot shields in a temperature-stable area with conditions designed to maximize the life of the shield and the CDU should create a process for reporting when the shields are not stored within the guidelines of the manufacturer, such as, but not limited to, direct sunlight, temperature-stable environment, and when they have been exposed to petrol, diesel, solvents, and exhaust fumes. Recommendation 7. Develop policies and procedures for outlining the deploying and or staging all available types of less lethal weapon systems during CDU operations. Recommendation 8. Increase its number of less lethal weapon systems and explore additional less lethal options. Recommendation 9. Train and certify additional CDU grenadiers. Recommendation 10. Prepare and stage necessary operational equipment for events. Recommendation 11. Immediately update relevant standard operating procedure regarding use of pepper ball system to reflect current manufacturer recommendations and requirements and ensure that grenadiers received the training within the frequency specified in the updated policy. Recommendation 12. Develop a standard operating procedure that identifies and formalizes the roles, responsibilities, and reporting requirements for employee listings for the CDU. Recommendation 13. Explore incentivizing the CDU program. Recommendation 14. Ensure that CDU liaisons are accountable for properly completing the CDU audit each quarter and providing it to the commander of the CDU.
Recommendation 15. Implement a process that will ensure that procedures for CDU inventory and reconciliation are fully functioning and operating as required. Specifically, the CDU must conduct physical inventories annually, perform reconciliations, resolve discrepancies, and provide an updated listing to the property custodian. Recommendation 16. Implement an inventory control for the armory and also recommend a check-in slash out logbook that requires approval by a supervisor for munitions and weapons. Recommendation 17. Either acquire an updated version of the 37 millimeter less lethal weapon or retire the weapon entirely because the current training for the 37 millimeter weapon system is included in the certification process grenade launcher type weapon systems. Recommendation 18. Immediately enforce relevant policy that requires Intelligence and Interagency Coordination Division, or IICD, prepare an Intelligence Priorities Framework annually and subsequently review the Intelligence Priorities Framework quarterly. Recommendation 19. Seek approval from the Capitol Police Board and its Congressional Oversight Committees to elevate and reorganize its intelligence resources into a bureau-level entity. Recommendation 20. Immediately codify a formal intelligence training program and enforce relevant standard operating procedure requiring that the IICD commander review and maintain the intelligence training program for all IICD employees. Recommendation 21. Develop guidance that clearly documents channels for efficiently and effectively disseminating intelligence information to all of its personnel. Recommendation 22. Review the relevant draft standard operating procedure regarding open source guidance for protest tracking and determine if the draft standard operating procedure includes all required elements related to the IICD's open source intelligence work and implement a comprehensive policy that covers open source intelligence efforts. Recommendation 23. Implement formal guidance that will ensure consistent and unified operational reporting across all intelligence and event planning documents. Recommendation 24. Refine document reporting that better captures operational impact to include improbable outcomes based on intelligence, trend data, threats to members, and information analysis. Recommendation 25. Implement guidance that will ensure consistency between analyst assessments and document summaries within its intelligence products. Recommendation 26. Require the director of the IICD develop an action plan within 45 calendar days to improve the department's capability to effectively collect process, and disseminate intelligence information. Counter surveillance and threat assessment recommendations. Recommendation 1. Update the relevant standard operating procedures of the Criminal Investigation Section, Intelligence Operations Section, or IOS, and Threat Assessment Section, or TAS, to reflect current practices. Recommendation 2. Establish a formal policy detailing communication procedures for counter-surveillance agents, including how and what detailed information is communicated through the chain of command and throughout the department. Recommendation 3. Establish a formal policy detailing basic and advanced training requirements for the Threat Assessment Section and Intelligence Operations Section. Recommendation 4. Enforce its policies regarding completion of form for stops or contacts officers initiate. Recommendation 5. 
establish a standalone entity with a defined mission dedicated to counter surveillance activities in support of protecting the congressional community and that it is adequately staffed to accomplish its mission. Recommendation 6. Use investigative analysts to augment its counter-surveillance resources. Recommendation 7. Establish a central desk staffed with analysts, agents, and officers that can exploit, investigate, disseminate, and triage information for counter-surveillance activities in real time. The desk should have a dedicated commander whose focus is on that process and providing guidance and direction to agents in the field. Recommendation 8. Increase the number of threat assessment agents as the caseload increase. Recommendation 9. Use investigative analysts to augment its threat assessment section at an analyst-to-agent ratio comparable to its partnering agencies. Recommendation 10. Consider providing more of their highest priority threat cases to the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Behavioral Analysis Unit Task Force for in-depth analysis of their priority subjects. Containment Emergency Response Team and First Responders Unit Recommendations. Recommendation 1. Realign the Containment and Emergency Response Team, or CERT, from the Operational Services Bureau Special Operations Division to the Protective Services Bureau and define a mission for CERT that better supports U.S. Capitol Police's primary mission of security and protection of Congress. Recommendation 2. Pursue additional mission-driven training opportunities for the CERT from federal partner agencies. Recommendation 3. Develop and implement recurring training between the Containment and Emergency Response Team and other U.S. Capitol Police elements, such as the Dignitary Protection Division, Civil Disturbance Unit, First Responders Unit, Crisis Negotiation Team, and any other elements CERT may deploy to support. Recommendation 4. Update standard operating procedure regarding noise flash diversionary devices. Recommendation 5. Establish policies that outline its procedures for completing advances and other recurring responsibilities it may have when supporting Dignitary Protection Division protective operations. Recommendation 6. Enforce compliance with standard operating procedure requirements to have a CERT commander present in the command post during high-risk events to include during any joint sessions of Congress. Recommendation 7. Ensure that the CERT supervisors are held accountable for completing the biannual equipment checks, including communication device function checks. Recommendation 8. Determine the number of CERT instructors needed relative to the size of the unit and ensure that only certified instructors are conducting CERT training. Additionally, the department should consolidate all CERT training under the Training Services Bureau. Recommendation 9. Immediately enforce weapons qualification requirements for CERT officers on all assigned weapons, as detailed in Standard Operating Procedure relating to CERT operators who fail to meet weapons qualifications. Recommendation 10. Ensure that CERT supervisors are held accountable for completing monthly equipment inventories for all Property and Asset Management Division-issued equipment for each CERT officer. Recommendation 11. Update relevant standard operating procedure to identify which mountain bike programs meet the department requirement for mountain bike training. 
Recommendation 12. Establish a standard operating procedure that identifies the procedures for maintaining an inventory and proper storage of ballistic helmets and vests strategically placed around the Capitol complex. Recommendation 13. Update relevant standard operating procedure to identify the procedure for documenting the performance of the semi-annual inspections of remote locking devices. Recommendation 14. Establish a standard operating procedure that reflects a requirement that first responder unit, or FRU, officers be M4 certified. Recommendation 15. Explore options to secure ballistic helmets and vests at first responder unit posts. Recommendation 16. Train and provide first responder unit officers with additional, less lethal weapon systems. Recommendation 17. Provide the first responder unit with additional bicycles. Recommendation 18. Provide FRU officers with advanced medical training similar to emergency medical technicians. Recommendation 19. Train first responder unit together as a unit concerning M4 long rifle tactics. Recommendation 20. Coordinate with personnel from the architect of the Capitol to resolve physical access issues. Recommendation 21. Ensure that first responder unit management are held accountable for completing and documenting remote locking device drills. End of section 11. Section 12 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Appendix B, Transcript of President Trump's Speech at the Save America Rally on January 6th. Well, thank you very much. This is incredible. Media will not show the magnitude of this crowd. Even I, when I turned on today, I looked and I saw thousands of people here. But you don't see hundreds of thousands of people behind you because they don't want to show that. We have hundreds of thousands of people here, and I just want them to be recognized by the fake news media. Turn your cameras, please, and show what's really happening out here, because these people are not going to take it any longer. They're not going to take it any longer. Go ahead. Turn your cameras, please. Would you show? They came from all over the world, actually, but they came from all over our country. I just really want to see what they do. I just want to see how they covered. I've never seen anything like it, but it would be really great if we could be covered fairly by the media. The media is the biggest problem we have, as far as I'm concerned, single biggest problem, the fake news and the big tech. Big tech is now coming into their own. We beat them four years ago. We surprised them. We took them by surprise, and this year they rigged an election. They rigged it like they've never rigged an election before. And by the way, last night they didn't do a bad job either, if you notice. I'm honest, and I just again, I want to thank you. It's just been a great honor to have this kind of crowd and to be before you and hundreds of thousands of American patriots who are committed to the honesty of our elections and the integrity of our glorious republic. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing, and stolen by the fake news media. That's what they've done and what they're doing. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. Today, I will lay out just some of the evidence proving that we won this election, and we won it by a landslide. This was not a close election. You know, I say sometimes jokingly, but there's no joke about it. I've been in two elections. I won them both, 
and the second one, I won much bigger than the first. Okay, almost 75 million people voted for our campaign, the most of any incumbent president by far in the history of our country, 12 million more people than four years ago. And I was told by the real pollsters, we do have real pollsters, they know that we were going to do well and we were going to win. What I was told, if I went from 63 million, which we had four years ago, to 66 million, there was no chance of losing. Well, we didn't go to 66, we went to 75 million. And they say we lost? We didn't lose. And by the way, does anybody believe that Joe had 80 million votes? Does anybody believe that? He had 80 million computer votes. It's a disgrace. There's never been anything like that. You take third world countries. Just take a look. Take third world countries. Their elections are more honest than what we've been going through in this country. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. Even when you look at last night, they're all running around like chickens with their heads cut off with boxes. Nobody knows what the hell is going on. There's never been anything like this. We will not let them silence your voices. We are not going to let it happen. I'm not going to let it happen. Thank you. And I'd love to have if those tens of thousands of people would be allowed. The military, the Secret Service. And we want to thank you and the police, law enforcement. Great, you're doing a great job. But I'd love it if they could be allowed to come up here with us. Is that possible? Can you just let him come up, please? And Rudy, you did a great job. He's got guts. You know what? He's got guts, unlike a lot of people in the Republican Party. He's got guts. He fights. He fights. And I'll tell you, thank you very much, John. Fantastic job. I watched. That's a tough act to follow, those two. John is one of the most brilliant lawyers in the country. And he looked at this and he said, what an absolute disgrace that this can be happening to our Constitution. And he looked at Mike Pence, and I hope Mike is going to do the right thing. I hope so. I hope so. Because if Mike Pence does the right thing, we win the election. All he has to do, all this is, this is from the number one, or certainly one of the top constitutional lawyers in our country. He has the absolute right to do it. We're supposed to protect our country, support our country, support our Constitution, and protect our Constitution. States want to re-vote. The states got defrauded. They were given false information. They voted on it. Now they want to recertify. They want it back. All Vice President Pence has to do is send it back to the states to recertify, and we become president, and you are the happiest people. And I actually, I just spoke to Mike. I said, Mike, that doesn't take courage. What takes courage is to do nothing. That takes courage. And then we're stuck with a president who lost the election by a lot. And we have to live with that for four more years. We're just not going to let that happen. Many of you have traveled from all across the nation to be here. And I want to thank you for the extraordinary love. That's what it is. There's never been a movement like this, ever, ever. For the extraordinary love for this amazing country and this amazing movement, thank you. By the way, this goes all the way back past the Washington Monument. You believe this? Look at this. That is, unfortunately, gave, they gave the press the prime seats. I can't stand that. No, but you look at that behind... I wish they'd flip those cameras and look behind you. That is the most amazing sight. When they make a mistake, you get to see it on television. Amazing, amazing, all the way back. And don't worry, we will not take the name off the Washington Monument. We will not cancel culture. You know, they wanted to get rid of the Jefferson Memorial. Either take it down or just put somebody else in there. I don't think that's going to happen. It damn well better not. Although, with this administration, if this happens, it could happen. You'll see some really bad things happen. They'll knock out Lincoln, too, by the way. They've been taking his statue down. 
But then we signed a little law. You hurt our monuments. You hurt our heroes. You go to jail for 10 years, and everything stopped. You notice that? It stopped. It all stopped. Then they could use Rudy back in New York City. Rudy, they could use you. Your city's going to hell. They want Rudy Giuliani back in New York. We'll get a little younger version of Rudy. Is that okay, Rudy? We're gathered together in the heart of our nation's capital for one very, very basic and simple reason, to save our democracy. You know, most candidates on election evening, and of course this thing goes on so long, they still don't have any idea what the votes are. We still have congressional seats under review. They have no idea. They've totally lost control. They've used the pandemic as a way of defrauding the people in a proper election. But you know, you know, when you see this and when you see what's happening, number one, they all say, sir, we'll never let it happen again. I said, that's good, but what about eight weeks ago? You know, they try and get you to go. They said, sir, in four years, you're guaranteed. I said, I'm not interested right now. Do me a favor. Go back eight weeks. I want to go back eight weeks. Let's go back eight weeks. We want to go back and we want to get this right because we're going to have somebody in there that should not be in there and our country will be destroyed and we're not going to stand for that. For years, Democrats have gotten away with election fraud and weak Republicans. And that's what they are. There's so many weak Republicans. And we have great ones. Jim Jordan and some of these guys, they're out there fighting. The House guys are fighting. But it's, it's incredible. Many of the Republicans, I helped them get in. I helped them get elected. I helped Mitch get elected. I helped. I could name 24 of them. Let's say, I won't bore you with it, and then all of a sudden you have something like this. It's like, oh, gee, maybe I'll talk to the president sometime later. No, it's amazing. They're weak Republicans. They're pathetic Republicans, and that's what happens. If this happened to the Democrats, there'd be hell all over the country going on. There'd be hell all over the country. But just remember this. You're stronger, you're smarter, you've got more going on than anybody. And they try and demean everybody having to do with us. And you're the real people. You're the people that built this nation. You're not the people that torn down our nation. The weak Republicans, and that's it. I really believe it. I think I'm going to use the term, the weak Republicans. You've got a lot of them. And you've got a lot of great ones. But you've got a lot of weak ones. They've turned a blind eye, even as Democrats enacted policies that chipped away our jobs, weakened our military, threw up on our borders, and put America last. Did you see the other day where Joe Biden said, I want to get rid of the America First policy? What's that all about? Get rid of. How do you say, I want to get rid of America first? Even if you're going to do it, don't talk about it, right? Unbelievable what we have to go through what we have to go through. And you have to get your people to fight. And if they don't fight, we have to primary the hell out of the ones that don't fight. You primary them. We're going to. We're going to let you know who they are. I can already tell you, frankly. But this year, using the pretext of the China virus and the scam of mail-in ballots, Democrats attempted the most brazen and outrageous election theft, and there's never been anything like this. So pure theft in American history, everybody knows it. That election, our election, was over at 10 o'clock in the evening. We're leading Pennsylvania, Michigan, Georgia by hundreds of thousands of votes. And then late in the evening or early in the morning, boom, these explosions of bullshit. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden it started to happen. Don't forget when Romney got beat. Romney, hey, did you see his? I wonder if he enjoyed his flight in last night. But then Romney got beaten, you know. He stands up like you're more typical. Well, I'd like to congratulate the victor. The victor? Who is the victor, Mitt? I'd like to congratulate. They don't go and look at the facts. No, I don't know. He got, he got slaughtered. Probably, 
Maybe it was okay, maybe it was, but that's what happened. But we look at the facts, and our election was so corrupt that in the history of this country, we've never seen anything like it. You can go all the way back. You know, America is blessed with elections. All over the world, they talk about our elections. You know what the world says about us now? They said, we don't have free and fair elections. And you know what else? We don't have a free and fair press. Our media is not free. It's not fair. It suppresses thought. It suppresses speech. And it's become the enemy of the people. It's become the enemy of the people. It's the biggest problem we have in this country. No third world countries would even attempt to do what we caught them doing. And you'll hear about that in just a few minutes. Republicans are, Republicans are constantly fighting like a boxer with his hands tied behind his back. It's like a boxer. And we want to be so nice. We want to be so respectful of everybody, including bad people. And we're going to have to fight much harder. And Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country because you're sworn to uphold our Constitution. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. And after this, we're going to walk down. And I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down. Anyone you want. But I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol and we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing and only count the electors who have been lawfully slated, lawfully slated. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. Today, we will see whether Republicans stand strong for integrity of our elections, but whether or not they stand strong for our country, our country. Our country has been under siege for a long time, far longer than this four-year period. We've set it on a much greater course so much. And we, I thought, you know, four more years. I thought it would be easy. We've created the greatest economy in history. We've rebuilt our military. We get you the biggest tax cuts in history, right? We got you the biggest regulation cuts. There's no president, whether it's four years, eight years, or in one case more, got anywhere near the regulation cuts used to take 20 years to get a highway approved. Now we're down to two. I want to get it down to one, but we're down to two. And it may get rejected for environmental or safety reasons, but we got it down to safety. We created space for us. We, 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 look at what we did. Our military has been totally rebuilt. So we create space for us, which by and of itself is a major achievement for an administration. And with us, it's one of so many different things. Right to try. Everybody know about right to try. We did things that nobody ever thought possible. We took care of our vets, our vets. The VA now has the highest rating, 91%. The highest rating that it's had from the beginning, 91% approval rating. Always, you watch the VA. It was on television every night people living in a horrible, horrible manner. We got that done. We got accountability done. We got it so that now in the VA, you don't have to wait for four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, four months to see a doctor. If you can't get a doctor, you go outside, you get the doctor. You have it taken care of, and we pay the doctor. And we not only made life wonderful for so many people, we've saved tremendous amounts of money, far secondarily, but we've saved a lot of money. And now we have the right to fire bad people in the VA. We had 9,000 people that treated our veterans horribly. In prime time, they would not have treated our veterans badly, but they treated our veterans horribly. And we have what's called the account VA Accountability Act. And the accountability says if we see somebody in there that doesn't treat our vets well, 
or they steal, they rob, they do things badly, we say, Joe, you're fired. Get out of here. Before, you couldn't do that. You couldn't do that before. So we've taken care of things. We've done things like nobody's ever thought possible. And that's part of the reason that many people don't like us, because we've done too much. But we've done it quickly, and we were going to sit home and watch a big victory, and everybody had us down for a victory. It was going to be great, and now we're out here fighting. I said to somebody I was going to take a few days and relax after our big electoral victory. Ten o'clock, it was over, but I was going to take a few days. And I can say this. Since our election, I believe, which was such a catastrophe, when I watch, and even these guys knew what happened. They know what happened. They're saying, wow, Pennsylvania's insurmountable. Wow, Wisconsin. Look at the big leads we had, right? Even though the press said we would lose Wisconsin by 17 points, even though the press said Ohio's going to be close, we set a record. Florida's going to be close, we set a record. Texas is going to be close. Texas is going to be close. We set a record. And we set a record with Hispanic, with the black community. We set a record with everybody. Today, we see an important event, though, because right over there, right there, we see the event going to take place. And I'm going to be watching because history is going to be made. We're going to see whether or not we have great and courageous leaders or whether or not we have leaders that should be ashamed of themselves throughout history. Throughout eternity, they'll be ashamed. And you know what? If they do the wrong thing, we should never, ever forget what they did. Never forget. We should never, ever forget. With only three of the seven states in question, we win the presidency of the United States. And by the way, it's much more important today than it was 24 hours ago because I don't. I spoke to David Perdue, what a great person, and Kelly Loeffler, two great people. But it was a setup. And you know, I said, we have no back line anymore. The only back line, the only line of demarcation, the only line that we have is the veto of the President of the United States. So this is now what we're doing, a far more important election than it was two days ago. I want to thank the more than 140 members of the House. Those are warriors. They're over there working like you've never seen before, studying, talking, actually going all the way back, studying the roots of the Constitution, because they know we have the right to send a bad vote that was illegally gotten. They gave these people bad things to vote for, and they voted because what did they know? And then when they found out a few weeks later, again, it took them four years to devise this screen. And the only unhappy person in the United States, single most unhappy, is Hillary Clinton. Because she said, why didn't you do this for me four years ago? Why didn't you do this for me four years ago? Change the votes, 10,000 in Michigan. You could have changed the whole thing. But she's not too happy. You know, you don't see her anymore. What happened? Where's Hillary? Where is she? But I want to thank all of those congressmen and women. I also want to thank our 13 most courageous members of the U.S. Senate. Senator Ted Cruz, Senator Ron Johnson, Senator Josh Hawley, Kelly Loeffler. And Kelly Loeffler, I'll tell you, she has been, she's been so great. She worked so hard. So let's give her and David a little special hand because it was rigged against them. Let's give her and David, Kelly Leffler, David Perdue. They fought a good race. They never had a shot. That equipment should never have been allowed to be used. And I was telling these people, don't let him use this stuff. Marsha Blackburn, terrific person. Mike Braun, Indiana. Steve Daines, great guy. Bill Haggerty, John Kennedy, James Langford. Cynthia Loomis, Tommy Tuberville, the coach, and Roger Marshall. We want to thank them. Senators that stepped up, we want to thank them. I actually think, though, it takes, again, more courage not to step up. And I think a lot of those people are going to find that out. And you better start looking at your leadership, because your leadership has led you down the tubes. 
you know, we don't want to give $2,000 to people. We want to give them $600. Oh, great. How does that play politically? Pretty good. And this has nothing to do with politics, but how does it play politically? China destroyed these people. We didn't destroy them. China destroyed them, totally destroyed them. We want to give them $600 and they just wouldn't change. I said, give them $2,000. We'll pay it back. We'll pay it back fast. You already owe $26 trillion. Give them a couple of bucks. Let them live. Give them a couple of bucks. And some of the people here disagree with me on that, but I just say, look, you got to let people live. And how does that play, though? Okay. Number one, it's the right thing to do. But how does that play politically? I think that's the primary reason, one of the primary reasons. The other was just pure cheating. And that was the primary, super primary reason. But you can't do that. You got to use your head. As you know, the media has constantly asserted the outrageous lie that there was no evidence of widespread fraud. Have you ever seen these people? While there's no evidence of fraud. Oh, really? Well, I'm going to read you pages. I hope you don't get bored listening to it. Promise? Don't get bored listening to it, all those hundreds of thousands of people back there. Move them up, please, yeah. All they, all these people, don't get bored. Don't get angry at me because you're going to get bored because it's so much. The American people do not believe the corrupt fake news anymore. They have ruined their reputation. But you know, it used to be that they'd argue with me. I'd fight, so I'd fight, they'd fight, I'd fight, they'd fight. Pop, pop. You'd believe me, you'd believe them. Somebody comes out. You know, they had their point of view, I had my point of view, but you'd have an argument. Now what they do is they go silent. It's called suppression, and that's what happens in a communist country. That's what they do, they suppress. You don't fight with them anymore unless it's a bad story. They have a little bad story about me. They make it 10 times worse, and it's a major headline. But Hunter Biden, they don't talk about him. What happened to Hunter? Where's Hunter? Where's Hunter? They don't talk about him. They'll watch. All the sets will go off. Well, they can't do that because they get good ratings. Their ratings are too good. Now, where's Hunter? You know. And how come Joe is allowed to give a billion dollars of money to get rid of the prosecutor in Ukraine? How does that happen? I'd ask you that question. How does that happen? Can you imagine if I said that? If I said that, it would be a whole different ballgame. And how come Hunter gets three and a half million dollars from the mayor of Moscow's wife and gets hundreds of thousands of dollars to sit on an energy board, even though he admits he has no knowledge of energy? and millions of dollars up front. And how come they go into China and they leave with billions of dollars to manage? Have you managed money before? No, I haven't. Oh, that's good. Here's about three billion. No, they don't talk about that. No, we have a corrupt media. They've gone silent. They've gone dead. I now realize how good it was if you go back 10 years. I realized how good, even though I didn't necessarily love them, I realized how good. It was like a cleansing motion, right? But we don't have that anymore. We don't have a fair media anymore. It's suppression. And you have to be very careful with that. And they've lost all credibility in this country. We will not be intimidated into accepting the hoaxes and the lies that we've been forced to believe. Over the past several weeks, we've amassed overwhelming evidence about a fake election. This is the presidential election. Last night was a little bit better because of the fact that we had a lot of eyes watching one specific state, but they cheated like hell anyway. You have one of the dumbest governors in the United States. And you know when I endorsed him? I didn't know this guy. At the request of David Perdue, he said, friend of mine's running for governor. What's his name? And you know the rest. He was in fourth place, fifth place. I don't know, he was, he was doing poorly. I endorse him, he went like a rocket ship and he won. And then I had to beat Stacey Abrams with this guy, Brian Kemp. I had to beat Stacey Abrams and I had to beat Oprah, used to be a friend of mine. You know, I was on her last show, her last week. She picked the five outstanding people. I don't think she thinks that anymore. Once I ran for president, 
I didn't notice there were too many calls coming in from Oprah. Believe it or not, she used to like me, but I was one of the five outstanding people. And I had a campaign against Michelle Obama and Barack Hussein Obama against Stacy. And I had Brian Kemp, who weighs 130 pounds. He said he played offensive line in football. I'm trying to figure that out. I'm still trying to figure that out. He said the other night, I was an offensive lineman. I'm saying, really? That must have been a very small team. But I look at that, and I look at what's happened, and he turned out to be a disaster. This stuff happens. You know, look, I'm not happy with the Supreme Court. They love to rule against me. I picked three people. I fought like hell for them. One in particular I fought. They all said, sir, cut him loose. He's killing the senators. You know, very loyal senators. They're very loyal people. Sir, cut him loose. He's killing us. Sir, cut him loose. I must have gotten half of the senators. I said, no, I can't do that. It's unfair to him and it's unfair to the family. He didn't do anything wrong. They made up stories. They're all made up stories. He didn't do anything wrong. Cut him loose, sir. I said, no, I won't do that. We got him through. And you know what? They couldn't give a damn. They couldn't give a damn. Let him rule the right way but it almost seems like they're all going out of their way to hurt all of us and to hurt our country, to hurt our country. You know, I read a story in one of the newspapers recently how I control the three Supreme Court justices. I control them. They're puppets. I read it about Bill Barr, that he's my personal attorney, that he'll do anything for me. And I said, you know, it really is genius. Because what they do is that, and it makes it really impossible for them to ever give you a victory. Because all of a sudden, Bill Barr changed, if you hadn't noticed. I like Bill Barr, but he changed, because he didn't want to be considered my personal attorney. And the Supreme Court, they rule against me so much. You know why? Because the story is, I haven't spoken to any of them, any of them, since virtually they got in. But the story is that they're my puppets right? That they're my puppets. And now the only way they can get out of that, because they hate that it's not good in the social circuit, and the only way they get out is to rule against Trump. So let's rule against Trump. And they do that. So I want to congratulate them. But it shows you the media's genius. In fact, probably if I was the media, I'd do it the same way. I hate to say it, but we've got to get them straightened out. Today, for the sake of our democracy, for the sake of our Constitution, and for the sake of our children, we lay out the case for the entire world to hear. You want to hear it? In every single swing state, local officials, state officials, almost all Democrats, made illegal and unconstitutional changes to election procedures without the mandated approvals by the state legislatures that these changes paved a way for fraud on a scale never seen before. I think we go a long way outside of our country when I say that. So just in a nutshell, you can't make a change or voting for a federal election unless the state legislature approves it. No judge can do it. Nobody can do it. Only a legislature. So as an example, in Pennsylvania or whatever, you have a Republican legislature You have a Democrat mayor, and you have a lot of Democrats all over the place. They go to the legislature. The legislature laughs at them, says, we're not going to do that. They say, thank you very much, and they go and make the changes themselves. They do it anyway. And that's totally illegal. That's totally illegal. You can't do that. In Pennsylvania, the Democrat Secretary of State and the Democrat State Supreme Court justices illegally abolished the signature verification requirements just 11 days prior to the election. So think of what they did. No longer is there signature verification. Oh, that's okay. We want voter ID, by the way. But no longer is there a signature verification. 11 days before the election, they say, we don't want it. You know why they don't want to? Because they want to cheat. That's the only reason. Who would even think of that? We don't want to verify a signature. There were over 205,000 more ballots counted in Pennsylvania. 
Think of this. You had 205,000 more ballots than you had voters. That means you had two. Where did they come from? You know where they came from? Somebody's imagination. Whatever they needed. So in Pennsylvania, you had 205,000 more votes than you had voters. And the number is actually much greater than that now. That was as of a week ago. And this is a mathematical impossibility, unless you want to say it's a total fraud. So Pennsylvania was defrauded. Over 8,000 ballots in Pennsylvania were cast by people whose names and dates of birth match individuals who died in 2020 and prior to the election. Think of that. Dead people. Lots of dead people. Thousands. And some dead people actually requested an application. That bothers me even more. Not only are they voting, they want an application to vote. One of them was 29 years ago died. It's incredible. Over 14,000 ballots were cast by out-of-state voters. So these are voters that don't live in this state. And by the way, these numbers are what they call outcome determinative, meaning these numbers far surpass. I lost by a very little bit. These numbers are massive, massive. More than 10,000 votes in Pennsylvania were illegally counted, even though they were received after Election Day. In other words, they were received after Election Day. Let's count them anyway. And what they did in many cases is they did fraud. They took the date and they moved it back so that it no longer is after Election Day. And more than 60,000 ballots in Pennsylvania were reported received back. They got back before they were ever supposedly mailed out. In other words, you got the ballot back before you mailed it, which is also logically and logistically impossible, right? Think of that one. You got the ballot back, let's send the ballots. Oh, they've already been sent. But we got the ballot back before they were sent. I don't think that's too good, right? 25,000 ballots in Pennsylvania were requested by nursing home residents all in a single giant batch, not legal, indicating an enormous illegal ballot harvesting operation. You're not allowed to do that. It's against the law. The day before the election, the state of Pennsylvania reported the number of absentee ballots that had been sent out. Yet this number was suddenly and drastically increased by 400,000 people. It was increased nobody knows where it came from, by 400,000 ballots one day after the election. It remains totally unexplained. They said, well, uh, we can't figure that. Now, that's many, many times what it would take to overthrow the state, just that one element. 400,000 ballots appeared from nowhere right after the election. By the way, Pennsylvania has now seen all of this. They didn't know because it was so quick. They had a vote, they voted. But now they see all this stuff, it's all come to light. Doesn't happen that fast. And they want to recertify their votes. They want to recertify. But the only way that can happen is if Mike Pence agrees to send it back. Mike Pence has to agree to send it back. And many people in Congress want it sent back. And think of what you're doing. Let's say you don't do it. Somebody says, well, we have to obey the Constitution. And you are, because you're protecting our country and you're protecting the Constitution. So you are. But think of what happens. Let's say they're stiffs and they're stupid people, and they say, well, we really have no choice, even though Pennsylvania and the other states want to redo their votes. They want to see the numbers. They already have the numbers. Go very quickly. And they want to redo their legislature because many of these votes were taken, as I said, because it wasn't approved by their legislature. You know, that in itself is legal. And then you have the scam, and it's all of these things that we're talking about. But think of this. If you don't do it, that means you will have a president of the United States for four years with his wonderful son. You will have a president who lost all of these states. Or you will have a president, to put it another way, who was voted on by a bunch of stupid people who lost all of these states. You will have an illegitimate president. That's what you'll have, and we can't let that happen. These are the facts that you won't hear from the fake news media. It's all part of the suppression effort. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about it. 
In fact, when I started talking about that, I guarantee you a lot of the television sets and a lot of those cameras went off. And that's a lot of cameras back there, but a lot of them went off. But these are the things you won't hear about. You won't hear what you just heard. I'm going to go over a few more states, but you won't hear it by the people who want to deceive you and demoralize you and control you. Big tech, media. Just like the suppression polls that said we're going to lose Wisconsin by 17 points. Well, we won Wisconsin. They don't have it that way because they lost just by a little sliver. But they had me down the day before. Washington Post ABC poll down 17 points. I called up a real pollster. I said, what is that? Sir, that's called a suppression poll. I think you're going to win Wisconsin, sir. I said, but why don't they make it four or five points? Because then people vote. But when you're down 17, they say, hey, I'm not going to waste my time. I love the president, but there's no way. Despite that, despite that, we won Wisconsin. It's going to see. I mean, you'll see. But that's called suppression, because a lot of the people, when they see that, it's very interesting. This pollster said, sir, if you're down three, four, or five, people vote. When you go down 17, they say, let's save. Let's go and have dinner, and let's watch the presidential defeat tonight on television, darling. And just like the radical left tries to blacklist you on social media, every time I put out a tweet that's, even if it's totally correct, totally correct, I get a flag. I get a flag. And they also don't let you get out. You know, on Twitter, it's very hard to come onto my account. It's very hard to get out a message. They don't let the message get out nearly like they should. But I've had many people say, I can't get on your Twitter. I don't care about Twitter. Twitter's bad news. They're all bad news. But you know what? If you want to, if you want to get out a message, and if you want to go through big tech social media, they are really, if you're a conservative, if you're a Republican, if you have a big voice, I guess they call it shadow band, right? Shadow band? They shadow ban you, and it should be illegal. I've been telling these Republicans, get rid of Section 230. And for some reason, Mitch and the group, they don't want to put it in there, and they don't realize that that's going to be the end of the Republican Party as we know it. But it's never going to be the end of us. Never. Let them get out. Let, let the weak ones get out. This is a time for strength. They also want to indoctrinate your children in school by teaching them things that aren't so. They want to indoctrinate your children. It's all part of the comprehensive assault on our democracy. And the American people are finally standing up and saying no. This crowd is, again, a testament to it. I did no advertising. I did nothing. You do have some groups that are big supporters. I want to thank that, Amy, and everybody. We have some incredible supporters. Incredible. But we didn't do anything. This just happened. Two months ago, we had a massive crowd come down to Washington. I said, what are they there for? Sir, they're there for you. We have nothing to do with it. These groups are for, they're forming all over the United States. And we got to remember, in a year from now, you're going to start working on Congress. And we got to get rid of the weak Congress people, the ones that aren't any good, the Liz Cheney's of the world. We got to get rid of them. We got to get rid. You know, she never wants a soldier brought home. I brought a lot of our soldiers home. I don't know, something like it. They're in countries that nobody even knows the name. Nobody knows where they are. They're dying. They're great, but they're dying. They're losing their arms, their legs, their face. I brought them back home, largely back home. Afghanistan, Iraq. Remember, I used to say in the old days, don't go in Iraq, but if you go in, keep the oil. We didn't keep the oil. So stupid, so stupid, these people. And Iraq has billions and billions of dollars now in the bank. And what did we do? We got nothing. We never get, but we do actually. We kept the oil here, or we get, we did good. We got rid of the ISIS caliphate. We got rid of plenty of different things that everybody knows and the rebuilding of our military in three years. People said it couldn't be done. And it was all made in the USA, all made in the USA, best equipment in the world. In Wisconsin, 
corrupt Democrat-run cities deployed more than 500 illegal, unmanned, unsecured drop boxes, which collected a minimum of 91,000 unlawful votes. It was razor thin the loss. This one thing alone is much more than we would need. But there are so many things. They have these lock boxes, and you know they'd pick them up and they'd disappear for two days. People would say, where's that box? They disappeared. Nobody even knew where the hell it was. In addition, over 170,000 absentee votes were counted in Wisconsin without a valid absentee ballot application. So they had a vote, but they had no application. And that's illegal in Wisconsin, meaning those votes were blatantly done in opposition to state law. And they came 100% from Democrat areas, such as Milwaukee and Madison, 100%. In Madison, 17,000 votes were deposited in so-called human drop boxes. You know what that is, right? Where operatives stuff thousands of unsecured ballots into duffel bags on park benches across the city in complete defiance of cease and desist letters from state legislature. Your state legislatures said, don't do it. They're the only ones that can approve it. They gave tens of thousands of votes. They came in in duffel bags. Where the hell did they come from? According to eyewitness testimony, postal service workers in Wisconsin were also instructed to illegally backdate approximately 100,000 ballots. The margin of difference in Wisconsin was less than 20,000 votes. Each one of these things alone wins us the state. Great state. We love the state. We won the state. In Georgia, your secretary of state who... I can't believe this guy's a Republican. He loves recording telephone conversations. You know, that was? I thought it was a great conversation personally. So did a lot of others. People love that conversation because it says what's going on. These people are crooked. They're 100%, in my opinion, one of the most corrupt between your governor and your secretary of state. And now you have it again last night. Just look at what happened. What a mess. And the Democrat Party operatives entered into an illegal and unconstitution, unconstitutional settlement agreement that drastically weakened signature verification and other election security procedures. Stacey Abrams, she took him to lunch. And I beat her two years ago with a bad candidate, Brian Kemp. But they took, the Democrats took the Republicans to lunch because the Secretary of State had no clue what the hell was happening unless he did have a clue. That's interesting. Maybe he was with the other side. But we've been trying to get verifications of signatures in Fulton County. They won't let us do it. The only reason they won't is because we'll find things in the hundreds of thousands. Why wouldn't they let us verify signatures in Fulton County, which is known for being very corrupt? They won't do it. They go to some other county where you live. I said, that's not the problem. The problem is Fulton County, home of Stacey Abrams. She did a good job, I congratulate her, but it was done in such a way that we can't let this stuff happen. We won't have a country if it happens. As a result, Georgia's absentee ballot rejection rate was more than 10 times lower than previous levels because the criteria was so off. 48 counties in Georgia, with thousands and thousands of votes, rejected zero ballots. There wasn't one ballot. In other words, in a year in which more mail-in ballots were sent than ever before and more people were voting by mail for the first time, the rejection rate was drastically lower than it had ever been before. The only way this can be explained is if tens of thousands of illegitimate votes were added to the tally. That's the only way you can explain it. By the way, you're talking about tens of thousands. If Georgia had merely rejected the same number of unlawful ballots as in other years, they should have been approximately 45,000 ballots rejected, far more than what we needed to win, just over 11,000. They should find those votes. They should absolutely find that. Just over 11,000 votes, that's all we need. They defrauded us out of a win in Georgia, and we're not going to forget it. There's only one reason the Democrats could possibly want to eliminate signature matching, 
opposed voter ID and stopped citizenship confirmation. Are you a citizenship? You're not allowed to ask that question because they want to steal the election. End of section 12. Section 13 of Examining the U.S. Capitol Attack by the U.S. Senate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Appendix B, Part 2. The radical left knows exactly what they're doing. They're ruthless. And it's time that somebody did something about it. And Mike Pence, I hope you're going to stand up for the good of our Constitution and for the good of our country. And if you're not, I'm going to be very disappointed in you. I will tell you right now, I'm not hearing good stories. In Fulton County, Republican poll watchers were ejected, in some cases physically from the room, under the false pretense of a pipe burst. Water main burst, everybody leave, which we now know was a total lie. Then election officials pull boxes, Democrats, and suitcases of ballots out from under a table. You all saw it on television, totally fraudulent and illegally scanned them for nearly two hours, totally unsupervised. Tens of thousands of votes. This act coincided with a mysterious vote dump of up to 100,000 votes for Joe Biden, almost none for Trump. Oh, that sounds fair. That was at 1.34 a.m. The Georgia Secretary of State and pathetic governor of Georgia have reached, although he says I'm a great president, you know, I sort of maybe have to change. He said the other day, yes, I do. I disagree with president, but he's been a great president. Good, thanks. Thank you very much. Because of him and others, you have Brian Kemp. Vote him the hell out of office, please. Well, his rates are so low. You know, his approval rating now, I think it just reached a record low. They've rejected five separate appeals for an independent and comprehensive audit of signatures in Fulton County. Even without an audit, the number of fraudulent ballots that we've identified across the state is staggering. Over 10,300 ballots in Georgia were cast by individuals whose names and dates of birth match Georgia residents who died in 2020 and prior to the election. More than 2,500 ballots were cast by individuals whose names and dates of birth match incarcerated felons in Georgia prison, people who are not allowed to vote. More than 4,500 illegal ballots were cast by individuals who do not appear on the state's own voter rolls. Over 18,000 illegal ballots were cast by individuals who registered to vote using an address listed as vacant, according to the Postal Service. At least 88,000 ballots in Georgia were cast by people whose registrations were illegally backdated. 66,000 votes, each one of these is far more than we need. 66,000 votes in Georgia were cast by individuals under the legal voting age. And at least 15,000 ballots were cast by individuals who moved out of the state prior to the November 3rd election. They say they moved right back. They moved right back. Oh, they moved out. They moved right back. Okay. They miss Georgia that much. I do. I love Georgia, but it's a corrupt system. Despite all of this, the margin in Georgia is only 11,779 votes. Each and every one of these issues is enough to give us a victory in Georgia, a big, beautiful victory. Make no mistake, this election was stolen from you, from me, and from the country. And not a single swing state has conducted a comprehensive audit to remove the illegal ballots. This should absolutely occur in every single contested state before the election is certified. In the state of Arizona, over 36,000 ballots were illegally cast by non-citizens. 2,000 ballots were returned with no address. More than 22,000 ballots were returned before they were ever supposedly mailed out. They returned, but we haven't mailed them yet. 11,600 more ballots and votes were counted, more than there were actually voters. You see that? So you have more votes again than you have voters. 150,000 people registered in Maricopa County after the registration deadline. 103,000 ballots in the county were sent for electronic adjudication 
with no Republican observers. In Clark County, Nevada, the accuracy settings on signature verification machines were purposely lowered before they were used to count over 130,000 ballots. If you signed your name as Santa Claus, it would go through. There were also more than 42,000 double votes in Nevada. Over 150,000 people were hurt so badly by what took place, and 1,500 ballots were cast by individuals whose names and dates of birth matched Nevada residents who died in 2020 prior to the November 3rd election. More than 8,000 votes were cast by individuals who had no address and probably didn't live there. The margin in Nevada is down at a very low number. Any of these things would have taken care of the situation. We would have won Nevada also. Every one of these were going over, we win. In Michigan, quickly, the Secretary of State, a real great one, flooded the state with unsolicited mail-in ballot applications sent to every person on the rolls in direct violation of state law. More than 17,000 Michigan ballots were cast by individuals whose names and dates of birth match people who were deceased. In Wayne County, that's a great one, that's Detroit, 174,000 ballots were counted without being tied to an actual registered voter. Nobody knows where they came from. Also in Wayne County, Poll watchers observed canvassers rescanning batches of ballots over and over again, up to three or four or five times. In Detroit, turnout was 139% of registered voters. Think of that. So you had 139% of the people in Detroit voting. This is in Michigan, Detroit, Michigan. A career employee of the Detroit city of Detroit testified under penalty of perjury that she witnessed city workers coaching voters to vote straight Democrat while accompanying them to watch who they voted for. When a Republican came in, they wouldn't talk to him. The same worker was instructed not to ask for any voter ID and not to attempt to validate any signatures if they were Democrats. She also told to illegally and was told backdate ballots received after the deadline and reports that thousands and thousands of ballots were improperly backdated. That's Michigan. Four witnesses have testified under penalty of perjury that after officials in Detroit announced the last votes had been counted, tens of thousands of additional ballots arrived without required envelopes. Every single one of them was for a Democrat. I got no votes. At 6.31 a.m. in the early morning hours after voting had ended, Michigan suddenly reported 147,000 votes. An astounding 94% went to Joe Biden, who campaigned brilliantly from his basement. Only a couple of percentage points went to Trump. Such gigantic and one-sided vote dumps were only observed in a few swing states, and they were observed in the states where it was necessary. You know what's interesting? President Obama beat Biden in every state other than the swing states where Biden killed them. But the swing states were the ones that mattered. They're always just enough to push Joe Biden barely into the lead. We were ahead by a lot and within a number of hours, we were losing by a little. In addition, there's the highly troubling matter of Dominion voting systems. In one Michigan county alone, 6,000 votes were switched from Trump to Biden, and the same systems are used in the majority of states in our country. Senator William Ligon, a great gentleman, chairman of Georgia's Senate Judiciary Subcommittee, Senator Ligon, highly respected on elections, has written a letter describing his concerns with Dominion in Georgia. He wrote, and I quote, the Dominion voting machines employed in Fulton County had an astronomical and astounding 93.67% error rate. It's only wrong 93% of the time in the scanning of ballots, requiring a review panel to adjudicate or determine the voter's interest in over 106,000 ballots out of a total of 113,000. 
Think of it. You go in and you vote, and then they tell people who you were supposed to be voting for. They make up whatever they want. Nobody's ever even heard. They adjudicate your vote. They say, well, we don't think Trump wants to vote for Trump. We think he wants to vote for Biden. Put it down for Biden. The national average for such an error rate is far less than 1%, and yet you're at 93%. The source of this astronomical error rate must be identified to determine if these machines were set up or destroyed to allow for a third party to disregard the actual ballot cast by the registered voter. The letter continues, there is clear evidence that tens of thousands of votes were switched from President Trump to former Vice President Biden in several counties in Georgia. For example, in Bibb County, President Trump was reported to have 29,391 votes at 9.11 p.m. Eastern Time, while simultaneously Vice President Joe Biden was reported to have 17,213. Minutes later, just minutes, at the next update, these vote numbers switched, with President Trump going way down to 17,000 and Biden going way up to 29,391, and that was very quick, a 12,000 vote switch, all in Mr. Biden's favor. So, I mean, I could go on and on about this fraud that took place in every state, and all of these legislatures want this back. I don't want to do it to you because I love you, and it's freezing out here, but I could just go on forever. I can tell you this. So when you hear, when you hear while there is no evidence to prove any wrongdoing. This is the most fraudulent thing anybody has. This is a criminal enterprise. This is a criminal enterprise. And the press will say, and I'm sure they won't put any of that on there because that's no good. And you ever see, while there is no evidence to back President Trump's assertion, I could go on for another hour reading this stuff to you and telling you about it. There's never been anything like it. Think about it. Detroit had more votes than it had voters. Pennsylvania had 205,000 more votes than it had more. But you don't have to go any. Between that, I think that it's almost better than dead people, if you think, right? More votes than they had voters, and many other states also. It's a disgrace that the United States of America, tens of millions of people, are allowed to go vote without so much as even showing identification. In no state is there any question or effort made to verify the identity, citizenship, residency, or eligibility of the votes cast. The Republicans have to get tougher. You're not gonna have a Republican party if you don't get tougher. They wanna play so straight. They wanna play so, sir, yes, the United States. The Constitution doesn't allow me to send it back to the states. Well, I say, yes, it does, because the Constitution says you have to protect our country and you have to protect our Constitution, and you can't vote on fraud. And fraud breaks up everything, doesn't it? When you catch somebody in a fraud, you're allowed to go by very different rules. So I hope Mike has the courage to do what he has to do. And I hope he doesn't listen to the rhinos and the stupid people that he's listening to. It's also widely understood that the voter rolls are crammed full of non-citizens, felons, and people who have moved out of state and individuals who are otherwise ineligible to vote. Yet Democrats oppose every effort to clean up their voter rolls. They don't want to clean them up. They're loaded. And how many people here know other people that when there are hundreds of thousands and then Millions of ballots got sent out, got three, four, five, six, and I heard one who got seven ballots. And then they say, you didn't quite make it, sir. We won in a landslide. This was a landslide. They say it's not American to challenge the election. This, the most corrupt election in the history, maybe of the world. You know, you could go to third world countries, but I don't think they had hundreds of thousands of votes and they don't have voters for them. I mean, no matter where you go, nobody would think this. In fact, it's so egregious, it's so bad, 
that a lot of people don't even believe it. It's so crazy that people don't even believe it. It can't be true, so they don't believe it. This is not just a matter of domestic politics. This is a matter of national security. So today, in addition to challenging the certification of the election, I'm calling on Congress and the state legislatures to quickly pass sweeping election reforms. And you better do it before we have no country left. Today is not the end. It's just the beginning. With your help over the last four years, we built the greatest political movement in the history of our country, and nobody even challenges that. I say that over and over, and I never get challenged by the fakeness, and they challenge almost everything we say. But our fight against the big donors, big media, big tech, and others is just getting started. This is the greatest in history. There's never been a movement like that. You look back there all the way to the Washington Monument. It's hard to believe. We must stop the steal. And then we must ensure that such outrageous election fraud never happens again, can never be allowed to happen again. But we're going forward. We'll take care of going forward. We've got to take care of going back. Don't let them talk. Okay, well, we promised. I've had a lot of people. Sir, you're at 96% for four years. I said, I'm not interested right now. I'm interested in right there. With your help, we will finally pass powerful requirements for voter ID. You need an ID to cash a check. You need an ID to go to a bank, to buy alcohol, to drive a car. Every person should need to show an ID in order to cast your most important thing, a vote. We will also require proof of American citizenship in order to vote in American elections. We just had a good victory in court on that one, actually. We will ban ballot harvesting and prohibit the use of unsecured drop boxes to commit rampant fraud. These drop boxes are fraudulent. Therefore, they, get dis they disappear, and then all of a sudden they show up. It's fraudulent. We will stop the practice of universal, unsolicited mail-in balloting. We will clean up the voter rolls that ensure that every single person who casts a vote is a citizen of our country, a resident of the state in which they vote, and their vote is cast in a lawful and honest manner. We will restore the vital civic tradition of in-person voting on Election Day so that voters can be fully informed when they make their choice. We will finally hold big tech accountable. And if these people had courage and guts, they would get rid of Section 230, something that no other company, no other person in America, in the world has. All of these tech monopolies are going to abuse their power and interfere in our elections, and it has to be stopped. And the Republicans have to get a lot tougher, and so should the Democrats. They should be regulated, investigated, and brought to justice under the fullest extent of the law. They're totally breaking the law. Together, we will drain the Washington swamp, and we will clean up the corruption in our nation's capital. We've done a big job on it, but you think it's easy? It's a dirty business. It's a dirty business. You have a lot of bad people out there. Despite everything we've been through, looking out all over this country and seeing fantastic crowds, although this, I think, is our all-time record, I think you have 250,000 people, 250,000, looking out at all the amazing patriots here today. I have never been more confident in our nation's future. Well, I have to say, we have to be a little bit careful. That's a nice statement, but we have to be a little careful with that statement. If we allow this group of people to illegally take over our country, because it's illegal when the votes are illegal, when the way they got there is illegal, when the states that vote are given false and fraudulent information. We are the greatest country on earth, and we are headed and were headed in the right direction. You know, the wall is built. We're doing record numbers at the wall. Now they want to take down the wall. Let's let everyone flow in. Let's let everybody flow in. We did a great job in the wall. Remember, the wall, they said it could never be done. One of the largest infrastructure projects we've ever had in this country. And it's had a tremendous impact that we got rid of catch and release. We got rid of all this stuff that we had to live with. 
But now the caravans, I think Biden's getting in, the caravans are forming again. They want to come in again and rip off our country. Can't let it happen. As this enormous crowd shows, we have truth and justice on our side. We have a deep and enduring love for America in our hearts. We love our country. We have overwhelming pride in this great country, and we have it deep in our souls. Together, we are determined to defend and preserve government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Our brightest days are before us, our greatest achievements still away. I think one of our great achievements will be election security, because nobody, till I came along, had any idea how corrupt our elections were. And again, most people would stand there at 9 o'clock in the evening and say, I want to thank you very much, and they go off to some other life. But I say something's wrong here. Something is really wrong can have happened. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Our exciting adventures and boldest endeavors have not yet begun. My fellow Americans, for our movement, for our children, and for our beloved country, and I say this despite all that's happened, the best is yet to come. So we're going we're gonna to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I love Pennsylvania Avenue. And we're going to the Capitol, and we're going to try and give. The Democrats are hopeless. They never vote for anything, not even one vote. But we're going to try and give our Republicans, the weak ones, because the strong ones don't need any of our help, we're going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. So let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I want to thank you all. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you all for being here. This is incredible. Thank you very much. Thank you. End of section 13 and of examining the U.S. Capitol attack by the U.S. Senate.